4. The Benares put into edge a little afternoon on the next day. One of the mantis had died in harness only twenty kilometers downriver from their destination, and A. Bedick had cut it loose. The other had lasted until they tied up to the bleached pier, and then it rolled over in total exhaustion, bubbles rising from its twin air holes. Bedick ordered this manta cut loose as well, explaining that it had a slim chance of surviving if it drifted along in the more rapid current. The pilgrims had been awake and watching the scenery roll by since before sunrise. They spoke little, and none had found anything to say to Martin Silenus. The poet did not appear to mind. He drank wine with his breakfast and sang bawdy songs as the sun rose. The river had widened during the night, and by morning it was a two-kilometer-wide highway of blue-gray cutting through the low green hills south of the Sea of Grass. There were no trees this close to the sea, and the browns and golds and heather tones of the main shrubs had gradually brightened to the bold greens of the two-meter-tall northern grasses. All morning the hills had been pressed lower, until now they were compressed into low bands of grassy bluffs on either side of the river. An almost invisible darkening hung above the horizon to the north and east, and those pilgrims who had lived on ocean worlds and knew it as a promise of the approaching sea had to remind themselves that the only sea now near was comprised of several billion acres of grass. Edge never had been a large outpost, and now it was totally deserted. The score of buildings lining the rutted lane from the dock had the vacant gaze of all abandoned structures, and there were signs on the riverfront that the population had fled weeks earlier. The Pilgrim's Rest, a three-century-old inn just below the crest of the hill, had been burned. A. Bedick accompanied them to the summit of the low bluff. What will you do now? Colonel Kassad asked the android. According to the terms of the temple bonditure, we are free after this trip, said Bedick. We shall leave the Benares here for your return and take the launch downriver, and then we go on our way. With the general evacuations, asked Braun Lamia. No, Bedick smiled. We have our own purposes in pilgrimages on Hyperion. The group reached the rounded crest of the bluff. Behind them, the Benares seemed a small thing tied to a sagging dock. The Huli ran southwest into the blue haze of distance below the town and curved west above it narrowing toward the impassable lower cataracts a dozen kilometers upriver from edge. To their north and east lay the sea of grass. My God, breathed Braun Lamia. It was as if they had climbed the last hill in creation. Below them a scattering of docks, wharves, and sheds marked the end of edge and the beginning of the sea. Grass stretched away forever rippling sensuously in the slight breeze and seeming to lap like a green surf at the base of the bluffs. The grass seemed infinite and seamless, stretching to all horizons and apparently rising to precisely the same height as far as the eye could see. There was not the slightest hint of the snowy peaks of the bridal range, which they knew lay some eight hundred kilometers to the northeast. The illusion that they were gazing at a great green sea was nearly perfect, down to the wind-ruffled shimmers of stalks looking like whitecaps far from shore. It's beautiful, said Lamia, who had never seen it before. It's striking at sunset and sunrise, said the consul. Fascinating, murmured Saul Weintraub, lifting his infant so that she could see. She wiggled in happiness and concentrated on watching her fingers. A well-preserved ecosystem, Hetmestine said approvingly. The Muir would be pleased. Shit, said Martin Silenus. The others turned to stare. There's no fucking wind wagon, said the poet. The four other men, woman, and android stared silently at the abandoned wharves and empty plain of grass. It's been delayed, said the consul. Martin Silenus barked a laugh. Or it's left already. We were supposed to be here last night. Colonel Kassad raised his powered binoculars and swept the horizon. I find it unlikely that they would have left without us, he said. The wagon was to have been sent by the Shrike Temple priests themselves. They have a vested interest in our pilgrimage. We could walk, said Lenar Hoyt. The priest looked pale and weak, obviously in the grip of both pain and drugs, and barely able to stand, much less walk. No, said Kassad. It's hundreds of clicks, and the grass is over our heads. Compasses, said the priest. Compasses don't work on Hyperion, said Kassad still watching through his binoculars. Direction finders, then, said Hoyt. 
We have an IDF, but that isn't the point, said the consul. The grass is sharp. Half a click out and we'd be nothing but tatters. And there are the grass serpents, said Kassad, lowering the glasses. It's a well-preserved ecosystem, but not one to take a stroll in. Father Hoyt sighed and half collapsed into the short grass of the hilltop. There was something close to relief in his voice when he said, All right, we go back. A. Bedick stepped forward. The crew will be happy to wait and ferry you back to Keats in the Benares, should the wind wagon not appear. No, said the consul. Take the launch and go. Hey, just a fucking minute, cried Martin Silenus. I don't remember electing you dictator, amigo. We need to get there. If the fucking wind wagon doesn't show, we'll have to find another way. The consul wheeled to face the smaller man. How, by boat? It takes two weeks to sail up the main and around the north littoral to Otho, or one of the other staging areas. And that's when there are ships available. Every seagoing vessel on Hyperion is probably evolved in the evacuation effort. Dirigible, then, growled the poet. Brown Lamian laughed. Oh, yes, we've seen so many in the two days we've been on the river. Martin Silenus whirled and clenched his fists as if to strike the woman. Then he smiled. All right, then, lady, what do we do? Maybe if we sacrifice someone to a grass serpent, the transportation gods will smile on us. Braun Lamia's stare was arctic. I thought burned offerings were more your style, little man. Colonel Kassad stepped between the two. His voice barked command. Enough. The consul's right. We stay here until the wagon arrives. M. Mustine, M. Lamia, go with A. Bedek to supervise the unloading of our gear. Father Hoyt and M. Silenus will bring some wood up for a bonfire. A bonfire, said the priest. It was hot on the hillside. After dark, said Kassad, we want the wind wagon to know we're here. Now let's move. It was a quiet group that watched the powered launch move downriver at sunset. Even from two kilometers away, the consul could see the blue skins of the crew. The Benares looked old and abandoned at its wharf, already a part of the deserted city. When the launch was lost in the distance, the group turned to watch the sea of grass. Long shadows from the river bluffs crept out across what the consul already found himself thinking of as the surf and shallows. Farther out, the sea seemed to shift in color, the grass mellowing to an aquamarine shimmer before darkening to a hint of verdurous depths. The lapis sky melted into the reds and golds of sunset, illuminating their hilltop and setting the pilgrim skins aglow with liquid light. The only sound was the whisper of wind in grass. We've got a fucking huge heap of baggage, Martin Silenus said loudly, for a bunch of folks on a one-way trip. It was true, thought the consul. Their luggage made a small mountain on the grassy hilltop. Somewhere in there, came the quiet voice of Hetmastein, may lie our salvation. What do you mean? asked Braun Lamia. Yeah, said Martin Silenus, lying back, putting his hands under his head and staring at the sky. Did you bring a pair of undershorts that are shrike-proof? The Templar shook his head slowly. The sudden twilight cast his face in shadow under the cowl of the robe. Let us not trivialize or dissemble, he said. It is time to admit that each of us has brought on this pilgrimage something which he or she hopes will alter the inevitable outcome when the moment arrives that we must face the Lord of Pain. The poet laughed. I didn't bring even my lucky fucking rabbit's foot. The Templar's hood moved slightly. But your manuscript, perhaps? The poet said nothing. Het Mustine moved his invisible gaze to the tall man on his left. And you, Colonel. There are several trunks which bear your name. Weapons, perhaps. Kassad raised his head, but did not speak. Of course, said Het Mustine. It would be foolish to go hunting without a weapon. What about me? asked Braun Lamia, folding her arms. Do you know what secret weapon I've smuggled along? The Templar's oddly accented voice was calm. We have not yet heard your tale, M. Lamia. It would be premature to speculate. What about the consul? asked Lamia. Oh, yes, it is obvious what weapon our diplomatic friend has in store. 
the consul turned from his contemplation of the sunset. I brought only some clothes and two books to read, he said truthfully. Ah, sighed the Templar, but what a beautiful spacecraft you left behind. Martin Silenus jumped to his feet. The fucking ship, he cried. You can call it, can't you? Well, God damn it, get your dog whistle out. I'm tired of sitting here. The consul pulled a strand of grass and stripped it. After a minute, he said, Even if I could call it, and you heard A. Bedick say that the commsats and repeater stations were down, even if I could call it, we couldn't land north of the bridle range. That meant instant disaster even before the Shrike began ranging south of the mountains. Yeah, said Silenus, waving his arms in agitation. But we could get across this fucking lawn. Call the ship. Wait until morning, said the consul. If the wind wagon's not here, we will discuss alternatives. Fuck that, began the poet. But Kassad stepped forward with his back to him, effectively removing Silenus from the circle. M. Mustine, said the colonel. What is your secret? There was enough light from the dying sky to show a slight smile on the Templar's thin lips. He gestured toward the mound of baggage. As you see, my trunk is the heaviest and most mysterious of all. It's a Mobius cube, said Father Hoyt. I've seen ancient artifacts transported that way. Or fusion bombs, said Kassad. Het Mustine shook his head. Nothing so crude, he said. Are you going to tell us? demanded Lamia. When it is my turn to speak, said the Templar. Are you next? asked the consul. We can listen while we wait. Saul Weintraub cleared his throat. I have number four, he said, showing the slip of paper. But I would be more than pleased to trade with the true voice of the tree. Weintraub lifted Rachel from his left shoulder to his right, patting her gently on the back. Het Mustine shook his head. No, there is time. I meant only to point out that in hopelessness there is always hope. We have learned much from the story so far, yet each of us has some seed of promise buried even deeper than we have admitted. I don't see, began Father Hoyt, but was interrupted by Martin Silenus' sudden shout. It's the wagon, the fucking wind wagon, here at last. It was another twenty minutes before the wind wagon tied up to one of the wharves. The craft came out of the north its sails white squares against a dark plain draining of color. The last light had faded by the time the large ship had tacked close to the low bluff, folded its mainsails, and rolled to a stop. The consul was impressed. The thing was wooden, handcrafted, and huge, curved in the pregnant lines of some seagoing galleon out of Old Earth's ancient history. The single gigantic wheel, set in the center of the curving hull, normally would have been invisible in the two-meter-tall grass but the consul caught a glimpse of the underside as he carried luggage onto the wharf. From the ground it would be six or seven meters to the railing, and more than five times that height to the tip of the mainmast. From where he stood, panting from exertion, the consul could hear the snap of pennants far above, and a steady, almost subsonic hum that would be coming from either the ship's interior flywheel or its massive gyroscopes. A gangplank extruded from the upper hull and lowered itself to the wharf. Father Hoyt and Braun Lamia had to step back quickly or be crushed. The wind wagon was less well lighted than the Benares. Illumination appeared to consist of several lanterns hanging from spars. No crew had been visible during the approach of the ship, and no one came into view now. Hello, called the consul from the base of the gangplank. No one answered. Wait here a minute, please, said Kassad, and mounted the long ramp in five strides. The others watched while Kassad paused at the top, touched his belt where the small death wand was tucked, and then disappeared amidships. Several minutes later a light flared through broad windows at the stern, casting trapezoids of yellow on the grass below. Come up, called Kassad from the head of the ramp. It's empty. The group struggled with their luggage, making several trips. The consul helped Het Mustine with the heavy Mobius trunk, and through his fingertips he could feel a faint but intense vibration. So where the fuck is the crew? asked Martin Silenus when they were assembled on the foredeck. They had taken their single-file tour through the narrow corridors and cabins, down stairways more ladder than stairs, and through cabins not much bigger than the built-in bunks they contained. 
Only the rearmost cabin, the captain's cabin, if that is what it was, approached the size and comfort of standard accommodations on the Benares. It's obviously automated, said Kassad. The force officer pointed to halyards, which disappeared into slots in the deck, manipulators all but invisible among the rigging and spars, and the subtle hint of gears halfway up the latine rig rear mast. I didn't see a control center, said Lamia. Not so much as a disk key or C-spot nexus. She slipped her comm log from a breast pocket and tried to interface on standard data, comm, and biomed frequencies. There was no response from the ship. The ships used to be crude, said the consul. Temple initiates used to accompany the pilgrims to the mountains. Well, they're not here now, said Hoyt. But I guess we can assume that someone is still alive at the tram station or keep Kronos. They sent the wagon for us. Or everyone's dead and the wind wagon is running on an automatic schedule, said Lamia. She looked over her shoulder as rigging and canvas creaked in a sudden gust of wind. Damn, it's weird to be cut off from everybody and everything like this. It's like being blind and deaf. I don't know how colonials stand it. Martin Silenus approached the group and sat on the railing. He drank from a long green bottle and said, Where's the poet? Show him, show him. Muses mine that I may know him. Tis the man who with a man is an equal, be he king or poorest of the beggar class, or any other wondrous thing. A man may be twixt ape and Plato. Tis the man who with a bird, wren, or eagle finds his way to all its instincts. He hath heard the lion's roaring, and can tell what his horny throat expresseth. And to him the tiger's yell comes articulate and presseth on his ear like mother tongue. Where did you get that wine bottle? asked Kassad. Martin Silenus smiled. His eyes were small and bright in the lantern glow. The galley's fully stocked, and there's a bar. I declared it open. We should fix some dinner, said the consul, although all he wanted at the moment was some wine. It had been more than ten hours since they had last eaten. There came a clank and whirr, and all six of them moved to the starboard rail. The gangplank had drawn itself in. They whirled again as canvas unfurled, lines grew taut, and somewhere a flywheel hummed into the ultrasonic. Sails filled, the deck tilted slightly, and the wind wagon moved away from the wharf and into the darkness. The only sounds were the flap and creak of the ship, the distant rumble of the wheel, and the rasp of grass on the hull bottom. The six of them watched as the shadow of the bluff fell behind, the unlighted beacon pyre receding as a faint gleam of starlight on pale wood. And then there were only the sky and night and swaying circles of lantern light. I'll go below, said the consul, and see if I can get a meal together. The others stayed above a while, feeling the slight surge and rumble through the soles of their feet and watching darkness pass. The sea of grass was visible only as the place where stars ended and flat blackness began. Kassad used a hand beam to illuminate glimpses of canvas and rigging, lines being pulled tight by invisible hands, and then he checked all the corners and shadowed places from stern to bow. The others watched in silence. When he clicked the light off, the darkness seemed less oppressive, the starlight brighter. A rich, fertile smell, more of a farm in springtime than of the sea, came to them on a breeze which had swept across a thousand kilometers of grass. Sometime later the consul called to them and they went below to eat. The galley was cramped and there was no mess table, so they used the large cabin in the stern as their common room pushing three of the trunks together as a makeshift table. Four lanterns swinging from low beams made the room bright. A breeze blew in when Het Mastine opened one of the tall windows above the bed. The consul set plates piled high with sandwiches on the largest trunk and returned again with thick white cups and a coffee therm. He poured while the others ate. This is quite good, said Fedman Kassad. Where did you get the roast beef? The cold box is fully stocked. There's another large freezer in the aft pantry. Electrical? asked Het Mistine. No, double insulated. Martin Silenus sniffed a jar, found a knife on the sandwich plate, and added great dollops of horseradish to his sandwich. His eyes sparkled with tears as he ate. How long does this crossing generally take? 
Lamia asked the consul. He looked up from his study of the circle of hot black coffee in his cup. I'm sorry, what? Crossing the Sea of Grass. How long? A night and a half a day to the mountains, said the consul, if the winds are with us. And then how long to cross the mountains, asked Father Hoyt. Less than a day, said the consul. If the tramway is running, added Kassad. The consul sipped the hot coffee and made a face. We have to assume it is. Otherwise... Otherwise what? demanded Lamia. Otherwise, said Colonel Kassad, moving to the open window and putting his hands on his hips, we will be stranded six hundred clicks from the time tombs and a thousand from the southern cities. The consul shook his head. No, he said. The temple priests, or whoever are behind this pilgrimage, have seen to it that we've gotten this far. They'll make sure we go all the way. Braun Lamia crossed her arms and frowned. As what? Sacrifices? Martin Silenus whooped a laugh and brought out his bottle. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leadst thou that heifer lowing at the skies, and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? What little town by river or seashore, or mountain built with peaceful citadel, is emptied of its folk this pious morn? And, little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul, to tell why thou art desolate, can e'er return. Braun Lamia reached under her tunic and brought out a cutting laser no larger than her little finger. She aimed it at the poet's head. You miserable little shit! One more word out of you, and I swear I'll slag you where you stand. The silence was suddenly absolute, except for the background rumble groan of the ship. The consul moved toward Martin Silenus. Colonel Kassad took two steps behind Lamia. The poet took a long drink and smiled at the dark-haired woman. His lips were moist. Oh, build your ship of death, he whispered. Oh, build it. Lamia's fingers were white on the pencil laser. The consul edged closer to Silenus, not knowing what to do imagining the whipping beam of light fusing his own eyes. Kassad leaned toward Lamia like two meters of tensed shadow. Madam, said Saul Weintraub, from where he sat on the bunk against the far wall, need I remind you that there is a child present? Lamia glanced to her right. Weintraub had removed a deep drawer from a ship's cupboard and had set it on the bed as a cradle. He had bathed the infant and come in silently just before the poet's recitation. Now he set the baby softly in the padded nest. I'm sorry, said Braun Lamia, and lowered the small laser. It's just that he makes me so angry. Weintraub nodded, rocking the drawer slightly. The gentle roll of the wind wagon, combined with the incessant rumble of the great wheel, appeared to have already put the child to sleep. We're all tired and tense, said the scholar. Perhaps we should find our lodgings for the night and turn in. The woman sighed and tucked the weapon in her belt. I won't sleep, she said. Things are too... strange. Others nodded. Martin Silenus was sitting on the broad ledge below the stern windows. Now he pulled up his legs, took a drink, and said to Weintraub, Tell your story, old man. Yes, said Father Hoyt. The priest looked exhausted to the point of being cadaverous, but his feverish eyes burned. Tell us. We need to have the stories told and time to think about them before we arrive. Weintraub passed a hand across his bald scalp. It's a dull tale, he said. I've never been to Hyperion before. There are no confrontations with monsters, no acts of heroism. It's a tale by a man whose idea of epic adventure is speaking to a class without his notes. All the better, said Martin Silenus. We need a soporific. Saul Weintraub sighed, adjusted his glasses, and nodded. There were a few streaks of dark in his beard, but most of it had gone gray. He turned the lantern low over the baby's bed and moved to a chair in the center of the room. The consul turned down the other lamps and poured more coffee for those who wanted it. Saul Weintraub's voice was slow, careful in phrase and precise in wording, and before long the gentle cadence of his story blended with the soft rumble and slow pitchings of the wind wagon's progress north. 
The Scholar's Tale The River Lethe's Taste is Bitter Saul Weintraub and his wife, Sarai, had enjoyed their life even before the birth of their daughter. Rachel made things as close to perfect as the couple could imagine. Sarai was twenty-seven when the child was conceived. Saul was twenty-nine. Neither of them had considered Polson treatments because neither of them could afford it. But even without such care, they looked forward to another fifty years of help. Both had lived their entire lives on Barnard's world, one of the oldest but least exciting members of the hegemony. Barnard's was in the web, but it made little difference to Saul and Sarai, since they could not afford frequent farcaster travel and had little wish to go at any rate. Saul had recently celebrated his tenth year with Nightenhelser College, where he taught history and classical studies and did his own research on ethical evolution. Nightenhelser was a small school, fewer than 3,000 students, but its academic reputation was outstanding, and it attracted young people from all over the web. The primary complaint of these students was that Nightenhelser and its surrounding community of Crawford constituted an island of civilization in an ocean of corn. It was true. The college was 3,000 flat kilometers away from the capital of Bussard, and the terraformed land in between was given over to farming. There had been no forests to fell, no hills to deal with, and no mountains to break the flat monotony of cornfields, beanfields, cornfields, wheatfields, cornfields, rice paddies, and cornfields. The radical poet Salmud Brevi had taught briefly at Nightenhelser before the Glen and Height mutiny, had been fired, and upon forecasting to Renaissance Vector had told his friends that Crawford County on South Sinzer on Barnard's world constituted the eighth circle of desolation, on the smallest pimple on the absolute ass end of creation. Saul and Sarai Weintraub liked it. Crawford, a town of twenty-five thousand, might have been reconstructed from some nineteenth-century mid-American template. The streets were wide and overarched with elms and oaks. Barnard's had been the second extrasolar earth colony, centuries before the Hawking Drive and Hegira, and the seed ships then had been huge. Homes in Crawford reflected styles ranging from early Victorian to Canadian Revival, but they all seemed to be white and set far back on well-trimmed lawns. The college itself was Georgian, an assemblage of red brick and white pillars surrounding the Oval Common. Saul's office was on the third floor of Placker Hall, the oldest building on campus, and in the winter he could look out on bare branches which carved the common into complex geometries. Saul loved the chalk dust and old wood smell of the place a smell which had not changed since he was a freshman there, and each day climbing to his office he treasured the deeply worn grooves in the steps, a legacy of twenty generations of Nightenhelser students. Sarai had been born on a farm halfway between Bussard and Crawford, and had received her Ph.D. in music theory a year before Saul earned his doctorate. She had been a happy and energetic young woman, making up in personality what she lacked in accepted norms of physical beauty, and she carried this attractiveness of person into later life. Sarai had studied off-world for two years at the University of New Lyons on Deneb Dry, but she was homesick there. The sunsets were abrupt, the much-vaunted mountains slicing off the sunlight like a ragged scythe, and she longed for the hours-long sunsets of home, where Barnard's star hung on the horizon like a great tethered red balloon, while the sky congealed to evening. She missed the perfect flatness where, peering from her third-floor room under the steep gables, a little girl could look fifty kilometers across tasseled fields to watch a storm approach like a bruised black curtain lit within by lightning bolts. And Sarai missed her family. She and Saul met a week after she transferred to Nightenhelser. It was another three years before he proposed marriage, and she accepted. At first, she saw nothing in the short graduate student. She was still wearing web fashions then, involved in post-destructionist music theories, reading Obit and Neil and the most avant-garde magazines from Renaissance Vector and T.C. Squared, feigning sophisticated weariness with life and a rebel's vocabulary. And none of this gelled with the undersized but earnest history major who spilled fruit cocktail on her at Dean Moore's honors party. Any exotic qualities which might have come from Saul Weintraub's Jewish legacy were instantly negated by his B.W. accent, his Crawford Squire Shop wardrobe, and the fact that he had come to the party with a copy of Detresk's Solitudes in Variants absent-mindedly tucked under his arm. For Saul, it was love at first sight. He stared at the laughing, red-cheeked girl and ignored the expensive dress and affected Mandarin nails in favor of the personality which blazed like a beacon to the lonely junior. Saul had not known he was lonely until he met Sarai, but after the first time he shook her hand and spilled fruit salad down the front of her dress, 
He knew that his life would be empty forever if they did not marry. They married the week after the announcement of Saul's teaching appointment at the college. Their honeymoon was on Maui Covenant, his first far-cast trip abroad, and for three weeks they rented a mobile isle and sailed alone on it through the wonders of the equatorial archipelago. Saul never forgot the images from those sun-drenched and wind-filled days, and the secret image he would always most cherish was of Sarai rising nude from a nighttime swim, the core stars blazing above while her own body glowed constellations from the phosphorescence of the island's wake. They had wanted a child immediately, but it was to be five years before nature agreed. Saul remembered cradling Sarai in his arms as she curled in pain, a difficult delivery, until finally, incredibly, Rachel Sarah Weintraub was born at 2.01 a.m. in Crawford County Med Center. The presence of an infant intruded upon Saul's solipsistic life as a serious academic and Sarai's profession as music critic for Barnard's Datasphere, but neither minded. The first months were a blend of constant fatigue and joy. Late at night, between feedings, Saul would tiptoe into the nursery just to check on Rachel and to stand and gaze at the baby. More often than not, he would find Sarai already there, and the two would watch, arm in arm, at the miracle of a baby sleeping on its stomach, rump in the air, head burrowed into the bumper pad at the head of the crib. Rachel was one of those rare children who managed to be cute without becoming self-consciously precious. By the time she was two standard years old, her appearance and personality were striking. Her mother's light brown hair, red cheeks, and broad smile. Her father's large brown eyes. Friends said that the child combined the best portions of Sarai's sensitivity and Saul's intellect. Another friend, a child psychologist from the college, once commented that Rachel, at age five, showed the most reliable indicators of true giftedness in a young person. Structured curiosity, empathy for others, compassion, and a fierce sense of fair play. One day in his office, studying ancient files from Old Earth, Saul was reading about the effect of Beatrice on the worldview of Dante Alighieri when he was struck by a passage written by a critic from the twentieth or twenty-first century. She, Beatrice, alone was still real for him, still implied meaning in the world and beauty. Her nature became his landmark, what Melville would call, with more sobriety than we can now muster, his Greenwich Standard. Saul paused to access the definition of Greenwich Standard, and then he read on. The critic had added a personal note. Most of us, I hope, have had some child or spouse or friend like Beatrice, someone who by his very nature, his seemingly innate goodness and intelligence, makes us uncomfortably conscious of our lies when we lie. Saul had shut off the display and gazed out at the black geometries of branches above the common. Rachel was not insufferably perfect. When she was five standard, she carefully cut the hair of her five favorite dolls and then cut her own hair shortest of all. When she was seven, she decided that the migrant workers staying in their rundown houses on the south end of town lacked a nutritious diet. So she emptied the house's pantries, cold boxes, freezers, and synthesizer banks, talked three friends into accompanying her, and distributed several hundred marks worth of the family's monthly food budget. When she was ten, Rachel responded to a dare from Stubby Berkowitz and tried to climb to the top of Crawford's oldest elm. She was forty meters up, less than five meters from the top, when a branch broke, and she fell two-thirds of the way to the ground. Saul was paged on his comm log while discussing the moral implications of Earth's first nuclear disarmament era, and he left the class without a word and ran the twelve blocks to the med center. Rachel had broken her left leg, two ribs, punctured a lung, and fractured her jaw. She was floating in a bath of recovery nutrient when Saul burst in, but she managed to look over her mother's shoulder, smile slightly, and say through the wire cast on her jaw, Dad, I was fifteen feet from the top. Maybe closer. I'll make it next time. Rachel graduated with honors from secondary tutorials and received scholarship offers from corporate academies on five worlds and three universities, including Harvard on New Earth. She chose Nightingale. It was little surprise to Saul that his daughter chose archaeology as a major. One of his fondest memories of her was the long afternoon she had spent under the front porch when she was about two, digging in the loam, ignoring spiders and Google Peds, rushing into the house to show off every plastic plate and tarnished fennig she had excavated, demanding to know where it had come from, what were the people like who had left it there. Rachel received her undergraduate degree when she was nineteen standard, 
worked that summer on her grandmother's farm, and far cast away the next fall. She was at Reich's University on Freeholm for 28 local months, and when she returned it was as if color had flowed back into Saul and Sarai's world. For two weeks their daughter, an adult now, self-aware and secure in some ways that grown-ups twice her age often failed to be, rested and reveled in being home. One evening, walking across the campus just after sunset, she pressed her father on details of his heritage. Dad, do you still consider yourself a Jew? Saul had run his hand over his thinning hair, surprised by the question. A Jew? Yes, I suppose so. It doesn't mean what it once did, though. Am I a Jew? asked Rachel. Her cheeks glowed in the fragile light. If you want to be, said Saul. It doesn't have the same significance with old earth gone. If I'd been a boy, would you have had me circumcised? Saul had laughed, delighted and embarrassed by the question. I'm serious, said Rachel. Saul adjusted his glasses. I guess I would have, kiddo. I never thought about it. Have you been to the synagogue in Bussard? Not since my bar mitzvah, said Saul, thinking back to the day fifty years earlier when his father had borrowed Uncle Richard's vicin and had flown the family to the capital for the ritual. Dad, why do Jews feel that things are less important now than before the hegira? Saul spread his hands, strong hands, more those of a stone worker than an academic. That's a good question, Rachel. Probably because so much of the dream is dead. Israel is gone. The new temple lasted less time than the first and second. God broke his word by destroying the earth a second time in the way he did. And this diaspora is forever. But Jews maintain their ethnic and religious identity in some places, his daughter insisted. Oh, sure. On Hebron and isolated areas of the concourse, you can find entire communities. Hasidic, Orthodox, Hasmonean, you name it. But they tend to be, not vital, picturesque, tourist-oriented. Like a theme park? Yes. Could you take me to Temple Bethel tomorrow? I can borrow Kaki Strat. No need, said Saul. We'll use the college's shuttle. He paused. Yes, he said at last. I would like to take you to the synagogue tomorrow. It was getting dark under the old elms. Street lights came on up and down the wide lane which led to their home. Dad, said Rachel, I'm going to ask you a question I've asked about a million times since I was two. Do you believe in God? Saul had not smiled. He had no choice but to give her the answer he had given her a million times. I'm waiting to, he said. Rachel's postgraduate work dealt with alien and pre hegira artifacts. For three standard years, Saul and Sarai would receive occasional visits followed by fat-line flimsies from exotic worlds near but not within the web. They all knew that her field work in quest of dissertation would soon take her beyond the web, into the outback where time debt ate away at the lives and memories of those left behind. Where the hell is Hyperion? Sarai had asked during Rachel's last vacation before the expedition left. It sounds like a brand name for some new household product. It's a great place, Mom. There are more non-human artifacts there than any place except Armagast. Then why not go to Armagast, said Sarai. It's only a few months from the web. Why settle for second best? Hyperion hasn't become the big tourist attraction yet, said Rachel. Although they're beginning to become a problem. People with money are more willing to travel outside the web now. Saul had found his voice suddenly husky. Will you be going to the labyrinth or the artifacts called the time tombs? The time tombs, Dad. I'll be working with Dr. Melio Arundes, and he knows more about the tombs than anyone alive. Aren't they dangerous? asked Saul, framing the question as casually as he could, but hearing the edge in his voice. Rachel smiled. Because of the Shrike legend? No. Nobody's been bothered by that particular legend for two standard centuries. But I've seen documents about the trouble there during the second colonization, began Saul. Me too, Dad. But they didn't know about the big rock eels that came down into the desert to hunt. They probably lost a few people to those things and panicked. You know how legends begin. Besides, the rock eels have been hunted to extinction. 
spacecraft don't land there, persisted Saul. You have to sail to the tombs, or hike, or some damn thing. Rachel laughed. In the early days, people flying in underestimated the effects of the anti-entropic fields, and there were some accidents. But there's dirigible service now. They have a big hotel called Keep Kronos at the north edge of the mountains where hundreds of tourists a year stay. Will you be staying there? asked Sarai. Part of the time. It'll be exciting, Mom. Not too exciting, I hope, said Sarai. And all of them had smiled. During the four years that Rachel was in transit, a few weeks of cryogenic fugue for her, Saul found that he missed his daughter much more than if she had been out of touch but busy somewhere in the web. The thought that she was flying away from him faster than the speed of light, wrapped in the artificial quantum cocoon of the Hawking effect, seemed unnatural and ominous to him. They kept busy. Sarai retired from the critic business to devote more time to local environmental issues, but for Saul it was one of the most hectic times of his life. His second and third books came out, and the second one, Moral Turning Points, caused such a stir that he was in constant demand at off-world conferences and symposia. He traveled to a few alone, to a few more with Sarai, but although both of them enjoyed the idea of traveling, the actual experience of facing strange foods, different gravities, and the light from strange suns all paled after a while, and Saul found himself spending more time at home researching his next book, attending conferences if he had to, via interactive holla from the college. It was almost five years after Rachel left on her expedition that Saul had a dream which would change his life. Saul dreamed that he was wandering through a great structure with columns the size of small redwood trees and a ceiling lost to sight far above him, through which red light fell in solid shafts. At times he caught glimpses of things far off in the gloom to his left or right. Once he made out a pair of stone legs rising like massive buildings through the darkness. Another time he spied what appeared to be a crystal scarab rotating far above him, its insides ablaze with cool lights. Finally, Saul stopped to rest. Far behind him he could hear what sounded like a great conflagration, entire cities and forests burning. Ahead of him glowed the lights he had been walking toward, two ovals of deepest red. He was mopping sweat from his brow when an immense voice said to him, Saul, take your daughter, your only daughter Rachel, whom you love, and go to the world called Hyperion, and offer her there as a burnt offering at one of the places of which I shall tell you. And in his dream Saul had stood and said, You can't be serious. And he had walked on through darkness, the red orbs glowing now like bloody moons hanging above an indistinct plain. And when he stopped to rest, the immense voice said, Saul, take your daughter, your only daughter Rachel, whom you love, and go to the world called Hyperion, and offer her there as a burnt offering at one of the places of which I shall tell you. And Saul had shrugged off the weight of the voice and had said distinctly into the darkness, I heard you the first time. The answer is still no. Saul knew he was dreaming then, and part of his mind enjoyed the irony of the script but another part wanted only to waken. Instead, he found himself on a low balcony looking down on a room where Rachel lay naked on a broad block of stone. The scene was illuminated by the glow of the twin red orbs. Saul looked down at his right hand and found a long curved knife there. The blade and handle appeared to be made of bone. The voice, sounding more than ever to Saul like some cut-rate Holly director's shallow idea of what God's voice should sound like, came again. Saul. You must listen well. The future of humankind depends upon your obedience in this matter. You must take your daughter, your daughter Rachel, whom you love, and go to the world called Hyperion and offer her there as a burnt offering at one of the places of which I shall tell you. And Saul, sick of the whole dream, yet somehow alarmed by it, had turned and thrown the knife far into the darkness. When he turned back to find his daughter, the scene had faded. The red orbs hung closer than ever, and now Saul could see that they were multifaceted gems the size of small worlds. The amplified voice came again. So? You have had your chance, Saul Weintraub. If you change your mind, you know where to find me. And Saul awakened, half laughing, half chilled by the dream. Amused by the thought that the entire Talmud and the Old Testament might be nothing more than a cosmic shaggy dog story. 
About the time Saul was having his dream, Rachel was on Hyperion finishing her first year of research there. The team of nine archaeologists and six physicists had found Keith Kronos fascinating, but far too crowded with tourists and would-be Shrike pilgrims. So after the first month spent commuting from the hotel, they had set up a permanent camp between the ruined city and the small canyon holding the time tombs. While half the team excavated the more recent side of the unfinished city, two of Rachel's colleagues helped her catalog every aspect of the tombs. The physicists were fascinated with the anti-entropic fields and spent much of their time setting small flags of different colors to mark the limits of the so-called time tides. Rachel's team concentrated their work in the structure called the Sphinx, although the creature represented in stone was neither human nor lion. It may not have been a creature at all, although the smooth lines atop the stone monolith suggested curves of a living thing, and the sweeping appendages made everyone think of wings. Unlike the other tombs, which lay open and were easily inspected, the Sphinx was a mass of heavy blocks honeycombed with narrow corridors, some of which tightened to impossibility, some of which widened to auditorium-sized proportions, but none of which led anywhere but back on themselves. There were no crypts, treasure rooms, plundered sarcophagi, wall murals, or secret passages, merely a maze of senseless corridors through sweating stone. Rachel and her lover, Melio Arundes, began mapping the Sphinx using a method which had been in use for at least seven hundred years, having been pioneered in the Egyptian pyramids sometime in the twentieth century. Arranging sensitive radiation and cosmic ray detectors at the lowest point in the Sphinx, they recorded arrival times and deflection patterns of the particles passing through the massive stone above them, watching for hidden rooms or passages which would not show up even on deep imaging radar. Because of the busy tourist season and the concern of the Hyperion Home Rule Council that the tombs might be damaged by such research, Rachel and Melio went out to their site every night at midnight, making the half-hour walk and crawl through the corridor maze which they had rigged with blue glow globes. There, sitting under hundreds of thousands of tons of stone, they would watch their instruments until morning, listening to their earphones ping with the sound of particles born in the belly of dying stars. The time tides had not been a problem with the Sphinx. Of all the tombs, it seemed the least protected by the anti-entropic fields, and the physicists had carefully mapped the times when the tide surges might pose a threat. High tide was at ten hundred hours, receding only twenty minutes later back toward the Jade Tomb half a kilometer to the south. Tourists were not allowed near the Sphinx until after twelve hundred hours, and to leave a margin of safety, the site made sure they were out by 0900. The physics team had placed chronotropic sensors at various points along the paths and walkways between the tombs, both to alert the monitors to variations of the tides and to warn the visitors. With only three weeks to go of her year of research on Hyperion, Rachel awoke one night, left her sleeping lover, and took a ground-effect jeep from the camp to the tombs. She and Melio had decided that it was foolish for both of them to monitor the equipment every night. Now they alternated, one working at the site while the other collated data and prepared for the final project, a radar mapping of the dunes between the Jade Tomb and the Obelisk. The night was cool and beautiful. A profusion of stars stretched from horizon to horizon, four or five times the number Rachel had grown up looking at from Barnard's world. The low dunes whispered and shifted in the strong breeze blowing from the mountains in the south. Rachel found lights still burning at the site. The physics team was just calling it a day and loading their own jeep. She chatted with them, had a cup of coffee as they drove away, and then took her backpack and made the twenty-five-minute trip into the basement of the Sphinx. For the hundredth time, Rachel wondered who had built the tombs and for what purpose. Dating of the construction materials had been useless because of the effect of the anti-entropic field. Only analysis of the tombs in relation to the erosion of the canyon and other surrounding geological features had suggested an age of at least half a million years. The feeling was that the architects of the time tombs had been humanoid, even though nothing but the gross scale of the structure suggested such a thing. Certainly the passageways in the Sphinx revealed little. Some were human enough in size and shape, but then meters farther along the same corridor might dwindle to a tube the size of a sewer pipe, and then transform itself into something larger and more random than a natural cavern. Doorways, if they could be called such, since they opened to nothing in particular, might be triangular or trapezoidal or ten-sided as commonly as rectangular. Rachel crawled the last twenty meters down a steep slope, sliding her backpack ahead of her. 
The heatless glow globes gave the rock and her flesh a bluish, bloodless cast. The basement, when she reached it, seemed a haven of human clutter and smells. Several folding chairs filled the center of the small space, while detectors, oscilloscopes, and other paraphernalia lined the narrow table against the north wall. A plank on sawhorses along the opposite wall held coffee cups, a chess set, a half-eaten donut, two paperbacks, and a plastic toy of some sort of dog in a grass skirt. Rachel settled in, set her coffee therm next to the toy, and checked the cosmic ray detectors. The data appeared to be the same. No hidden rooms or passages. Just a few niches even the deep radar had missed. In the morning, Melio and Stefan would set a deep probe working, getting an imager filament in and sampling the air before digging further with a micro-manipulator. So far, a dozen such niches had turned up nothing of interest. The joke at camp was that the next hole, no bigger than a fist, would reveal miniature sarcophagi, undersized urns, a petite mummy, or, as Melio put it, a teeny tiny Tutankhamun. Out of habit, Rachel tried the comm links on her comm log. Nothing. Forty meters of stone tended to do that. They had talked of stringing telephone wire from the basement to the surface, but there had been no pressing need, and now their time was almost up. Rachel adjusted the input channels on her comm log to monitor the detector data, and then settled back for a long, boring night. There was the wonderful story of the old earth pharaoh. Was it Cheops, who authorized his huge pyramid, agreed to the burial chamber being deep under the center of the thing, and then lay awake nights for years in a claustrophobic panic, thinking of all those tons of stones above him for all eternity? Eventually the pharaoh ordered the burial chamber repositioned two-thirds the way up in the Great Pyramid. Most unorthodox. Rachel could understand the king's position. She hoped that, wherever he was, he slept better now. Rachel was almost dozing herself when, at 0215, her comm log chirped, the detectors screamed, and she jumped to her feet. According to the sensors, the Sphinx had suddenly grown a dozen new chambers, some larger than the total structure. Rachel keyed displays, and the air misted with models that changed as she watched. Corridor schematics twisted back on themselves like rotating Mobius strips. The external sensors indicated the upper structure twisting and bending like polyflex in the wind, or like wings. Rachel knew that it was some type of multiple malfunction, but even as she tried to recalibrate, she called data and impressions into her comm log. Then several things happened at once. She heard the drag of feet in the corridor above her. All of the displays went dead simultaneously. Somewhere in the maze of corridors, a time tide alarm began to blare. All of the lights went off. This final event made no sense. The instrument packages held their own power supplies and would have stayed lighted through a nuclear attack. The lamp they used in the basement had a new ten-year power cell. The glow globes in the corridors were bioluminescent and needed no power. Nonetheless, the lights were out. Rachel pulled a flashlight laser out of the knee pocket of her jumpsuit and triggered it. Nothing happened. For the first time in her life, terror closed on Rachel Weintraub like a hand on her heart. She could not breathe. For ten seconds she willed herself to be absolutely still, not even listening, merely waiting for the panic to recede. When it had subsided enough for her to breathe without gasping, she felt her way to the instruments and keyed them. They did not respond. She lifted her comm log and thumbed the disk key. Nothing which was impossible, of course, given the solid-state invulnerability and power cell reliability of the thing. Still nothing. Rachel could hear her pulse pounding now, but she again fought back the panic and began feeling her way toward the only exit. The thought of finding her way through the maze in absolute darkness made her want to scream, but she could think of no other alternatives. Wait. There had been old lights throughout the Sphinx maze, but the research team had strung the glow globes strung them. There was a purlon line connecting them all the way to the surface. Fine. Rachel groped her way toward the exit, feeling the cold stone under her fingers. Was it this cold before? There came the clear sound of something sharp scraping its way down the access shaft. Melio? called Rachel into the blackness. Tanya? Kurt? The scraping sounded very close. Rachel backed away, knocking over an instrument and chair in the blackness. Something touched her hair and she gasped, raised her hand. 
The ceiling was lower. The solid block of stone, five meters square, slid lower even as she raised her other hand to touch it. The opening to the corridor was halfway up the wall. Rachel staggered toward it, swinging her hands in front of her like a blind person. She tripped over a folding chair, found the instrument table, followed it to the far wall, felt the bottom of the corridor shaft disappearing as the ceiling came lower. She pulled back her fingers a second before they were sliced off. Rachel sat down in the darkness. An oscilloscope scraped against the ceiling until the table cracked and collapsed under it. Rachel moved her head in short, desperate arcs. There was a metallic rasp, almost a breathing sound, less than a meter from her. She began to back away, sliding across a floor suddenly filled with broken equipment. The breathing grew louder. Something sharp and infinitely cold grasped her wrist. Rachel screamed at last. There was no fat line transmitter on Hyperion in those days, nor did the spin ship HS Faro City have FTL comm capability. So the first Saul and Sarai heard of their daughter's accident was when the Hegemony Consulate on Parvati fatlined the college that Rachel had been injured, that she was stable but unconscious, and that she was being transferred from Parvati to the web world of Renaissance Vector via medical torch ship. The trip would take a little over ten days ship time with a five-month time debt. Those five months were agony for Saul and his wife, and by the time the medical ship put in at the Renaissance Farcaster Nexus, they had imagined the worst a thousand times. It had been eight years since they had last seen Rachel. The med center in Da Vinci was a floating tower sustained by direct broadcast power. The view over the Como Sea was breathtaking, but neither Saul nor Sarai had time for it as they went from level to level in search of their daughter. Dr. Singh and Melio Arundes met them in the hub of intensive care. Introductions were rushed. Rachel? asked Sarai. Asleep, said Dr. Singh. She was a tall woman, aristocratic, but with kind eyes. As far as we can tell, Rachel has suffered no physical, uh, injury. But she has been unconscious now for some seventeen standard weeks, her time. Only in the past ten days have her brain waves registered deep sleep rather than coma. I don't understand, said Saul. Was there an accident at the site? A concussion? Something happened, said Melio Arundes, but we're not sure what. Rachel was in one of the artifacts, alone. Her comm log and other instruments recorded nothing out of the ordinary, but there was a surge in a phenomenon there known as anti-entropic fields. The time tides, said Saul. We know about them. Go on. Arundes nodded and opened his hands as if molding air. There was a field surge, more like a tsunami than a tide. The Sphinx, the artifact Rachel was in, was totally inundated. I mean, there was no physical damage, but Rachel was unconscious when we found her. He turned to Dr. Singh for help. Your daughter was in a coma, said the doctor. It was not possible to put her into cryogenic fugue in that condition. So she came through Quantum Leap without fugue, demanded Saul. He had read about the psychological damage to travelers who had experienced the Hawking effect directly. No, no, soothed Singh. She was unconscious in a way which shielded her quite as well as fugue state. Is she hurt? demanded Sarai. We don't know, said Singh. All life signs have returned to near normal. Brainwave activity is nearing a conscious state. The problem is that her body appears to have absorbed, that is, the anti-entropic field appears to have contaminated her. Saul rubbed his forehead. Like radiation sickness? Dr. Singh hesitated. Not precisely. Ah, this case is quite unprecedented. Specialists in aging diseases are due in this afternoon from Tau Ceti Center, Lucis, and Metaxas. Saul met the woman's gaze. Doctor, are you saying that Rachel contracted some aging disease on Hyperion? He paused a second to search his memory. Something like Methuselah syndrome or early Alzheimer's disease? No, said Singh. In fact, your daughter's illness has no name. The medics here are calling it Merlin sickness. You see, your daughter is aging at a normal rate, but as far as we can tell, she is aging backward. Sarai pulled away from the group and stared at Singh as if the doctor were insane. 
I want to see my daughter, she said, quietly but very firmly. I want to see Rachel now. Rachel awakened less than forty hours after Saul and Sarai arrived. Within minutes, she was sitting up in bed, talking even while the medics and technicians bustled around her. Mom! Dad! What are you doing here? Before either could answer, she looked around her and blinked. Wait a minute. Where's here? Are we in Keats? Her mother took her hand. We're in a hospital in Da Vinci, dear, on Renaissance Vector. Rachel's eyes widened almost comically. Renaissance? We're in the web? She looked around her in total bewilderment. Rachel, what is the last thing you remember? asked Dr. Singh. The young woman looked uncomprehendingly at the medic. The last thing I... I remember going to sleep next to Malio after... She glanced at her parents and touched her cheeks with the tips of her fingers. Malio? The others? Are they? Everyone on the expedition is all right, soothed Dr. Singh. You had a slight accident. About seventeen weeks have passed. You're back in the web. Safe. Everyone in your party is all right. Seventeen weeks? Under the fading remnant of her tan, Rachel went very pale. Saul took her hand. How do you feel, kiddo? The return pressure on his fingers was heartbreakingly weak. I don't know, Daddy, she managed. Tired. Dizzy. Confused. Sarai sat on the bed and put her arms around her. It's all right, baby. Everything's going to be all right. Malio entered the room, unshaven, his hair rumpled from the nap he had been taking in the outer lounge. Rach? Rachel looked at him from the safety of her mother's arm. Hi, she said, almost shyly. I'm back. Saul's opinion had been, and continued to be, that medicine hadn't really changed much since the days of leeches and poultices. Nowadays, they whirred one in centrifuges, realigned the body's magnetic field, bombarded the victim with sonic waves, tapped into the cells to interrogate the RNA, and then admitted their ignorance without actually coming out and saying so. The only thing that had changed was that the bills were bigger. He was dozing in a chair when Rachel's voice awoke him. Daddy? He sat up reached for her hand. Here, kiddo. Where am I, Dad? What's happened? You're in a hospital on Renaissance, baby. There was an accident on Hyperion. You're all right now, except it's affecting your memory a bit. Rachel clung to his hand. A hospital? In the web? How'd I get here? How long have I been here? About five weeks, whispered Saul. What's the last thing you remember, Rachel? She sat back on her pillows and touched her forehead, feeling the tiny sensors there. Malio and I had been at the meeting, talking with the team about setting up the search equipment in the Sphinx. Oh, Dad, I haven't told you about Malio. He's... Yes, said Saul, and handed Rachel her comm log. Here, kiddo, listen to this. He left the room. Rachel touched the disc key and blinked as her own voice began talking to her. Okay, Rach, you just woke up. You're confused. You don't know how you got here. Well, something's happened to you, kid. Listen up. I'm recording this on the twelfth day of ten month, year 457 of the Hegira, A.D. 2739, Old Reckoning. Yes, I know that's half a standard year from the last thing you remember. Listen. Something happened in the Sphinx. You got caught up in the time tide. It changed you. You're aging backward as dumb as that sounds. Your body's getting younger every minute, although that's not the important part right now. When you sleep, when we sleep, you forget. You lose another day from your memory before the accident, and you lose everything since. Don't ask me why. The doctors don't know. The experts don't know. If you want an analogy, just think of a tapeworm virus, one of the old kind, that's chewing up the data in your comm log, backward from the last entry. They don't know why the memory loss hits you when you sleep, either. They tried stay awakes, but after about thirty hours you just go catatonic for a while and the virus does its thing anyway. So what the hell? You know something? 
and this talking about yourself in the third person is sort of therapeutic. Actually, I'm lying here waiting for them to take me up to imaging, knowing I'll fall asleep when I get back, knowing I'll forget everything again, and it scares the shit out of me. Okay, key the disk key for short term and you get a prepared spiel here that should catch you up on everything since the accident. Oh, Mom and Dad are both here and they know about Melio. But I don't know as much as I used to. When did we first make love with him, hmm? The second month on Hyperion? Then we have just a few weeks left, Rachel, and then we'll be just acquaintances. Enjoy your memories while you can, girl. This is Yesterday's Rachel, signing off. Saul came in to find his daughter sitting upright in the bed, still grasping the comm log tightly, her face pale and terrified. Daddy! He went to sit next to her and let her cry, for the twentieth night in a row. Eight standard weeks after she arrived on Renaissance, Saul and Sarai waved goodbye to Rachel and Malio at the Da Vinci Farcaster multiport, and then Farcast home to Barnard's world. I don't think she should have left the hospital, muttered Sarai, as they took the evening shuttle to Crawford. The continent was a patchwork of harvest-ready right angles below them. Mother, said Saul, touching her knee. The doctors would have kept her there forever, but they're doing it for their own curiosity now. They've done everything they can to help her. Nothing. She has a life to live. But why go away with, with him, said Sarai. She barely knows him. Saul sighed and leaned back against the cushions of his seat. In two weeks, she won't remember him at all, he said. At least in the way they share now. Look at it from her position, mother. Fighting every day to reorient herself in a world gone mad. She's twenty-five years old and in love. Let her be happy. Sarai turned her face to the window, and together, not speaking, they watched the red sun hang like a tethered balloon on the edge of evening. Saul was well into the second semester when Rachel called. It was a one-way message via Farcaster cable from Freeholm, and her image hung in the center of the old hollow pit like a familiar ghost. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Sorry I haven't written or called the past few weeks. I guess you know that I've left the university. And Malio. It was dumb to try to take new graduate-level stuff. I'd just forget Tuesday whatever was discussed Monday. Even with disks and comlog prompts, it was a losing battle. I may enroll in the undergraduate program again. I remember all of it. Just kidding. It was just too hard with Melio, too. Or so my notes tell me. It wasn't his fault, I'm sure of that. He was gentle and patient and loving to the end. It's just that, well, you can't start from scratch on a relationship every day. Our apartment was filled with photos of us, notes I wrote to myself about us, hollows of us on Hyperion, but you know. In the morning he would be an absolute stranger. By afternoon I began to believe what we'd had, even if I couldn't remember. By evening I'd be crying in his arms. Then sooner or later I'd go to sleep. It's better this way. Rachel's image paused, turned as if she was going to break contact, and then steadied. She smiled at them. So anyway, I've left school for a while. The Free Home Med Center wants me full-time, but they'd have to get in line. I got an offer from the Tau Ceti Research Institute that's hard to turn down. They offer a, I think they call it a, research honorarium that's bigger than what we paid for four years at Neitenhelzer and all of Reich's combined. I turned them down. I'm still going in as an outpatient, but the RNA transplant series just leaves me with bruises and a depressed feeling. Of course, I could just be depressed because every morning I can't remember where the bruises came from. Ha ha. Anyway, I'll be staying with Tanya for a while, and then maybe... I thought maybe I'd come home for a while. Second month's my birthday. I'll be twenty-two again. Weird, huh? At any rate, it's a lot easier being around people I know, and I met Tanya just after I transferred here when I was twenty-two. I think you understand. So, is my old room still there, Mom? Or have you turned it into a mahjong parlor like you've always threatened? So right, or give me a call. Next time I'll shell out the money for two ways so we can really talk. I just... I guess I thought... Rachel waved. Gotta go. 
See you later, alligators. I love you both. Saul flew to Bassard City the week before Rachel's birthday to pick her up at the world's only public park caster Terminex. He saw her first, standing with her luggage near the floral clock. She looked young, but not noticeably younger than when they had waved goodbye on Renaissance Vector. No, Saul realized, there was something less confident about her posture. He shook his head to rid himself of such thoughts, called to her, and ran to hug her. The look of shock on her face when he released her was so profound that he could not ignore it. What is it, sweetie? What's wrong? It was one of the few times he had ever seen his daughter totally at a loss for words. I... you... I forgot, she stammered. She shook her head in a familiar way and managed to laugh and cry at the same instant. You look a little different, is all, Dad. I remember leaving here like it was literally yesterday. When I saw your hair... Rachel covered her mouth. Saul ran his hand across his scalp. Ah, yes, he said, suddenly close to laughing and crying himself. With your school and travels, it's been more than eleven years. I'm old and bald. He opened his arms again. Welcome back, little one. Rachel moved into the protective circle of his embrace. For several months, things went well. Rachel felt more secure with familiar things around and for Sarai the heartbreak of their daughter's illness was temporarily offset by the pleasure of having her home again. Rachel rose early every morning and viewed her private orientation show, which Saul knew contained images of him and Sarai a dozen years older than she remembered. He tried to imagine what it was like for Rachel. She awoke in her own bed, memory fresh, twenty-two years old, home on vacation before going off-world to graduate school, only to find her parents suddenly aged a hundred small changes in the house and town, the news different, years of history having passed her by. Saul could not imagine it. Their first mistake was acceding to Rachel's wishes in inviting her old friends to her twenty-second birthday party, the same crew who had celebrated the first time, irrepressible Nicky, Don Stewart and his friend Howard, Kathy Obeg and Marta Tin, her best friend Lena McKyler, all of them then just out of college shucking off cocoons of childhood for new lives. Rachel had seen them all since her return, but she had slept and forgotten. And Saul and Sarai this one time did not remember that she had forgotten. Nikki was thirty-four standard, with two children of her own, still energetic, still irrepressible, but ancient by Rachel's standards. Don and Howard talked about their investments, their children's sports accomplishments, and their upcoming vacations. Kathy was confused speaking only twice to Rachel, and then as if she was speaking to an imposter. Marta was openly jealous of Rachel's youth. Lena, who had become an ardent Zen Gnostic in the years between, cried and left early. When they had gone, Rachel sat in the post-party ruin of the living room and stared at the half-eaten cake. She did not cry. Before going upstairs, she hugged her mother and whispered to her father, Dad, please don't let me do anything like that again. Then she went upstairs to sleep. It was that spring when Saul again had the dream. He was lost in a great dark place, lighted only by two red orbs. It was not absurd when the flat voice said, Saul, take your daughter, your only daughter Rachel, whom you love, and go to the world called Hyperion, and offer her there as a burnt offering at one of the places of which I shall tell you and Saul had screamed into the darkness. You already have her, you son of a bitch. What do I have to do to get her back? Tell me. Tell me, God damn you. And Saul Weintraub woke sweating with tears in his eyes and anger in his heart. In the other room he could feel his daughter sleeping while the great worm devoured her. In the months which followed, Saul became obsessive about obtaining information on Hyperion, the Time Tombs, and the Shrike. As a trained researcher, he was astounded that there were so little hard data on so provocative a topic. There was the Church of the Shrike, of course. There were no temples on Barnard's world, but many in the web. But he soon found that seeking hard information in Shrike cult literature was like trying to map the geography of Sarnat by visiting a Buddhist monastery. Time was mentioned in Shrike Church dogma, but only in the sense that the Shrike was supposed to be 
the angel of retribution from beyond time, and that true time had ended for the human race when old earth died, and that the four centuries since had been false time. Saul found their tracks the usual combination of double talk and naval lint gathering common to most religions. Still, he planned to visit a Shrike Church temple as soon as he had explored more serious avenues of research. Melio Arundes launched another Hyperion expedition, also sponsored by Reich's university, this one with the stated goal of isolating and understanding the time-tide phenomenon which had inflicted the Merlin sickness on Rachel. A major development was the Hegemony Protectorate's decision to send along on that expedition a Farcaster transmitter for installation at the Hegemony Consulate in Keats. Even so, it would be more than three years' web time before the expedition arrived on Hyperion. Saul's first instinct was to go with Arundes and his team. Certainly any holodrama would have the primary characters returning to the scene of the action. But Saul overrode the instinctive urge within minutes. He was a historian and philosopher. Any contribution he might make to the expedition's success would be minute at best. Rachel still retained the interest and skills of a well-trained undergraduate archaeologist to be, but those skills dwindled a bit each day, and Saul could see no benefit to her returning to the site of the accident. Each day would be a shock to her, awakening on a strange world, on a mission which would require skills unknown to her. Sarai would not allow such a thing. Saul set aside the book he was working on, an analysis of Kierkegaard's theories of ethics as compromise morality as applied to the legal machinery of the hegemony, and concentrated on collecting arcane data on time, on Hyperion, and on the story of Abraham. Months spent carrying on business as usual and collecting information did little to satisfy his need for action. Occasionally, he vented his frustration on the medical and scientific specialists who came to examine Rachel like streams of pilgrims to a holy shrine. How the hell can this be happening? he screamed at one little specialist, who had made the mistake of being both smug and condescending to the patient's father. The doctor had a head so hairless, his face looked like lines painted on a billiard ball. She's begun growing smaller, Saul shouted, literally buttonholing the retreating expert. Not so one can see, but bone mass is decreasing. How can she even begin to become a child again? What the hell does that do to the law of conservation of mass? The expert had moved his mouth, but had been too rattled to speak. His bearded colleague answered for him. M. Weintraub, he said. Sir, you have to understand that your daughter is currently inhabiting, ah, uh, think of it as a localized region of reversed entropy. Saul wheeled on the other man. Are you saying that she is merely stuck in a bubble of backwardness? Ah, no, said the colleague, massaging his chin nervously. Perhaps a better analogy is that, biologically at least, the life metabolism mechanism has been reversed. Ah, nonsense, snapped Saul. She doesn't excrete for nutrition or regurgitate her food. And what about all the neurological activity? Reverse the electrochemical impulses and you get nonsense. Her brain works, gentlemen. It's her memory that is disappearing. Why, gentlemen? Why? The specialist finally found his voice. We don't know why, M. Weintraub. Mathematically, your daughter's body resembles a time-reversed equation. Or perhaps an object which has passed through a rapidly spinning black hole. We don't know how this has happened or why the physically impossible is occurring in this instance, M. Weintraub. We just don't know enough. Saul shook each man's hand. Fine. That's all I wanted to know, gentlemen. Have a good trip back. On Rachel's twenty-first birthday, she came to Saul's door an hour after they had all turned in. Daddy? What is it, kiddo? Saul pulled on his robe and joined her in the doorway. Can't sleep? I haven't slept for two days, she whispered. Been taking stay-awakes so I can get through all of the briefing stuff I left in the want-to-know file. Saul nodded. Daddy, would you come downstairs and have a drink with me? I've got some things I want to talk about. Saul got his glasses from the nightstand and joined her downstairs. It proved to be the first and only time that Saul would get drunk with his daughter. It was not a boisterous drunk. For a while they chatted, then began telling jokes and making puns, until each was giggling too hard to continue. Rachel started to tell another story, sipped her drink just at the funniest part, and almost snorted whiskey out her nose, she was laughing so hard. 
Each of them thought it was the funniest thing that had ever happened. I'll get another bottle, said Saul, when the tears had ceased. Dean Moore gave me some scotch last Christmas, I think. When he returned, walking carefully, Rachel had sat up on the couch and brushed her hair back with her fingers. He poured her a small amount, and the two drank in silence for a while. Daddy? Yes? I went through the whole thing. Saw myself, listened to myself, saw the hollows of Lena and the others all middle-aged. Hardly middle-aged, said Saul. Lena will be thirty-five next month. Well, old, you know what I mean. Anyway, I read the medical briefs, saw the photos from Hyperion. And you know what? What? I don't believe any of it, Dad. Saul put down his drink and looked at his daughter. Her face was fuller than before, less sophisticated, and even more beautiful. I mean, I do believe it, she said with a small scared laugh. It's not like you and Mom would put on such a cruel joke. Plus, there's your, your age and the news and all. I know it's real, but I don't believe it. Do you know what I mean, Dad? Yes, said Saul. I mean, I woke up this morning and I thought, great, tomorrow's the paleontology exam and I've hardly studied. I was looking forward to showing Roger Sherman a thing or two. He thinks he's so smart. Saul took a drink. Roger died three years ago in a plane crash south of Bassard, he said. He would not have spoken without the whiskey in him, but he had to find out if there was a Rachel hiding within the Rachel. I know, said Rachel, and pulled her knees up to her chin. I accessed everybody I knew. Graham's dead. Professor Eichhardt isn't teaching anymore. Nicky married some salesman. A lot happens in four years. More than eleven years, said Saul. The trip to and from Hyperion left you six years behind us stay-at-homes. But that's normal, cried Rachel. People travel outside the web all the time. They cope. Saul nodded. But this is different, kiddo. Rachel managed to smile and drained the last of her whiskey. Boy, what an understatement. She set the glass down with a sharp, final sound. Look, here's what I've decided. I've spent two and a half days going through all of the stuff she, I, prepared to let me know what's happened, what's going on. And it just doesn't help. Saul sat perfectly still, not even daring to breathe. I mean, said Rachel, knowing that I'm getting younger every day, losing the memory of people I haven't even met yet. I mean, what happens next? I just keep getting younger and smaller and less capable until I just disappear someday? Jesus, Dad. Rachel wrapped her arms more tightly around her knees. It's sort of funny in a weird way, isn't it? No, Saul said quietly. No, I'm sure it's not, said Rachel. Her eyes, always large and dark, were moist. It must be the worst nightmare in the world for you and Mom. Every day you have to watch me come down the stairs, confused waking up with yesterday's memories, but hearing my own voice tell me that yesterday was years ago, that I had a love affair with some guy named Emilio. Emilio, whispered Saul. Whatever. It just doesn't help, Dad. By the time I can even begin to absorb it, I'm so worn out that I have to sleep. Then, well, you know what happens then. What, began Saul, and had to clear his throat. What do you want us to do, little one? Rachel looked him in the eye and smiled. It was the same smile she had gifted him with since her fifth week of life. Don't tell me, Dad, she said firmly. Don't let me tell me. It just hurts. I mean, I didn't live those times. She paused and touched her forehead. You know what I mean, Dad. The Rachel who went to another planet and fell in love and got hurt. That was a different Rachel. I shouldn't have to suffer her pain. She was crying now. Do you understand? Do you? Yes, said Saul. He opened his arms and felt her warmth and tears against his chest. Yes, I understand. Fatline messages from Hyperion came frequently the next year, but they were all negative. 
the nature and source of the anti-entropic fields had not been found. No unusual time tide activity had been measured around the Sphinx. Experiments with laboratory animals in and around the tidal regions had resulted in sudden death for some animals, but the Merlin sickness had not been replicated. Malio ended every message with, My love to Rachel. Saul and Sarai used money loaned from Reich's university to receive limited Polson treatments in Bussard City. They were already too old for the process to extend their lives for another century, but it restored the look of a couple approaching fifty standard rather than seventy. They studied old family photos and found that it was not too difficult to dress the way they had a decade and a half before. Sixteen-year-old Rachel tripped down the stairs with her comm log tuned to the college radio station. Can I have rice cereal? Don't you have it every morning? smiled Sarai. Yes, grinned Rachel. I just thought we might be out or something. I heard the phone. Was that Nicky? No, said Saul. Damn, said Rachel, and glanced at them. Sorry. But she promised she'd call as soon as the standardized scores came in. Three weeks since tutorials. You'd think I'd have heard something. Don't worry, said Sarai. She brought the coffee pot to the table, started to pour Rachel a cup, poured it for herself. Don't worry, honey. I promise you that your scores will be good enough to get you into any school you want. Mom, sighed Rachel. You don't know. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. She frowned. Have you seen my math ansible? My room was all messed around. I couldn't find anything. Saul cleared his throat. No classes today, kiddo. Rachel stared. No classes? On a Tuesday? Six weeks from graduation? What's up? You've been sick, Sarai said firmly. You can stay home one day. Just today. Rachel's frown deepened. Sick? I don't feel sick. Just sort of weird. Like things aren't... aren't right somehow. Like why is the couch moved around in the media room? And where's Chips? I called and called, but he didn't come. Saul touched his daughter's wrist. You've been sick for a while, he said. The doctor said you might wake up with a few gaps. Let's talk while we walk over to the campus. Want to? Rachel brightened. Skip classes and go to the college? Sure. She faked a look of consternation. As long as we don't run into Roger Sherman. He's taking freshman calculus up there, and he's such a pain. We won't see Roger, said Saul. Ready to go? Almost. Rachel leaned over and gave her mother a huge hug. Later, alligator. Wow, crocodile, said Sarai. Okay, grinned Rachel her long hair bouncing. I'm ready. The constant trips to Bassard City had required the purchase of an EMV, and on a cool day in autumn Saul took the slowest route, far below the traffic lanes, enjoying the sight and smell of the harvested fields below. More than a few men and women working in the fields waved to him. Bussard had grown impressively since Saul's childhood, but the synagogue was still there on the edge of one of the oldest neighborhoods in the city. The temple was old. Saul felt old. Even the yarmulke he put on as he entered seemed ancient, worn thin by decades of use. But the rabbi was young. Saul realized that the man was at least forty. His hair was thinning on either side of the dark skull cap. But to Saul's eyes, he was little more than a boy. Saul was relieved when the younger man suggested that they finish their conversation in the park across the street. They sat on a park bench. Saul was surprised to find himself still carrying the yarmulke, passing the cloth from hand to hand. The day smelled of burning leaves and the previous night's rain. I don't quite understand, M. Weintraub, said the rabbi. Is it the dream you're disturbed about, or the fact that your daughter has become ill since you began the dream? Saul raised his head to feel the sunlight on his face. Neither exactly, he said. I just can't help but feel that the two are connected somehow. The rabbi ran a finger over his lower lip. How old is your daughter? Thirteen, said Saul, after an imperceptible pause. And is the illness serious? Life-threatening? Not life-threatening, said Saul. Not yet. The rabbi folded his arms across an ample belly. You don't believe... 
May I call you Saul? Of course. Saul, you don't believe that by having this dream, that somehow you've caused your little girl's illness, do you? No, said Saul, and sat a moment, wondering deep within if he was telling the truth. No, Rabbi, I don't think. Call me Mort, Saul. All right, Mort. I didn't come because I believe that I, or the dream, am causing Rachel's illness. But I believe my subconscious might be trying to tell me something. Mort rocked back and forth slightly. Perhaps a neurospecialist or psychologist could help you more there, Saul. I'm not sure what I... I'm interested in the story of Abraham, interrupted Saul. I mean, I've had some experience with different ethical systems, but it's hard for me to understand one which began with the order to a father to slay his son. No, 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 cried the rabbi, waving oddly childlike fingers in front of him. When the time came, God stayed Abraham's hand. He would not have allowed a human sacrifice in his name. It was the obedience to the will of the Lord that... Yes, said Saul, obedience. But it says... Then Abraham put forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. God must have looked into his soul and seen that Abraham was ready to slay Isaac. A mere show of obedience without inner commitment would not have appeased the God of Genesis. What would have happened if Abraham had loved his son more than he loved God? Mort drummed his fingers on his knee a moment and then reached out to grasp Saul's upper arm. Saul, I can see you're upset about your daughter's illness. Don't get it mixed up with a document written 8,000 years ago. Tell me more about your little girl. I mean, children don't die of diseases anymore, not in the web. Saul rose, smiled, and stepped back to free his arm. I'd like to talk more, Mort. I want to, but I have to get back. I have a class this evening. Will you come to temple this Sabbath? asked the rabbi, extending stubby fingers for a final human contact. Saul dropped the yarmulke into the younger man's hands. Perhaps one of these days, Mort. One of these days I will. Later the same autumn, Saul looked out the window of his study to see the dark figure of a man standing under the bare elm in front of the house. The media, thought Saul, his heart sinking. For a decade he had been dreading the day the secret got out, knowing it would mean the end of their simple life in Crawford. He walked out into the evening chill. Malio, he said when he saw the tall man's face. The archaeologist stood with his hands in the pockets of his long blue coat. Despite the ten standard years since their last contact, Arundes had aged but little. Saul guessed that he was still in his late twenties. But the younger man's heavily tanned face was lined with worry. Saul, he said, and extended his hand almost shyly. Saul shook his hand warmly. I didn't know you were back. Come into the house. No. The archaeologist took a half-step back. I've been out here for an hour, Saul. I didn't have the courage to come to the door. Saul started to speak, but then merely nodded. He put his hands in his own pockets against the chill. The first stars were becoming visible above the dark gables of the house. Rachel's not home right now, he said at last. She went to the library. She... She thinks she has a history paper due. Melio took a ragged breath and nodded in return. Saul, he said, his voice thick. You and Sarai need to understand that we did everything we could. The team was on Hyperion for almost three standard years. We would have stayed if the university hadn't cut our funds. There was nothing. We know, said Saul. We appreciated the fat line messages. I spent months alone in the Sphinx myself, said Melio. According to the instruments, it was just an inert pile of stones, but sometimes I thought I felt something. He shook his head again. I failed her, Saul. No, said Saul, and gripped the younger man's shoulder through the wool coat. But I have a question. We've been in touch with our senators, even talked to the science council directors. But no one can explain to me why the hegemony hasn't spent more time and money investigating the phenomena on Hyperion. It seems to me that they should have invested that world into the web long ago, if only for its scientific potential. How can they ignore an enigma like the tombs? I know what you mean, Saul. Even the early cutoff of our funds was suspicious. 
It's as if the hegemony had a policy to keep Hyperion at arm's length. Do you think— began Saul. But at that moment Rachel approached them in the autumn twilight. Her hands were thrust deep in her red jacket. Her hair was cut short in the decades-old style of adolescence everywhere, and her full cheeks were flushed with the cold. Rachel was teetering on the brink of childhood and young adulthood. Her long legs and jeans, sports shoes, and bulky jacket might have been the silhouette of a boy. She grinned at them. Hi, Dad. Stepping closer in the dim light, she nodded at Melio shyly. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt your conversation. Saul took a breath. That's all right, kiddo. Rachel, this is Dr. Arundes from Reich's University on Freeholm. Dr. Arundes, my daughter, Rachel. Pleased to meet you, said Rachel, beaming in earnest now. Wow, Reich's. I've read their catalogs. I'd love to go there someday. Melio nodded rigidly. Saul could see the stiffness in his shoulders and torso. Do you... began Melio. That is, what would you like to study there? Saul thought the pain in the man's voice must be audible to Rachel, but she only shrugged and laughed. Oh, geez, everything. Old Mr. Eichhardt, he's the paleontology archaeology toot in the advanced class I take up at the Ed Center. He says they have a great classics and ancient artifacts department. They do managed Melio. Rachel glanced shyly from her father to the stranger, apparently sensing the tension there but not knowing the source. Well, I'm just interrupting your conversation more here. I've got to get in and get to bed. I guess I've had this strange virus, sort of like meningitis, Mom says, only it must make me sort of goofy. Anyway, nice to meet you, Dr. Arundes. I hope I'll see you at Reich someday. I hope that too, said Melio staring at her so intensely in the gloom that Saul had the feeling he was trying to memorize everything about the instant. Okay. Well, said Rachel, and stepped back, her rubber-soled shoes squeaking on the sidewalk. Good night, then. See you in the morning, Dad. Good night, Rachel. She paused at the doorway. The gaslight on the lawn made her look much younger than thirteen. Later, alligators. Wild crocodile, said Saul and heard Melio whisper it in unison. They stood a while in silence, feeling the night settle on the small town. A boy on a bicycle rode by, leaves crackling under his wheels, spokes gleaming in the pools of light under the old street lamps. Come in the house, Saul said to the silent man. Sarai will be very pleased to see you. Rachel will be asleep. Not now, said Melio. He was a shadow there, his hands still in his pockets. I need to. It was a mistake, Saul. He started to turn away, looked back. I'll phone when I get to free home, he said. We'll get another expedition put together. Saul nodded. Three years' transit, he thought. If they left tonight, she would be. Not quite ten before they arrive. Good, he said. Melio paused raised a hand in farewell, and walked away along the curb, ignoring the leaves that crunched underfoot. Saul never saw him in person again. The largest church of the Shrike in the web was on Lucis, and Saul forecast there a few weeks before Rachel's tenth birthday. The building itself was not much larger than an old earth cathedral, but it seemed gigantic with its effect of flying buttresses in search of a church, twisted upper stories, and support walls of stained glass. Saul's mood was low, and the brutal Lucian gravity did nothing to lighten it. Despite his appointment with the bishop, Saul had to wait more than five hours before he was allowed into the inner sanctum. He spent most of the time staring at the slowly rotating twenty-meter steel and polychrome sculpture which might have been of the legendary shrike, and might have been an abstract homage to every edged weapon ever invented. What interested Saul the most were the two red orbs floating within the nightmare space which might have been a skull. M. Weintraub. Your Excellency, said Saul. He noticed that the acolytes, exorcists, lectors, and ostiaries who had kept him company during the long wait had prostrated themselves on the dark tiles at the high priest's entry. Saul managed a formal bow. Please, please do come in, M. Weintraub, said the priest. He indicated the doorway to the Shrike Sanctuary with a sweep of his robed arm. Saul passed through, 
found himself in a dark and echoing place not too dissimilar from the setting of his recurrent dream, and took a seat where the bishop indicated. As the cleric moved to his own place at what looked like a small throne behind an intricately carved but thoroughly modern desk, Saul noticed that the high priest was a native Lucian, gone to fat and heavy in the jowls, but formidable in the way all Lucy's residents seemed to be. His robe was striking in its redness, a bright arterial red, flowing more like a contained liquid than like silk or velvet, trimmed in onyx ermine. The bishop wore a large ring on each finger, and they alternated red and black, producing a disturbing effect in Saul. Your Excellency, began Saul, I apologize in advance for any breach in church protocol which I have committed, or may commit. I confess I know little about the Church of the Shrike, but what I do know has brought me here. Please forgive me if I inadvertently display my ignorance by my clumsy use of titles or terms. The bishop wiggled his fingers at Saul. Red and black stones flashed in the weak light. Titles are unimportant, M. Weintraub. Addressing us as Your Excellency is quite acceptable for a non-believer. We must advise you, however, that the formal name of our modest group is the Church of the Final Atonement, and the entity whom the world so blithely calls the Shrike, we refer to, if we take his name at all, as the Lord of Pain, or more commonly the Avatar. Please proceed with the important query you said you had for us. Saul bowed slightly. Your Excellency, I am a teacher. Excuse us for interrupting, M. Weintraub, but you are much more than a teacher. You are a scholar. We are very familiar with your writings on moral hermeneutics. The reasoning therein is flawed but quite challenging. We use it regularly in our courses in doctrinal apologetics. Please proceed. Saul blinked. His work was almost unknown outside the most rarefied academic circles, and this recognition had thrown him. In the five seconds it took him to recover, Saul found it preferable to believe that the Shrike Bishop wanted to know with whom he spoke and had an excellent staff. Your Excellency, my background is immaterial. I ask to see you because my child, my daughter, has taken ill as a possible result of research she was carrying out in an area which is of some importance to your church. I speak, of course, of the so-called time tombs on the world of Hyperion. The bishop nodded slowly. Saul wondered if he knew about Rachel. You are aware, M. Weintraub, that the area you referred to, what we call the Covenant Arcs, have recently been declared off-limits to so-called researchers by the Home Rule Council of Hyperion? Yes, Your Excellency, I have heard that. I understand that your church was instrumental in that legislation being passed. The bishop showed no response to this. Far off, in the incense-layered gloom, small chimes sounded. At any rate, Your Excellency, I hoped that some aspect of your church's doctrine might shed light on my daughter's illness. The bishop inclined his head forward, so that the single shaft of light which illuminated him gleamed on his forehead and cast his eyes into shadow. Do you wish to receive religious instruction in the mysteries of the church, M. Weintraub? Saul touched his beard with a finger. No, Your Excellency, unless in so doing I might improve the well-being of my daughter. And does your daughter wish to be initiated into the Church of the Final Atonement? Saul hesitated a beat. Again, Your Excellency, she wishes to be well. If joining the Church would heal or help her, it would be a very serious consideration. The bishop sat back in a rustle of robes. Redness seemed to flow from him into the gloom. You speak of physical well-being, M. Weintraub. Our Church is the final arbiter of spiritual salvation. Are you aware that the former invariably flows from the latter? I am aware that this is an old and widely respected proposition, said Saul. The total well-being of our daughter is the concern of my wife and myself. The bishop rested his massive head on his fist. What is the nature of your daughter's illness, M. Weintraub? It is a time-related illness, Your Excellency. The bishop sat forward, suddenly tense. And at which of the holy sites did you say your daughter contracted this malady, M. Weintraub? The artifact called the Sphinx, Your Excellency. The bishop stood so quickly that papers on his desktop were knocked to the floor. Even without the robes, the man would have massed twice Saul's weight. 
in the fluttering red robes stretched to his full height, the Shrike priest now towered over Saul like crimson death incarnate. You can go, bellowed the big man. Your daughter is the most blessed and cursed of individuals. There is nothing that you or the church or any agent in this life can do for her. Saul stood, or rather sat, his ground. Your Excellency, if there is any possibility— No, cried the bishop, red in the face now, a consummately consistent apparition. He tapped at his desk. Exorcists and lectors appeared in the doorway, their black robes with red trim an ominous echo of the bishop. The all-black ostiaries blended with the shadows. The audience is at an end, said the bishop, with less volume but infinite finality. Your daughter has been chosen by the Avatar to atone in a way which all sinners and non-believers must someday suffer. Someday very soon. Your Excellency, if I can have just five minutes more of your time. The bishop snapped his fingers, and the exorcists came forward to escort Saul out. The men were Lucian. One of them could have handled five scholars Saul's size. Your Excellency, cried Saul, after he had shrugged off the first man's hands. The three other exorcists came to assist with the equally brawny lectors hovering nearby. The bishop had turned his back and seemed to be staring into the darkness. The outer sanctuary echoed to grunts and the scraping of Saul's heels, and to at least one loud gasp as Saul's foot made contact with the least priestly parts of the lead exorcist. The outcome of the debate was not affected. Saul landed in the street. The last ostiary to turn away tossed Saul's battered hat to him. Ten more days on Lucis achieved nothing but more gravity fatigue for Saul. The temple bureaucracy would not answer his calls. The courts could offer him no wedge. The exorcists waited just within the doors of the vestibule. Saul Parr cast to New Earth and Renaissance Vector, to Fuji and T.C. Squared, to Deneb Dry and Deneb Veer, but everywhere the Shrike temples were closed to him. Exhausted, frustrated, out of money, Saul cast home to Barnard's world, got the EMV out of the long-term lot, and arrived home an hour before Rachel's birthday. Did you bring me anything, Daddy? asked the excited ten-year-old. Sarai had told her that day that Saul had been gone. Saul brought out the wrapped package. It was the collected Anne of Green Gables series. It was not what he had wanted to bring her. Can I open it? Later, little one. With the other things. Oh, please, Dad. Just one thing now, before Nicky and the other kids get here. Saul caught Sarai's eyes. She shook her head. Rachel remembered inviting Nicky and Lena and her other friends to the party only days before. Sarai had not yet come up with an excuse. All right, Rachel, he said. Just this one before the party. While Rachel ripped into the small package, Saul saw the giant package in the living room secured with red ribbon. The new bike, of course. Rachel had asked for the new bike for a year before her tenth birthday. Saul tiredly wondered if she would be surprised tomorrow to find the new bike here the day before her tenth birthday. Or perhaps they would get rid of the bike that night, while Rachel slept. Saul collapsed onto the couch. The red ribbon reminded him of the bishop's robes. Sarai had never had an easy time of surrendering the past. Every time she cleaned and folded and put away a set of Rachel's outgrown baby clothes, she had shed secret tears that Saul somehow knew about. Sarai had treasured every stage of Rachel's childhood, enjoying the day-to-day -day normalcy of things, a normalcy which she quietly accepted as the best of life. She had always felt that the essence of human experience lay not primarily in the peak experiences, the wedding days and triumphs which stood out in the memory like dates circled in red on old calendars, but rather in the unselfconscious flow of little things, the weekend afternoon with each member of the family engaged in his or her own pursuit, their crossings and connections casual, dialogues imminently forgettable, but the sum of such hours creating a synergy which was important and eternal. Saul found Sarai in the attic, weeping softly as she went through boxes. These were not the gentle tears once shed for the ending of small things. Sarai Weintraub was angry. What are you doing, mother? Rachel needs clothes. Everything is too big. What fit on an eight-year-old won't fit a seven-year-old. I have some more of her things here somewhere. Leave it, said Saul. 
we'll buy something new. Sarai shook her head. And have her wonder every day where all of her favorite clothes have gone? No, I've saved some things. They're here somewhere. Do it later. Damn it, there is no later, shouted Sarai, and then turned away from Saul and raised her hands to her face. I'm sorry. Saul put his arms around her. Despite the limited pulse and treatments, her bare arms were much thinner than he remembered. Knots and cords under rough skin. He hugged her tightly. I'm sorry, she repeated, sobbing openly now. It's just not fair. No, agreed Saul. It's not fair. The sunlight coming through the dusty attic panes had a sad cathedral quality to it. Saul had always loved the smell of an attic the hot and stale promise of a place so underused and filled with future treasures. Today it was ruined. He crouched next to a box. Come, dear, he said. We'll look together. Rachel continued to be happy, involved with life, only slightly confused by the incongruities which faced her each morning when she awoke. As she grew younger, it became easier to explain away the changes that appeared to have occurred overnight. The old elm out front gone, the new apartment building on the corner where M. Nesbitt used to live in a colonial-era home, the absence of her friends. And Saul began to see, as never before, the flexibility of children. He now imagined Rachel living on the breaking crest of the wave of time, not seeing the murky depths of the sea beyond, keeping her balance with her small store of memories and a total commitment to the twelve to fifteen hours of now allowed her each day. Neither Saul nor Sarai wanted their daughter isolated from other children, and it was difficult to find ways to make contact. Rachel was delighted to play with the new girl or new boy in the neighborhood, children of other instructors, the grandchildren of friends, for a while with Nikki's daughter. But the other children had to grow accustomed to Rachel greeting them anew each day, remembering nothing of their common past, and only a few had the sensitivity to continue such a charade for the sake of a playmate. The story of Rachel's unique illness was no secret in Crawford, of course. The fact of it had spread through the college the first year of Rachel's return, and the entire town knew soon after. Crawford reacted in the fashion of small towns immemorial. Some tongues wagged constantly. Some people could not keep the pity and pleasure at someone else's misfortune out of their voices and gazes. But mostly the community folded its protective wings around the Weintraub family, like an awkward mother bird shielding its young. Still, they were allowed to live their lives, and even when Saul had to cut back classes and then take an early retirement because of trips seeking medical treatment for Rachel, the real reason was mentioned by no one. But it could not last, of course, and on the spring day when Saul stepped onto the porch and saw his weeping seven-year-old daughter coming back from the park, surrounded and followed by a pack of news tapes, their camera implants gleaming and comm logs extended, he knew that a phase of their life was over forever. Saul jumped from the porch and ran to Rachel's side. M. Weintraub, is it true that your daughter contracted a terminal time illness? What's going to happen in seven years? Will it just disappear? M. Weintraub, M. Weintraub, Rachel says she thinks Raven Dowell is Senate CEO and this is the year A.D. 2711. Has she lost those 34 years completely, or is this a delusion caused by the Merlin sickness? Rachel, do you remember being a grown woman? What's it feel like to be a kid again? M. Weintraub, M. Weintraub, just one still image, please. How about you get a picture of Rachel when she was older and you and the kids stand looking at it? M. Weintraub, is it true that this is the curse of the time tombs? Did Rachel see the Shrike monster? Hey, Weintraub, Saul, hey, Solly, what are you and the little woman going to do when the kid's gone? There was a news tape blocking Saul's way to the front door. The man leaned forward, the stereo lenses of his eyes elongating as they zoomed in for a close-up of Rachel. Saul grabbed the man's long hair, which was conveniently tied in a queue, and flung him aside. The pack brayed and bellowed outside the house for seven weeks. Saul realized what he had known and forgotten about very small communities. They were frequently annoying, always parochial, sometimes prying on a one-to-one -one level. But never had they subscribed to the vicious legacy of the so-called public's right to know. The web did. Rather than have his family become permanent prisoners to the besieging reporters, Saul went on the offensive. He arranged interviews on the most pervasive Farcaster cable news programs, participated in all-thing discussions, and personally attended the Concourse Medical Research Conclave. In ten standard months, he asked for help for his daughter on 80 worlds. 
Offers poured in from 10,000 sources, but the bulk of the communications were from faith healers, project promoters, institutes, and freelance researchers offering their services in exchange for the publicity. Shrike cultists and other religious zealots pointing out that Rachel deserved the punishment. Requests from various advertising agencies for product endorsements. Offers from media agents to handle Rachel for such endorsements. Offers of sympathy from common people. Frequently enclosing credit chips. Expressions of disbelief from scientists. Offers from Holly producers and book publishers for exclusive rights to Rachel's life. And a barrage of real estate offers. Reich's University paid for a team of evaluators to sort the offers and see if anything might benefit Rachel. Most of the communications were discarded. A few medical or research offers were seriously considered. In the end, none seemed to offer any avenue of research or experimental therapy which Reich's had not already tried. One fat line flimsy came to Saul's attention. It was from the chairman of Kibbutz Kafar Shalom on Hebron and read simply, If it becomes too much, come. It soon became too much. After the first few months of publicity, the siege seemed to lift, but this was only the prelude to the second act. Faximmed tabloids referred to Saul as the Wandering Jew, the desperate father wandering afar in search of a cure for his child's bizarre illness, an ironic title given Saul's lifelong dislike of travel. Sarai, inevitably, was the grieving mother. Rachel was the doomed child, or in one inspired headline, virgin victim of the time tomb's curse. None of the family could go outside without finding a news tape or imager hiding behind a tree. Crawford discovered that there was money to be found in the Weintraub's misfortune. At first, the town held the line, but when entrepreneurs from Bassard City moved in with gift shops, t-shirt concessions, tours, and data chip booths for the tourists who were coming in larger and larger numbers, the local business people first dithered, then wavered, then decided unanimously that, if there was commerce to be carried on, the profits should not go to outsiders. After 438 standard years of comparative solitude, the town of Crawford received a Farcaster Terminex. No longer did visitors have to suffer the 20-minute flight from Bussard City. The crowds grew. On the day they moved, it rained heavily, and the streets were empty. Rachel did not cry but her eyes were very wide all day, and she spoke in subdued tones. It was ten days before her sixth birthday. But, Daddy, why do we have to move? We just do, honey. But why? It's something we have to do, little one. You'll like Hebron. There are lots of parks there. But how come you never said we were going to move? We did, sweetie. You must have forgotten. But what about Graham and Grams and... Uncle Richard and Aunt Tetha and Uncle Saul and everybody. They can come visit us any time. But what about Nicky and Lena and my friends? Saul said nothing but carried the last of the luggage to the EMV. The house was sold and empty. Furniture had been sold or sent ahead to Hebron. For a week there had been a steady stream of family and old friends, college associates, and even some of the Reich's med team who had worked with Rachel for eighteen years but now the street was empty. Rain streaked the perspex canopy of the old EMV and ran in complex rivulets. The three of them sat in the vehicle for a moment, staring at the house. The interior smelled of wet wool and wet hair. Rachel clutched the teddy bear Sarai had resurrected from the attic six months earlier. She said, It's not fair. No, agreed Saul. It's not fair. Hebron was a desert world. Four centuries of terraforming had made the atmosphere breathable and a few million acres of land arable. The creatures which had lived there before were small and tough and infinitely wary, and so were the creatures imported from old earth, including the humankind. Ah, gasped Saul the day they arrived in the sun-baked village of Dan, above the sun-baked kibbutz of Kafar Shalom. What masochists we Jews are! Twenty thousand surveyed worlds fit for our kind when the hegira began and those schmucks came here. But it was not masochism which brought either the first colonists or Saul and his family. Hebron was mostly desert, but the fertile areas were almost frighteningly fertile. Sinai University was respected throughout the web, and its med center brought in wealthy patients and a healthy income for the cooperative. Hebron had a single forecaster terminax in New Jerusalem, and allowed portals nowhere else. Belonging to neither the hegemony nor protectorate, Hebron taxed travelers heavily for Farcaster privilege, 
and allowed no tourists outside New Jerusalem. For a Jew seeking privacy, it was perhaps the safest place in three hundred worlds trod by man. The kibbutz was more a cooperative by tradition than in operation. The Weintraubs were welcome to their own home, a modest place offering sun-dried adobe, curves instead of right angles, and bare wood floors, but also offering a view from the hill which showed an infinite expanse of desert beyond the orange and olive groves. The sun seemed to dry up everything, thought Saul, even worries and bad dreams. The light was a physical thing. In the evening their house glowed pink for an hour after the sun had set. Each morning, Saul sat by his daughter's bed until she awoke. The first minutes of her confusion were always painful to him, but he made sure that he was the first thing Rachel saw each day. He held her while she asked her questions. Where are we, Daddy? In a wonderful place, little one. I'll tell you all about it over breakfast. How did we get here? By casting and flying and walking a bit, he would say. It's not so far away, but far enough to make it an adventure. But my bed's here, my stuffed animals. Why don't I remember coming? And Saul would hold her gently by the shoulders and look into her brown eyes and say, You had an accident, Rachel. Remember in the homesick toad where Terence hits his head and forgets where he lives for a few days? It was sort of like that. Am I better? Yes, Saul would say. You're all better now. And the house would fill with the smell of breakfast, and they would go out to the terrace where Sarai waited. Rachel had more playmates than ever. The kibbutz cooperative had a school where she was always the welcomed visitor, greeted anew each day. In the long afternoons, the children played in the orchards and explored along the cliffs. Abner, Robert, and Ephraim, the council elders, urged Saul to work on his book. Hebron prided itself on the number of scholars, artists, musicians, philosophers, writers and composers it sheltered as citizens and long-term residents. The house, they pointed out, was a gift of the state. Saul's pension, though small by Webb standards, was more than adequate for their modest needs in Kafar Shalom. To Saul's surprise, however, he found that he enjoyed physical labor. Whether working in the orchards or clearing stones in the unclaimed fields or repairing a wall above the city, Saul found that his mind and spirit were freer than they had been in many years. He discovered that he could wrestle with Kierkegaard while he waited for mortar to dry, and find new insights in Kant and Van Der while carefully checking the apples for worms. At the age of seventy-three standard, Saul earned his first calluses. In the evenings he would play with Rachel, and then take a walk in the foothills with Sarai as Judy or one of the other neighbor girls watched their sleeping child. One weekend they went away to New Jerusalem, just Saul and Sarai the first time they had been alone together for that long since Rachel returned to live with them seventeen standard years before. But everything was not idyllic. Too frequent were the nights when Saul awoke alone and walked barefoot down the hall to see Sarai watching over Rachel in her sleep. And often at the end of a long day, bathing Rachel in the old ceramic tub or tucking her in as the walls glowed pinkly, the child would say, I like it here, Daddy, but can we go home tomorrow? And Saul would nod. And after the good night story, and the lullaby, and the good night kiss, sure that she was asleep, he would begin to tiptoe out of the room only to hear the muffled, later alligator, from the blanketed form on the bed, to which he had to reply, while wow, crocodile. And lying in bed himself, next to the softly breathing and possibly sleeping length of the woman he loved, Saul would watch the strips of pale light from one or both of Hebron's small moons move across the rough walls and he would talk to God. Saul had been talking to God for some months before he realized what he was doing. The idea amused him. The dialogues were in no way prayers, but took the form of angry monologues which, just short of the point where they became diatribes, became vigorous arguments with himself. Only not just with himself. Saul realized one day that the topics of the heated debates were so profound, the stakes to be settled so serious, the ground covered so broad, that the only person he could possibly be berating for such shortcomings was God himself. Since the concept of a personal God, lying awake at night worrying about human beings, intervening in the lives of individuals always had been totally absurd to Saul, the thought of such dialogues made him doubt his sanity. But the dialogues continued. Saul wanted to know how any ethical system, 
much less a religion so indomitable that it had survived every evil mankind could throw at it, could flow from a command from God for a man to slaughter his son. It did not matter to Saul that the command had been rescinded at the last moment. It did not matter that the command was a test of obedience. In fact, the idea that it was the obedience of Abraham which allowed him to become the father of all the tribes of Israel was precisely what drove Saul into fits of fury. After fifty-five years of dedicating his life and work to the story of ethical systems, Saul Weintraub had come to a single, unshakable conclusion. Any allegiance to a deity or concept or universal principle which put obedience above decent behavior toward an innocent human being was evil. So define innocent, came the vaguely amused, faintly querulous voice which Saul associated with these arguments. A child is innocent, thought Saul. Isaac was. Rachel is. Innocent by the mere fact of being a child? Yes. And there is no situation where the blood of the innocent must be shed for a greater cause? No, thought Saul. None. But the innocent are not restricted to children, I presume. Saul hesitated, sensing a trap, trying to see where his subconscious interlocutor was heading. He could not. No, he thought, the innocent include others as well as children. Such as Rachel, at age twenty-four. The innocent should not be sacrificed at any age? That's right. Perhaps this is part of the lesson which Abraham needed to learn before he could be father to the blessed of the nations of the earth. What lesson, thought Saul, what lesson? But the voice in his mind had faded, and now there were only the sounds of night birds outside and the soft breathing of his wife beside him. Rachel could still read at age five. Saul had trouble remembering when she had learned to read. It seemed she always had been able to. Four standard, said Sarai. It was early summer, three months after her birthday. We were picnicking in the field above the college. Rachel was looking at her Winnie the Pooh book, and suddenly she said, I hear a voice in my head. Saul remembered then. He also remembered the joy he and Sarai had felt at the rapid acquisition of new skills Rachel had shown at that age. He remembered because now they were confronted with the reverse of that process. Dad? said Rachel, from where she lay on the floor of his study, carefully coloring. How long has it been since Mom's birthday? It was on Monday, said Saul, preoccupied with something he was reading. Sarai's birthday had not yet come, but Rachel remembered it. I know, but how long has it been since then? Today is Thursday, said Saul. He was reading a long Talmudic treatise on obedience. I know, but how many days? Saul put down the hard copy. Can you name the days of the week? Barnard's world had used the old calendar. Sure, said Rachel. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You said Saturday already. Yeah, but how many days ago? Can you count from Monday to Thursday? Rachel frowned, moved her lips. She tried again, counting on her fingers this time. Four days? Good, said Saul. Can you tell me what ten minus four is, kiddo? What does minus mean? Saul forced himself to look at his papers again. Nothing, he said. Something you'll learn at school. When we go home tomorrow? Yes. One morning, when Rachel went off with Judy to play with the other children, she was too young to attend school any longer, Sarai said, Saul, we have to take her to Hyperion. Saul stared at her. What? You heard me. We can't wait until she is too young to walk, to talk. Also, we're not getting any younger. Sarai barked a mirthless laugh. That sounds strange, doesn't it? But we're not. The Polson treatments will be wearing off in a year or two. Sarai, did you forget? The doctors all say that Rachel could not survive cryogenic fugue. No one experiences FTL travel without fugue state. The Hawking effect can drive one mad, or worse. It doesn't matter, said Sarai. Rachel has to return to Hyperion. What on earth are you talking about, said Saul, angered. Sarai gripped his hand. Do you think you're the only one who has had the dream? Dream? managed Saul.
She sighed and sat at the white kitchen table. Morning light struck the plants on the sill like a yellow spotlight. The dark place, she said. The red lights above. The voice. Telling us to... Telling us to take... To go to Hyperion. To make an offering. Saul licked his lips, but there was no moisture there. His heart pounded. Whose name... Whose name is called? Sarai looked at him strangely. Both of our names. If you weren't there in the dream with me, I could never have borne it all these years. Saul collapsed into his chair. He looked down at the strange hand and forearm lying on the table. The knuckles of the hand were beginning to enlarge with arthritis. The forearm was heavily veined, marked with liver spots. It was his hand, of course. He heard himself say, You never mentioned it, never said a word. This time Sarai's laugh was without bitterness. As if I had to. All those times both of us coming awake in the dark, and you covered with sweat. I knew from the first time that it was not merely a dream. We have to go, Father. Go to Hyperion. Saul moved the hand. It still did not feel a part of him. Why? For God's sake, why, Sarai? We can't offer Rachel. Of course not, Father. Haven't you thought about this? We have to go to Hyperion, to wherever the dream tells us to go, and offer ourselves instead. Offer ourselves, repeated Saul. He wondered if he was having a heart attack. His chest ached so terribly that he could not take in a breath. He sat for a full minute in silence, convinced that if he attempted to utter a word, only a sob would escape. After another minute, he said, how long have you thought about this, mother? Do you mean known what we must do? A year, a little more. Just after her fifth birthday. A year? Why haven't you said something? I was waiting for you. To realize. To know. Saul shook his head. The room seemed far away and slightly tilted. No, I mean, it doesn't seem... I have to think, mother. Saul watched as the strange hand patted Sarai's familiar hand. She nodded. Saul spent three days and nights in the arid mountains, eating only the thick-crusted bread he had brought and drinking from his condenser therm. Ten thousand times in the past twenty years he had wished that he could take Rachel's illness, that if anyone had to suffer it should be the father, not the child. Any parent would feel that way did feel that way every time his child lay injured or racked with fever. Surely it could not be that simple. In the heat of the third afternoon, as he lay half-dozing in the shade of a thin tablet of rock, Saul learned that it was not that simple. Can that be Abraham's answer to God, that he would be the offering, not Isaac? It could have been Abraham's. It cannot be yours. Why? As if in answer, Saul had the fever vision of naked adults filing toward the ovens past armed men, mothers hiding their children under piles of coats. He saw men and women with flesh hanging in burned strips, carrying the day's children from the ashes of what once had been a city. Saul knew that these images were no dreams, were the very stuff of the first and second holocausts, and in his understanding knew before the voice spoke in his mind what the answer was, what it must be. The parents have offered themselves. That sacrifice already has been accepted. We are beyond that. Then what? What? Silence answered him. Saul stood in the full glare of the sun, almost fell. A black bird wheeled overhead or in his vision. Saul shook his fist at the gunmetal sky. You use Nazis as your instruments. Madmen. Monsters. You're a goddamn monster yourself. No. The earth tilted and Saul fell on his side against sharp rocks. He thought that it was not unlike leaning against a rough wall. A rock the size of his fist burned his cheek. The correct answer for Abraham was obedience, thought Saul. Ethically, Abraham was a child himself. All men were at that time. The correct answer for Abraham's children was to become adults and to offer themselves instead. 
What is the correct answer for us? There was no answer. The ground and sky quit spinning. After a while, Saul rose shakily, rubbed the blood and grit from his cheek, and walked down to the town in the valley below. No, Saul told Sarai, we will not go to Hyperion. It is not the correct solution. You would have us do nothing, then. Sarai's lips were white with answer, but her voice was firmly in control. No, I would have us not do the wrong thing. Sarai expelled her breath in a hiss. She waved toward the window where their four-year-old was visible playing with her toy horses in the backyard. Do you think she has time for us to do the wrong thing, or anything, indefinitely? Sit down, mother. Sarai remained standing. There was the faintest sprinkling of spilled sugar on the front of her tan cotton dress. Saul remembered the young woman rising nude from the phosphorescent wake of the Modal Island on Maui Covenant. We have to do something, she said. We've seen over a hundred medical and scientific experts. She's been tested, prodded, probed, and tortured by two dozen research centers. I've been to the Shrike Church on every world in this web. They won't see me. Malio and the other Hyperion experts at Reich's say that the Shrike cult has nothing like the Merlin sickness in their doctrine, and the indigenes on Hyperion have no legends of the malady or clues to its cure. Research during the three years the team was on Hyperion showed nothing. Now research there is illegal. Access to the time tombs is granted only to the so-called pilgrims. Even getting a travel visa to Hyperion is becoming almost impossible. And if we take Rachel, the trip may kill her. Saul paused for breath, touched Sarai's arm again. I'm sorry to repeat all this, Mother, but we have done something. Not enough, said Sarai. What if we go as pilgrims? Saul folded his arms in frustration. The Church of the Shrike chooses its sacrificial victims from thousands of volunteers. The web is full of stupid, depressed people. Few of these return. Doesn't that prove something? Sarai whispered quickly, urgently. Somebody or something is preying on these people. Bandits, said Saul. Sarai shook her head. The golem. You mean the Shrike? It's the golem, insisted Sarai. The same one we see in the dream. Saul was uneasy. I don't see a golem in the dream. What golem? The red eyes that watch, said Sarai. It's the same golem that Rachel heard that night in the Sphinx. How do you know that she heard anything? It's in the dream, said Sarai, before we enter the place where the golem waits. We haven't dreamed the same dream, said Saul. Mother, mother, why haven't you told me this before? I thought I was going mad, whispered Sarai. Saul thought of his secret conversations with God and put his arm around his wife. Oh, Saul, she whispered against him. It hurts so much to watch, and it's so lonely here. Saul held her. They had tried to go home. Home would always be Barnard's world. Half a dozen times to visit family and friends. But each time the visits were ruined by an invasion of news tapes and tourists. It was no one's fault. News traveled almost instantaneously through the megadatosphere of a hundred and sixty web worlds. To scratch the curiosity itch, one had only to pass a universal card across a Terminex disk key and step through a Farcaster. They had tried arriving unannounced and traveling incognito, but they were not spies and the efforts were pitiful. Within twenty-four standard hours of their re-entry to the web, they were besieged. Research institutes and large med centers easily provided the security screen for such a visit, but friends and family suffered. Rachel was news. Perhaps we could invite Tetha and Richard again, began Sarai. I have a better idea, said Saul. Go yourself, mother. You want to see your sister, but you also want to see, hear, and smell home. Watch a sunset where there are no iguanas. Walk in the fields. Go. Go? Just me? I couldn't be away from Rachel. Nonsense, said Saul. Twice in twenty years? Almost forty if we count the good days before. Anyway, twice in twenty years doesn't constitute child neglect. It's a wonder that this family can stand one another. We've been cooped up together so long. Sarai looked at the tabletop, lost in thought. But wouldn't the news people find me? I bet not, said Saul. 
It's Rachel they seem to key on. If they do hound you, come home. But I bet you can have a week visiting everyone at home before the teeps catch on. A week, gasped Sarai. I couldn't. Of course you can. In fact, you must. It will give me a few days to spend more time with Rachel, and then when you come back refreshed, I'll spend some days selfishly working on the book. The Kierkegaard one? No. Something I've been playing with called the Abraham Problem. Clumsy title, said Sarai. It's a clumsy problem, said Saul. Now go get packed. We'll fly you to New Jerusalem tomorrow so you can cast out before the Sabbath begins. I'll think about it, she said, sounding unconvinced. You'll pack, said Saul, hugging her again. When the hug was completed, he had turned her away from the window so that she faced the hallway and the bedroom door. Go. When you return from home, I'll have thought of something we can do. Sarai paused. Do you promise? Saul looked at her. I promise I will before time destroys everything. I swear as Rachel's father that I'll find a way. Sarai nodded, more relaxed than he had seen her in months. I'll go pack, she said. When he and the child returned from New Jerusalem the next day, Saul went out to water the meager lawn while Rachel played quietly inside. When he came in, the pink glow of sunset infusing the walls with a sense of sea warmth and quiet, Rachel was not in her bedroom or the other usual places. Rachel? When there was no answer, he checked the backyard again, the empty street. Rachel? Saul ran in to call the neighbors, but suddenly there was the slightest of sounds from the deep closet Sarai used for storage. Saul quietly opened the screen panel. Rachel sat beneath the hanging clothes, Sarai's antique pine box open between her legs. The floor was littered with photos and holochips of Rachel as a high school student, Rachel on the day she set off for college, Rachel standing in front of a carved mountainside on Hyperion. Rachel's research comm log lay whispering on the four-year-old Rachel's lap. Saul's heart seized at the familiar sound of the confident young woman's voice. Daddy, said the child on the floor, her own voice a tiny frightened echo of the voice on the comm log. You never told me that I had a sister. You don't, little one. Rachel frowned. Is this mommy when she was not so big? Uh-uh, it can't be. Her name's Rachel, too, she says. How can... It's all right, he said. I'll explain. Saul realized that the phone was ringing in the living room. Had been ringing. Just a moment, sweetie. I'll be right back. The hollow that formed above the pit was of a man Saul had never seen before. Saul did not activate his own imager, eager to get rid of the collar. Yes, he said abruptly. M. Weintraub, M. Weintraub who used to live on Barnard's World, currently in the village of Dan on Hebron? Saul started to disconnect and then paused. Their access code was unfiled. Occasionally, a salesperson called from New Jerusalem, but off-world calls were rare. And, Saul suddenly realized, his stomach feeling a stab of cold. It was past sundown on the Sabbath. Only emergency holocalls were allowed. Yes, said Saul. M. Weintraub, said the man, staring blindly past Saul. There's been a terrible accident. When Rachel awoke, her father was sitting by the side of her bed. He looked tired. His eyes were red, and his cheeks were gray with stubble above the line of his beard. Good morning, Daddy. Good morning, sweetheart. Rachel looked around and blinked. Some of her dolls and toys and things were there, but the room was not hers. The light was different. The air felt different. Her daddy looked different. Where are we, Daddy? We've gone on a trip, little one. Where to? It doesn't matter right now. Hop out, sweetie. Your bath is ready, and then we have to get dressed. A dark dress she had never seen before lay at the base of her bed. Rachel looked at the dress and then back at her father. Daddy, what's the matter? Where's Mommy? Saul rubbed his cheek. It was the third morning since the accident. It was the day of the funeral. He had told her each of the preceding days because he could not imagine lying to her then. It seemed the ultimate betrayal, 
of both Sarai and Rachel. But he did not think he could do it again. There's been an accident, Rachel, he said, his voice a pained rasp. Mommy died. We're going to go say goodbye to her today. Saul paused. He knew by now that it would take a minute for the fact of her mother's death to become real for Rachel. On the first day, he had not known if a four-year-old could truly comprehend the concept of death. He knew now that Rachel could. Later, as he held the sobbing child, Saul tried to understand the accident he had described so briefly to her. EMVs were by far the safest form of personal transportation mankind had ever designed. Their lifters could fail, but even so, the residual charge in the EM generators would allow the aircar to descend safely from any altitude. The basic, fail-safe design of an EMV's collision avoidance equipment had not changed in centuries. But everything failed. In this case, it was a joy-riding teenage couple in a stolen EMV outside the traffic lanes, accelerating to Mach 1.5 with all lights and transponders off to avoid detection, who defied all odds by colliding with Aunt Tetha's ancient Vicken as it descended toward the Bassard City Opera House landing apron. Besides Tetha and Sarai and the teenagers, three others died in the crash as pieces of falling vehicles cartwheeled into the crowded atrium of the Opera House itself. Sarai. Will we ever see Mommy again? Rachel asked between sobs. She had asked this each time. I don't know, sweetheart, responded Saul truthfully. The funeral was at the family cemetery in Cates County on Barnard's World. The press did not invade the graveyard itself, but teeps hovered beyond the trees and pressed against the black iron gate like an angry storm tide. Richard wanted Saul and Rachel to stay a few days but Saul knew what pain would be inflicted on the quiet farmer if the press continued their assault. Instead, he hugged Richard, spoke briefly to the clamoring reporters beyond the fence, and fled to Hebron with a stunned and silent Rachel in tow. News teeps followed to New Jerusalem, and then attempted to follow to Dan, but military police overrode their chartered EMVs, threw a dozen in jail as an example, and revoked the Farcaster visas of the rest. In the evening, Saul walked the ridge lines above the village while Judy watched his sleeping child. He found that his dialogue with God was audible now, and he resisted the urge to shake his fist at the sky, to shout obscenities, to throw stones. Instead, he asked questions, always ending with, Why? There was no answer. Hebron's sun set behind distant ridges, and the rocks glowed as they gave up their heat. Saul sat on a boulder, and rubbed his temples with his palms. Sarai. They had lived a full life, even with the tragedy of Rachel's illness hanging over them. It was too ironic that in Sarai's first hour of relaxation with her sister, Saul moaned aloud. The trap, of course, had been in their total absorption with Rachel's illness. Neither had been able to face the future beyond Rachel's death, disappearance, the world had hinged upon each day their child lived, and no thought had been given to the chance of accident, the perverse anti-logic of a sharp-edged universe. Saul was sure that Sarai had considered suicide just as he had, but neither of them could ever have abandoned the other, or Rachel. He had never considered the possibility of being alone with Rachel when... Sarai. At that moment, Saul realized that the often angry dialogue which his people had been having with God for so many millennia had not ended with the death of old earth, nor with the new diaspora, but continued still. He and Rachel and Sarai had been part of it, were part of it now. He let the pain come. It filled him with the sharp-edged agony of resolve. Saul stood on the ridge line and wept as darkness fell. In the morning, he was next to Rachel's bed when sunlight filled the room. Good morning, Daddy. Good morning, sweetheart. Where are we, Daddy? We've gone on a trip. It's a pretty place. Where's Mommy? She's with Aunt Tetha today. Will we see her tomorrow? Yes, said Saul. Now let's get you dressed and I'll make breakfast. Saul began to petition the Church of the Shrike when Rachel turned three. Travel to Hyperion was severely limited, and access to the time tombs had become all but impossible. Only the occasional Shrike pilgrimage sent people to that region. 
Rachel was sad that she had to be away from her mother on her birthday, but the visit of several children from the kibbutz distracted her a bit. Her big present was an illustrated book of fairy tales, which Sarai had picked out in New Jerusalem months before. Saul read some of the stories to Rachel before bedtime. It had been seven months since she could read any of the words herself, but she loved the stories, especially Sleeping Beauty, and made her father read it to her twice. I'm going to show Mommy it when we get home, she said through a yawn as Saul turned out the overhead light. Good night, kiddo, he said softly, pausing at the door. Hey, Daddy? Yes? Later, alligator. While, crocodile. Rachel giggled into her pillow. It was, Saul thought during the final two years, not so much different from watching a loved one falling into old age. Only worse. A thousand times worse. Rachel's permanent teeth had fallen out over intervals between her eighth and second birthdays. Baby teeth replaced them, but by her eighteenth month, half of these had receded into her jaw. Rachel's hair, always her one vanity, grew shorter and thinner. Her face lost its familiar structure as baby fat obscured the cheekbones and firm chin. Her coordination failed by degrees, noticeable at first in a sudden clumsiness as she handled a fork or pencil. On the day she could no longer walk, Saul put her down in her crib early and then went into his study to get thoroughly and quietly drunk. Language was the hardest for him. Her vocabulary loss was like the burning of a bridge between them, the severing of a final line of hope. It was some time after her second birthday receded that Saul tucked her in and, pausing in the doorway, said, Later, alligator. Huh? See you later, alligator. Rachel giggled. You say, in a while, crocodile, said Saul. He told her what an alligator and crocodile were. In a while, alligator, giggled Rachel. In the morning she had forgotten. Saul took Rachel with him as he traveled the web, no longer caring about the news tapes, petitioning the Shrike Church for pilgrimage rites, lobbying the Senate for a visa and access to forbidden areas on Hyperion, and visiting any research institute or clinic which might offer a cure. Months were lost while more medics admitted failure. When he fled back to Hebron, Rachel was fifteen standard months old. In the ancient units used on Hebron, she weighed twenty-five pounds and measured thirty inches tall. She could no longer dress herself. Her vocabulary consisted of twenty-five words, of which her favorites were Mommy and Daddy. Saul loved carrying his daughter. There were times when the curve of her head against his cheek, her warmth against his chest, the smell of her skin, all worked to allow him to forget the fierce injustice of it all. At those times, Saul would have been temporarily at peace with the universe if only Sarai had been there. As it was, there were temporary ceasefires in his angry dialogue with a god in whom he did not believe. What possible reason can there be for this? What reason has been visible for all of the forms of pain suffered by humankind? Precisely, thought Saul, wondering if he had just won a point for the first time. He doubted it. The fact of a thing not being visible does not mean it does not exist. That's clumsy. It shouldn't take three negatives to make a statement especially to state something as non-profound as that. Precisely, Saul. You're beginning to get the drift of all this. What? There was no answer to his thoughts. Saul lay in his house and listened to the desert wind blow. Rachel's last word was Mama, uttered when she was just over five months old. She awoke in her crib and did not, could not, ask where she was. Her world was one of mealtimes, naps, and toys. Sometimes, when she cried, Saul wondered if she was crying for her mother. Saul shopped in the small stores in Dan, taking the infant with him as he selected diapers, nursing packs, and the occasional new toy. The week before Saul left for Tau Sitai Center, Ephraim and the two other elders came to talk. It was evening, and the fading light glowed on Ephraim's bald scalp. Saul, we're worried about you. The next few weeks will be hard. The women want to help. We want to help. Saul laid his hand on the older man's forearm. It's appreciated, Ephraim. Everything the last few years is appreciated. This is our home now, too. Sarai would have... 
would have wanted me to say thank you. But we're leaving on Sunday. Rachel is going to get better. The three men on the long bench looked at one another. Abner said, They found a cure? No, said Saul, but I've found a reason to hope. Hope is good, Robert said in cautious tones. Saul grinned, his teeth white against the gray of his beard. It had better be, he said. Sometimes it is all we're given. The studio holocamera zoomed in for a close-up of Rachel as the infant sat cradled in Saul's arm on the set of Common Talk. So you're saying, said Devin Weicher, the show's host and third best known face in the web datasphere, that the Shrike Church's refusal to allow you to return to the time tombs and the hegemony's tardiness in processing a visa, these things will doom your child to this extinction? Precisely, said Saul. The voyage to Hyperion cannot be made in under six weeks. Rachel is now twelve weeks old. Any further delay by either the Shrike Church or the web bureaucracy will kill this child. The studio audience stirred. Devin Whiteshire turned toward the nearest imaging remote. His craggy, friendly visage filled the monitor frame. This man doesn't know if he can save his child, said Whiteshire, his voice powerful with subtle feeling. But all he asks is a chance. Do you think he and the baby deserve one? If so, access your planetary representatives and your nearest Church of the Shrike Temple. The number of your nearest temple should be appearing now. He turned back to Saul. We wish you luck, M. Weintraub. And? Weicher's large hand touched Rachel's cheek. We wish you Godspeed, our young friend. The monitor image held on Rachel until it faded to black. The hawking effect caused nausea vertigo, headache, and hallucinations. The first leg of the voyage was the ten-day transit to Parvati on the hegemony torch ship H.S. Intrepid. Saul held Rachel and endured. They were the only people fully conscious aboard the warship. At first Rachel cried, but after some hours she lay quietly in Saul's arms and stared up at him with large, dark eyes. Saul remembered the day she was born. The medics had taken the infant from atop Sarai's warm stomach and handed her to Saul. Rachel's dark hair was not much shorter then, her gaze no less profound. Eventually they slept from sheer exhaustion. Saul dreamed that he was wandering through a structure with columns the size of redwood trees and a ceiling lost to sight far above him. Red light bathed cool emptiness. Saul was surprised to find that he still carried Rachel in his arms. Rachel, as a child, had never been in his dream before. The infant looked up at him and Saul felt the contact of her consciousness as surely as if she had spoken aloud. Suddenly a different voice, immense and cold, echoed through the void. Saul, take your daughter, your only daughter Rachel, whom you love, and go to the world called Hyperion and offer her there as a burnt offering at one of the places of which I shall tell you. Saul hesitated and looked back to Rachel. The baby's eyes were deep and luminous as she looked up at her father. Saul felt the unspoken, yes. Holding her tightly, he stepped forward into the darkness and raised his voice against the silence. Listen, there will be no more offerings, neither child nor parent. There will be no more sacrifices for anyone other than our fellow human. The time of obedience and atonement is past. Saul listened. He could feel the pounding of his heart and Rachel's warmth against his arm. From somewhere high above, there came the cold sound of wind through unseen fissures. Saul cupped his hand to his mouth and shouted, That's all. Now either leave us alone or join us as a father rather than a receiver of sacrifices. You have the choice of Abraham. Rachel stirred in his arms as a rumble grew out of the stone floor. Columns vibrated. The red gloom deepened and then winked out, leaving only darkness. From far away there came the boom of huge footsteps. Saul hugged Rachel to him as a violent wind roared past. There was a glimmer of light as both he and Rachel awoke on the H.S. Intrepid outward bound for Parvati to transfer to the tree ship Yggdrasil for the planet Hyperion. Saul smiled at his seven-week-old daughter. She smiled back. It was her last, or her first, smile. The main cabin of the wind wagon was silent when the old scholar finished his story. 
Saul cleared his throat and took a drink of water from a crystal goblet. Rachel slept on in the makeshift cradle of the open drawer. The wind wagon rocked gently on its way, the rumble of the great wheel and the hum of the main gyroscope a lulling background noise. My God, Braun Lamia said softly. She started to speak again and then merely shook her head. Martin Silenus closed his eyes and said, Considering that all hatred driven hence, the soul recovers radical innocence and learns at last that it is self-delighting, self-appeasing, self-affrighting, and that its own sweet will is heaven's will. She can, though every face will scowl and every windy quarter howl, or every bellows burst, be happy still. Saul Weintraub asked, William Butler Yates? Silenus nodded. A prayer for my daughter. I think I'm going up on deck for a breath of air before turning in, said the consul. Would anyone care to join me? Everyone did. The breeze of their passage was refreshing as the group stood on the quarterdeck and watched the darkened sea of grass rumble by. The sky was a great star-splashed bowl above them, scarred by meteor trails. The sails and rigging creaked with a sound as old as human travel. I think we should post guards tonight, said Colonel Kassad. One person on watch while the others sleep. Two hour intervals. I agree, said the consul. I'll take the first watch. In the morning, began Kassad. Look, cried Father Hoyt. They followed his pointing arm. Between the blaze of constellations, colored fireballs flared. Green, violet, orange, green again, illuminating the great plain of grass around them like flashes of heat lightning. The stars and meteor trails paled to insignificance beside the sudden display. Explosions? ventured the priest. Space battle, said Kassad. Cislunar. Fusion weapons. He went below quickly. The tree, said Hetmastine, pointing to a speck of light which moved among the explosions like an ember floating through a fireworks display. Kassad returned with his powered binoculars and handed them around. Alsters? asked Lamia. Is it the invasion? Alsters, almost certainly, said Kassad but almost as certainly just a scouting raid. See the clusters? Those are hegemony missiles being exploded by the Auster Ram Scouts countermeasures. The binoculars came to the console. The flashes were quite clear now, an expanding cumulus of flame. He could see the speck and long blue tail of at least two scout ships fleeing from the hegemony pursuers. I don't think, began Kassad and then stopped as the ship and sails and sea of grass glowed bright orange in reflected glare. Dear Christ, whispered Father Hoyt, they've hit the tree ship. The consul swept the glasses left. The growing nimbus of flames could be seen with the naked eye, but in the binoculars the kilometer-long trunk and branch array of the Yggdrasil was visible for an instant as it burned and flared, long tendrils of flame arcing away into space as the containment fields failed and the oxygen burned. The orange cloud pulsed, faded, and fell back on itself as the trunk became visible for a final second, even as it glowed and broke up like the last long ember in a dying fire. Nothing could have survived. The tree ship Yggdrasil with its crew and complement of clones and semi-sentient erg drivers was dead. The consul turned toward Hetmastine and belatedly held out the binoculars. I'm so sorry, he whispered. The tall Templar did not take the glasses. Slowly he lowered his gaze from the skies, pulled forward his cowl, and went below without a word. The death of the tree ship was the final explosion. When ten minutes had passed and no more flares had disturbed the night, Braun Lamia spoke. Do you think they got them? The ousters, said Kassad. Probably not. The scout ships are built for speed and defense. They're light minutes away by now. Did they go after the tree ship on purpose? asked Silenus. The poet sounded very sober. I think not, said Kassad. Merely a target of opportunity. Target of opportunity, echoed Saul Weintraub. The scholar shook his head. I'm going to get a few hours sleep before sunrise. One by one, the others went below. When only Kassad and the consul were left on deck, the consul said, where should I stand watch? Make a circuit, said the colonel. 
From the main corridor at the base of the ladder, you can see all of the stateroom doors and the entrance to the mess and galley. Come above and check the gangway and decks. Keep the lanterns lit. Do you have a weapon? The consul shook his head. Kassad handed over his death wand. It's on tight beam, about half a meter at ten meters range. Don't use it unless you're sure that there's an intruder. The rough plate that slides forward is the safety. It's on. The consul nodded, making sure that his finger stayed away from the firing stud. I'll relieve you in two hours, said Kassad. He checked his comm log. It'll be sunrise before my watch is over. Kassad looked at the sky as if expecting the Yggdrasil to reappear and continue its firefly path across the sky. Only the stars glowed back. On the northeastern horizon, a moving mass of black promised a storm. Kassad shook his head. A waste, he said, and went below. The consul stood there a while and listened to the wind in the canvas, the creak of rigging, and the rumble of the wheel. After a while, he went to the railing and stared at darkness while he thought. Five. Sunrise over the sea of grass was a thing of beauty. The consul watched from the highest point on the aft deck. After his watch, he had tried to sleep, given it up, and come up onto deck to watch the night fade into day. The storm front had covered the sky with low clouds, and the rising sun lit the world with brilliant gold reflected from above and below. The wind-wagon sails and lines and weathered planks glowed in the brief benediction of light in the few minutes before the sun was blocked by the ceiling of clouds, and color flowed out of the world once again. The wind which followed this curtain closing was chill, as if it had blown down from the snowy peaks of the bridal range just visible as a dark blur on the northeastern horizon. Braun Lamia and Martin Silenus joined the consul on the aft deck, each nursing a cup of coffee from the galley. The wind whipped and tugged at the rigging. Braun Lamia's thick mass of curls fluttered around her face like a dark nimbus. Morning, muttered Silenus, squinting out over his coffee cup at the wind-rippled sea of grass. Good morning, replied the consul, amazed at how alert and refreshed he felt for not having slept at all the night before. We have a headwind, but the wagon still seems to be making decent time. We'll definitely be to the mountains before nightfall. Huh, commented Silenus, and buried his nose in the coffee cup. I didn't sleep at all last night, said Braun Lamia, just for thinking about M. Weintraub's story. I don't think, began the poet, and then broke off as Weintraub came onto deck, his baby peering over the lip of an infant carrier sling on his chest. Good morning, everyone, said Weintraub, looking around and taking a deep breath. Hmm, brisk, isn't it? Fucking freezing, said Silenus. North of the mountains, it'll be even worse. I think I'll go down to get a jacket, said Lamia. But before she could move, there came a single shrill cry from the deck below. Blood! There was, indeed, blood everywhere. Hetmastine's cabin was strangely neat. Bed unslept in, travel trunk and other boxes stacked precisely in one corner, robe folded over a chair. Except for the blood which covered great sections of the deck, bulkhead, and overhead. The six pilgrims crowded just inside the entrance, reluctant to go farther in. I was passing on my way to the upper deck, said Father Hoyt, his voice a strange monotone. The door was slightly ajar. I caught a glimpse of the blood on the wall. Is it blood? demanded Martin Silenus. Braun Lamia stepped into the room, ran a hand through a thick smear on the bulkhead, and raised her fingers to her lips. It's blood. She looked around, walked to the wardrobe, looked briefly among the empty shelves and hangers, and then went to the small porthole. It was latched and bolted from the inside. Lenore Hoyt looked more ill than usual and staggered to a chair. Is he dead then? We don't know a damn thing except that Captain Mistine isn't in his room and a lot of blood is, said Lamia. She wiped her hand on her pant leg. The thing to do now is search the ship thoroughly. Precisely, said Colonel Kassad. And if we do not find the captain? Braun Lamia opened the porthole. Fresh air dissipated the slaughterhouse smell of blood and brought in the rumble of the wheel and the rustle of grass under the hull. If we don't find Captain Mistine, she said, 
then we assume that he either left the ship under his own will or was taken off. But the blood, began Father Hoyt. Doesn't prove anything, finished Gassad. M. Lamy is correct. We don't know Mistine's blood type or genotype. Did anyone see or hear anything? There was silence except for negative grunts and the shaking of heads. Martin Silenus looked around. Don't you people recognize the work of our friend the Shrike when you see it? We don't know that, snapped Lamia. Maybe someone wanted us to think that it was the Shrike's doing. That doesn't make sense, said Hoyt, still gasping for air. Nonetheless, said Lamia, we'll search in twos. Who has weapons besides myself? I do, said Colonel Kassad. I have extras if needed. No, said Hoyt. The poet shook his head. Saul Weintraub had returned to the corridor with his child. Now he looked in again. I have nothing, he said. No, said the consul. He had returned the death wand to Kassad when his shift ended two hours before first light. All right, said Lamia. The priest will come with me on the lower deck. Silenus, go with the colonel. Search the mid-deck. M. Weintraub, you and the consul check everything above. Look for anything out of the ordinary. Any sign of struggle. One question, said Silenus. What? Who the hell elected you queen of the prom? I'm a private investigator, said Lamia, leveling her gaze on the poet. Martin Silenus shrugged. Hoyt here is a priest of some forgotten religion. That doesn't mean we have to genuflect when he says mass. All right, sighed Braun Lamia. I'll give you a better reason. The woman moved so fast that the consul almost missed the action in a blink. One second she was standing by the open port, and in the next she was halfway across the stateroom, lifting Martin Silenus off the deck with one arm, her massive hand around the poet's thin neck. How about, she said, that you do the logical thing because it's the logical thing to do? Grr, grr, managed Martin Silenus. Good, said Lamia without emotion, and dropped the poet to the deck. Silenus staggered a meter and almost sat on Father Hoyt. Here, said Kassad, returning with two small neural stunners. He handed one to Saul Weintraub. What do you have? Kassad asked Lamia. The woman reached into a pocket of her loose tunic and produced an ancient pistol. Kassad looked at the relic for a moment and then nodded. Stay with your partner, he said. Don't shoot at anything unless it's positively identified and unquestionably threatening. That describes the bitch I plan to shoot, said Silenus, still massaging his throat. Braun Lamia took a half step toward the poet. Fedmon Kassad said, Shut up. Let's get this over with. Silenus followed the colonel out of the stateroom. Saul Weintraub approached the consul, handed him the stunner. I don't want to hold this thing with Rachel. Shall we go up? The consul took the weapon and nodded. The wind wagon held no further sign of Templar voice of the tree Hetmastine. After an hour of searching, the group met in the stateroom of the missing man. The blood there seemed darker and drier. Is there a chance that we missed something? said Father Hoyt. Secret passages, hidden compartments. There's a chance, said Kassad. But I swept the ship with heat and motion sensors. If there's anything else on board larger than a mouse, I can't find it. If you had these sensors, said Silenus, why the fuck did you have us crawling through bilge and byways for an hour? Because the right equipment or apparel can hide a man from a heat and beat search. So, in answer to my question, said Hoyt, pausing a second as a visible wave of pain passed through him, with the right equipment or apparel, Captain Mustine might be hiding in a secret compartment somewhere. Possible, but improbable, said Braun Lamia. My guess is that he's no longer aboard. The Shrike, said Martin Silenus in a disgusted tone. It was not a question. Perhaps, said Lamia. Colonel, you and the consul were on watch through those four hours. Are you sure that you heard and saw nothing? Both men nodded. The ship was quiet, said Kassad. I would have heard a struggle even before I went on watch. And I didn't sleep after my watch, said the consul. My room shared a bulkhead with Mustine's. I heard nothing. Well, said Silenus, 
We've heard from the two men who were creeping around in the dark with weapons when the poor shit was killed. They say they're innocent. Next case. If Mustine was killed, said Kassad, it was with no death wand. No silent modern weapon I know throws that much blood around. There were no gunshots heard, no bullet holes found. So I presume M. Lamia's automatic pistol is not suspect. If this is Captain Mustine's blood, then I would guess an edged weapon was used. The Shrike is an edged weapon, said Martin Silenus. Lamia moved to the small stack of luggage. Debating isn't going to solve anything. Let's see if there's anything in Mustine's belongings. Father Hoyt raised a hesitant hand. That's, well, private, isn't it? I don't think we have the right. Braun Lamy across her arms. Look, Father, if Mustine's dead, it doesn't matter to him. If he's still alive, looking through this stuff might give us some idea where he was taken. Either way, we have to try to find a clue. Hoyt looked dubious, but nodded. In the end, there was little invasion of privacy. Mustine's first trunk held only a few changes of linen and a copy of Muir's Book of Life. The second bag held a hundred separately wrapped seedlings, flash-dried and nestled in moist soil. Templars must plant at least a hundred offspring of the eternal tree on whatever world they visit, explained the consul. The shoots rarely take, but it's a ritual. Braun Lamia moved toward the large metal box which had sat at the bottom of the pile. Don't touch that, snapped the consul. Why not? It's a Mobius cube, responded Colonel Kassad for the consul. A carbon-carbon shell set around a zero-impedance containment field folded back on itself. So, said Lamia, Mobius cubes seal artifacts and stuff in. They don't explode or anything. No, agreed the consul, but what they contain may explode. May already have exploded, for that matter. A cube that size could hold a kiloton nuclear explosion in check as long as it was boxed during the nanosecond of ignition, added Fedmon Kassad. Lamia scowled at the trunk. Then how do we know that something in there didn't kill Mustine? Kassad pointed to a faintly glowing green strip along the trunk's only seam. It's sealed. Once unsealed, a Mobius cube has to be reactivated at a place where containment fields can be generated. Whatever's in there didn't harm Captain Mustine. So there's no way to tell, mused Lamia. I have a good guess, said the consul. The others looked at him. Rachel began to cry, and Saul pulled a heating strip on a nursing pack. Remember, said the consul, at Edge yesterday when M. Mustine made a big deal out of the cube? He talked about it as if it were a secret weapon. A weapon, said Lamia. Of course, Kassad said suddenly. An erg. Erg. Martin Silenus stared at the small crate. I thought ergs were those force field critters that Templars use on their tree ships. They are, said the consul. The things were found about three centuries ago, living on asteroids around Aldebaran. Bodies about as big as a cat's spine. Mostly a piezoelectric nervous system sheathed in silicon gristle. But they feed on, and manipulate, force fields as large as those generated by small spin ships. So how do you get all that into such a little box? asked Silenus staring at the Mobius cube. Mirrors? In a sense, said Kassad. The thing's field would be damped, neither starving nor feeding. Rather like cryogenic fugue for us. Plus, this must be a small one. A cub, so to speak. Lamia ran her hand along the metal sheath. Templars control these things? Communicate with them? Yes, said Kassad. No one is quite sure how. It's one of the Brotherhood's secrets. But Het Mustine must have been confident that the Erg would help him with... The Shrike, finished Martin Silenus. The Templar thought that this energy imp would be his secret weapon when he faced the Lord of Pain. The poet laughed. Father Hoyt cleared his throat. The Church has accepted the hegemony's ruling that these creatures, Ergs, are not sentient beings, and thus not candidates for salvation. Oh, they're sentient all right, Father, said the consul. They perceive things far better than we could ever imagine. But if you mean intelligent, self-aware, then you're dealing with something along the lines of a smart grasshopper. Are grasshoppers candidates for salvation? Hoyt said nothing. Braun Lamia said, 
Well, evidently Captain Mistine thought this thing was going to be his salvation. Something went wrong. She looked around at the blood-stained bulkheads and at the drying stains on the deck. Let's get out of here. The wind wagon tacked into increasingly strong winds as the storm approached from the northeast. Ragged banners of clouds raced white beneath the low gray ceiling of Stormfront. Grasses whipped and bent under gusts of cold wind. Ripples of lightning illuminated the horizon and were followed by rolls of thunder sounding like warning shots across the wind wagon's bow. The pilgrims watched in silence until the first icy raindrops drove them below to the large stateroom in the stern. This was in his robe pocket, said Braun Lamia, holding up a slip of paper with the number five on it. So Mustine would have told his story next, muttered the consul. Martin Silenus tilted his chair until his back touched the tall windows. Stormlight made his satyr's features appear slightly demonic. There's another possibility, he said. Perhaps someone who hasn't spoken yet had the fifth spot and killed the Templar to trade places. Lamia stared at the poet. That would have to be the consul or me, she said, her voice flat. Silenus shrugged. Braun Lamia pulled another piece of paper from her tunic. I have number six. What would I have achieved? I go next anyway. Then perhaps it's what Mistine would have said that needed to be silenced, said the poet. He shrugged again. Personally, I think the Shrike has begun harvesting us. Why did we think we'd be allowed to get to the tombs when the thing's been slaughtering people halfway from here to Keats? This is different, said Saul Weintraub. This is the Shrike pilgrimage. So? In the silence that followed, the consul walked to the windows. Wind-driven torrents of rain obscured the sea and rattled the leaded panes. The wagon creaked and leaned heavily to starboard as it began another leg of its tack. M. Lamia? asked Colonel Kassad. Do you want to tell your story now? Lamia folded her arms and looked at the rain-streaked glass. No. Let's wait until we get off this damned ship. It stinks of death. The wind wagon reached the port of Pilgrim's Rest in mid-afternoon, but the storm and tired light made it feel like late evening to the weary passengers. The consul had expected representatives from the Shrike Temple to meet them here at the beginning of the penultimate stage of their journey, but Pilgrim's Rest appeared to the consul to be as empty as Edge had been. The approach to the foothills and the first side of the bridal range was as exciting as any landfall and brought all six of the would-be pilgrims on deck, despite the cold rain which continued to fall. The foothills were sear and sensuous, their brown curves and sudden upthrustings contrasting strongly with the verdant monochrome of the sea of grass. The 9,000-meter peaks beyond were only hinted at by gray and white plains soon intersected by low clouds, but even so truncated were powerful to behold. The snow line came down to a point just above the collection of burned-out hovels and cheap hotels which had been Pilgrim's Rest. If they destroyed the tramway, we're finished, muttered the consul. The thought of it, forbidden until now, made his stomach turn over. I see the first five towers, said Colonel Kassad, using his powered glasses. They seem intact. Any sign of a car? No. Wait, yes. There's one in the gate at the station platform. Any moving? asked Martin Silenus, who obviously understood how desperate their situation would be if the tramway was not intact. No. The consul shook his head. Even in the worst weather, with no passengers, the cars had been kept moving to keep the great cables flexed and free of ice. The six of them had their luggage on deck even before the wind wagon reefed its sails and extended a gangplank. Each now wore a heavy coat against the elements. Kassad in force-issue thermoflage cape, Braun Lamia in a long garment called a trench coat for reasons long forgotten, Martin Silenus in thick furs which rippled now sable, now gray with the vagaries of wind, Father Hoyt in long black which made him more of a scarecrow figure than ever, Saul Weintraub in a thick goose-down jacket which covered him and the child, and the consul in the thinning but serviceable greatcoat his wife had given him some decades before. What about Captain Mustine's things? asked Saul, as they stood at the head of the gangplank. Kassad had gone ahead to reconnoiter the village. I brought them up, said Lamia. We'll take them with us. It doesn't seem right somehow, said Father Hoyt. Just going on, I mean. 
there should be some service, some recognition that a man has died. May have died, reminded Lamia, easily lifting a forty-kilo backpack with one hand. Hoyt looked incredulous. Do you really believe that M. Mustine might be alive? No, said Lamia. Snowflake settled on her black hair. Kassad waved to them from the end of the dock, and they carried their luggage off the silent wind wagon. No one looked back. Empty? called Lamia as they approached the colonel. The tall man's cloak was still fading from its gray and black chameleon mode. Empty. Bodies? No, said Kassad. He turned toward Saul and the consul. Did you get the things from the galley? Both men nodded. What things? asked Silenus. A week's worth of food, said Kassad, turning to look up the hill toward the tramway station. For the first time the consul noticed the long assault weapon in the crook of the colonel's arm, barely visible under the cloak. We're not sure if there are any provisions beyond this point. Will we be alive a week from now? thought the consul. He said nothing. They ferried the gear to the station in two trips. Wind whistled through the open windows and shattered domes of the dark buildings. On the second trip, the consul carried one end of Mustine's Mobius cube, while Lenar Hoyt puffed and panted under the other end. Why are we taking the erg thing with us? gasped Hoyt as they reached the base of the metal stairway leading to the station. Rust streaked and spotted the platform like orange lichen. I don't know, said the consul, gasping for breath himself. From the terminal platform they could see far out over the sea of grass. The wind wagon sat where they had left it, sails reefed, a dark and lifeless thing. Snow squalls moved across the prairie and gave the illusion of whitecaps on the numberless stalks of high grass. Get the material aboard, called Kassad. I'll see if the running gear can be reset from the operator's cabin up there. Isn't it automatic? asked Martin Silenus, his small head almost lost in thick furs. Like the wind wagon? I don't think so, said Kassad. Go on, I'll see if I can get it started up. What if it leaves without you? called Lamia at the colonel's retreating back. It won't. The interior of the tram car was cold and bare except for metal benches in the forward compartment and a dozen rough bunks in the smaller rear area. The car was big, at least eight meters long by five wide. The rear compartment was partitioned from the front cabin by a thin metal bulkhead with an opening but no door. A small commode took up a closet-sized corner of this aft compartment. Windows rising from waist height to the roof line lined the forward compartment. The pilgrims heaped their luggage in the center of the wide floor and stomped around, waved their arms, or otherwise worked to stay warm. Martin Silenus lay full length on one of the benches, with only his feet and the top of his head emerging from fur. I forgot, he said. How the fuck do you turn on the heat in this thing? The consul glanced at the dark lighting panels. It's electrical. It'll come on when the colonel gets us moving. If the colonel gets us moving, said Silenus. Saul Weintraub had changed Rachel's diaper. Now he bundled her up again in an infant's therm suit and rocked her in his arms. Obviously, I've never been here before, he said. Both of you gentlemen have. Yeah, said the poet. No, said the consul, but I've seen pictures of the tramway. Kassad said he returned to Keats once this way, called Braun Lamia from the other room. I think, began Saul Weintraub, and was interrupted by a great grinding of gears and a wild lurch as the long car rocked sickeningly and then swung forward under the suddenly moving cable. Everyone rushed to the window on the platform side. Kassad had thrown his gear aboard before climbing the long ladder to the operator's cabin. Now he appeared in the cabin's doorway, slid down the long ladder, and ran toward the car. The car was already passing beyond the loading area of the platform. He isn't going to make it, whispered Father Hoyt. Kassad sprinted the last ten meters with legs that looked impossibly long, a cartoon stick figure of a man. The tram car slid out of the loading notch, swung free of the station. Space opened between the car and the station. It was eight meters to the rocks below. The platform deck was streaked with ice. Kassad ran full speed ahead even as the car pulled away. Come on, screamed Braun Lamia. The others picked up the cry. The consul looked up at sheets of ice cracking and dropping away from the cable as the tram car moved up and forward. 
He looked back. There was too much space. Kassad could never make it. Fedman Kassad was moving at an incredible speed when he reached the edge of the platform. The consul was reminded for the second time of the old earth jaguar he had seen in a Lucis zoo. He half expected to see the colonel's feet slip on a patch of ice, the long legs flying out horizontal, the man falling silently to the snowy boulders below. Instead, Kassad seemed to fly for an endless moment, long arms extended, cape flying out behind. He disappeared behind the car. There came a thud, followed by a long minute when no one spoke or moved. They were forty meters high now, climbing toward the first tower. A second later, Kassad became visible at the corner of the car, pulling himself along a series of icy niches and handholds in the metal. Braun Lamia flung open the cabin door. Ten hands helped pull Kassad inside. Thank God, said Father Hoyt. The colonel took a deep breath and smiled grimly. There was a dead man's break. I had to rig the lever with a sandbag. I didn't want to bring the car back for a second try. Martin Silenus pointed to the rapidly approaching support tower and the ceiling of clouds just beyond. The cable stretched upward into oblivion. I guess we're crossing the mountains now, whether we want to or not. How long to make the crossing? asked Hoyt. Twelve hours. A little less, perhaps. Sometimes the operators would stop the cars if the wind rose too high or the ice got too bad. We won't be stopping on this trip, said Kassad. Unless the cables breached somewhere, said the poet. Or we hit a snag. Shut up, said Lamia. Who's interested in heating some dinner? Look, said the consul. They moved to the forward windows. The tram rose a hundred meters above the last brown curve of foothills. Kilometers below and behind, they caught a final glimpse of the station, the haunted hovels of Pilgrim's Rest, and the motionless wind wagon. Then, snow and thick cloud enveloped them. The tram car had no real cooking facilities, but the aft bulkhead offered a cold box and a microwave for reheating. Lamia and Weintraub combined various meats and vegetables from the wind wagon's galley to produce a passable stew. Martin Silenus had brought along wine bottles from both the Benares and the wind wagon, and he chose a Hyperion Burgundy to go with the stew. They were nearly finished with their dinner when the gloom pressing against the windows lightened and then lifted altogether. The consul turned on his bench to see the sun suddenly reappear, filling the tram car with a transcendent golden light. There was a collective sigh from the group. It had seemed that darkness had fallen hours before. But now, as they rose above a sea of clouds from which rose an island chain of mountains, they were treated to a brilliant sunset. Hyperion sky had deepened from its daytime glaucous glare to the bottom lapis lazuli of evening, while a red-gold sun ignited cloud towers and great summits of ice and rock. The consul looked around. His fellow pilgrims, who had seemed gray and small in the dim light of half a minute earlier, now glowed in the gold of sunset. Martin Silenus raised his glass. That's better, by God. The consul looked up at their line of travel, the massive cable dwindling to thread-like thinness far ahead, and then to nothing at all. On a summit several kilometers beyond, gold light glinted on the next support tower. One hundred and ninety-two pylons, said Silenus in a sing-song tour guide's bored tones. Each pylon is constructed of duraloy and whiskered carbon and stands eighty-three meters high. We must be high, said Braun Lamia in a low voice. The high point of the ninety-six kilometer tram car voyage lies above the summit of Mount Dryden, the fifth highest peak in the bridal range, at nine thousand two hundred forty-six meters, droned on Martin Silenus. Colonel Cassad looked around. The cabins pressurized. I felt the changeover some time ago. Look, said Braun Lamia. The sun had been resting on the horizon line of clouds for a long moment. Now it dipped below, seemingly igniting the depths of storm cloud from beneath and casting a panoply of colors along the entire western edge of the world. Snow cornices and glaze eyes still glowed along the western side of the peaks, which rose a kilometer or more above the rising tram car. A few brighter stars appeared in the deepening dome of sky. The consul turned to Braun Lamia. Why don't you tell your story now, M. Lamia? We'll want to sleep later, before arriving at the keep. 
Lamia sipped the last of her wine. Does everyone want to hear it now? Heads nodded in the roseate twilight. Martin Silenus shrugged. All right, said Braun Lamia. She set down her empty glass, pulled her feet up on the bench so that her elbows rested on her knees, and began her tale. The Detective's Tale The Long Goodbye I knew the case was going to be special the minute that he walked into my office. He was beautiful. By that I don't mean effeminate or pretty in the male model HTV star mode, merely beautiful. He was a short man, no taller than I, and I was born and raised in Lucis's 1.3G field. It was apparent in a second that my visitor was not from Lucis. His compact form was well proportioned by web standards, athletic but thin. His face was a study in purposeful energy. Low brow, sharp cheekbones, compact nose, solid jaw, and a wide mouth that suggested both a sensuous side and a stubborn streak. His eyes were large and hazel-colored. He looked to be in his late twenties standard. Understand I didn't itemize all this the moment he walked in. My first thought was, is this a client? My second thought was, shit, this guy's beautiful. M. Lamia? Yeah. M. Braun Lamia, of all web investigations? Yeah. He looked around as if he didn't quite believe it. I understood the look. My office is on the twenty-third level of an old industrial hive in the old dig section of Iron Pig on Lucis. I have three big windows that look out on Service Trench 9, where it's always dark and always drizzling, thanks to a massive filter drip from the hive above. The view is mostly of abandoned automated loading docks and rusted girders. What the hell, it's cheap. And most of my clients call rather than show up in person. May I sit down? he asked, evidently satisfied that a bona fide investigatory agency would operate out of such a slum. Sure, I said, and waved him to a chair. M, uh, Johnny, he said. He didn't look like a first-name type to me. Something about him breathed money. It wasn't his clothes, common enough casuals in black and gray, although the fabric was better than average. It was just a sense that the guy had class. There was something about his accent. I'm good at placing dialects. It helps in this profession. But I couldn't place this guy's homeworld, much less local region. How can I help you, Johnny? I held out the bottle of scotch I had been ready to put away just as he entered. Johnny Boy shook his head. Maybe he thought I wanted him to drink from the bottle. Hell, I have more class than that. There are paper cups over by the water cooler. M. Lamia, he said, the cultivated accent still bugging me by its elusiveness. I need an investigator. That's what I do. He paused. Shy. A lot of my clients are hesitant to tell me what the job is. No wonder, since 95% of my work is divorce and domestic stuff. I waited him out. It's a somewhat sensitive matter, he said at last. Yeah, I am, ah, uh, Johnny. Most of my work falls under that category. I'm bonded with Uniweb, and everything having to do with a client falls under the Privacy Protection Act. Everything is confidential, even the fact that we're talking now. Even if you decide not to hire me. That was basic bullshit, since the authorities could get at my files in a moment if they ever wanted to. But I sensed that I had to put this guy at ease somehow. God, he was beautiful. Uh-huh, he said, and glanced around again. He leaned forward. M. Lamia, I would want you to investigate a murder. This got my attention. I'd been reclining with my feet on the desk. Now I sat up and leaned forward. A murder? Are you sure? What about the cops? They aren't involved. That's not possible, I said, with the sinking feeling that I was dealing with a loony rather than a client. It's a crime to conceal a murder from the authorities. What I thought was, are you the murderer, Johnny? He smiled and shook his head. Not in this case. What do you mean? I mean, M. Lamia, that a murder was committed, but that the police, local and hegemony, have neither knowledge of it nor jurisdiction over it. Not possible, I said again. Outside, sparks from an industrial welder's torch cascaded into the trench along with the rusty drizzle. Explain. A murder was committed outside of the web, outside of the protectorate. There were no local authorities. That made sense, sort of. For the life of me, though, I couldn't figure where he was talking about. 
Even the outback settlements and colonial worlds have cops. On board some sort of spaceship? Uh-uh. The Interstellar Transit Authority has jurisdiction there. I see, I said. It had been some weeks since I'd had a case. All right, tell me the details. And the conversation will be confidential, even if you do not take the case? Absolutely. And if you do take the case, you will report only to me? Of course. My prospective client hesitated, rubbing his fingers against his chin. His hands were exquisite. All right, he said at last. Start at the beginning, I said. Who was murdered? Johnny sat up straight, an attentive schoolboy. There was no doubting his sincerity. He said, I was. It took ten minutes to get the story out of him. When he was finished, I no longer thought he was crazy. I was. Or I would be if I took the job. Johnny, his real name was a code of digits, letters, and cipher bands longer than my arm, was a cybrid. I'd heard about cybrids. Who hasn't? I once accused my first husband of being one. But I never expected to be sitting in the same room with one. Or to find it so damned attractive. Johnny was an A.I., his consciousness, or ego, or whatever you want to call it, floated somewhere in the megadatasphere datum plane of the Technicor. Like everyone else, except maybe the current Senate CEO or the AI's garbage removers, I had no idea where the Technicor was. The AIs had peacefully seceded from human control more than three centuries ago, before my time, and while they continued to serve the hegemony as allies by advising the all-thing, monitoring the dataspheres, occasionally using their predictive abilities to help us avoid major mistakes or natural disasters, the Technicor generally went about its own indecipherable and distinctly non-human business in privacy. Fair enough, it seemed to me. Usually, AIs do business with humans and human machines via the datasphere. They can manufacture an interactive hull if they need to. I remember during the Maui Covenant Incorporation, the Technicor ambassadors at the treaty signing looked suspiciously like the old Holostar Tyrone Bathwaite. Cybrids are a whole different matter. Tailored from human genetic stock, they are far more human in appearance and outward behavior than androids are allowed to be. Agreements between the Technicor and the hegemony allow only a handful of cybrids to be in existence. I looked at Johnny. From an A.I.'s perspective, the beautiful body and intriguing personality sitting across the desk from me must be merely another appendage, a remote, somewhat more complex but otherwise no more important than any one of ten thousand such sensors, manipulators, autonomous units, or other remotes than an A.I. might use in a day's work. Discarding Johnny probably would create no more concern in an A.I. than clipping a fingernail would bother me. What a waste, I thought. A cybrid, I said. Yes. Licensed. I have a World Web user's visa. Good, I heard myself say. And someone murdered your cybrid, and you want me to find out who? No, said the young man. He had brownish-red curls. Like his accent, the hairstyle eluded me. It seemed archaic somehow, but I had seen it somewhere. It was not merely this body that was murdered. My assailant murdered me. You? Yes. You, as in the, uh, A.I. itself? Precisely. I didn't get it. A.I.s can't die. Not as far as anyone in the web knew. I don't get it, I said. Johnny nodded. Unlike a human personality which can, I believe the consensus is, be destroyed at death, my own consciousness cannot be terminated. There was, however, as a result of the assault, an interruption. Although I possess... Ah, uh, shall we say duplicate recordings of memories, personality, etc., there was a loss. Some data were destroyed in the attack. In that sense, the assailant committed murder. I see, I lied. I took a breath. What about the AI authorities, if there are such things, or the hegemony cybercops? Wouldn't they be the ones to go to? For personal reasons, said the attractive young man whom I was trying to see as a cybrid, it is important, even necessary, that I do not consult these sources. I raised an eyebrow. This sounded more like one of my regular clients. I assure you, he said, it is nothing illegal, nor unethical, merely embarrassing to me on a level which I cannot explain. 
I folded my arms across my chest. Look, Johnny, this is a pretty half-assed story. I mean, I only have your word that you're a cybrid. You might be a scam artist for all I know. He looked surprised. I had not thought of that. How would you like me to show you that I am what I say I am? I did not hesitate a second. Transfer a million marks to my checking account in Transweb, I said. Johnny smiled. At the same instant, my phone rang, and the image of a harried man with the Transweb code block floating behind him said, Excuse me, M. Lamia, but we wondered with a, uh, deposit of this size if you would be interested in investigating our long-term savings options or our mutual assured market possibilities? Later, I said. The bank manager nodded and vanished. That could have been a simulation, I said. Johnny's smile was pleasant. Yes, but even that would be a satisfactory demonstration, would it not? Not necessarily. He shrugged. Assuming I am what I say I am, will you take the case? Yeah, I sighed. One thing, though. My fee isn't a million marks. I get five hundred a day plus expenses. The cybrid nodded. Does that mean you will take the case? I stood up, put on my hat, and pulled an old coat from a rack by the window. I bent over the lower desk drawer, smoothly sliding my father's pistol into a coat pocket. Let's go, I said. Yes, said Johnny. Go where? I want to see where you were murdered. Stereotype has it that someone born on Lucis hates to leave the hive and suffers from instant agoraphobia if we visit anything more open to the elements than a shopping mall. The truth of it is, most of my business comes from, and leads to, off-world. Skip tracing deadbeats who use the Farcaster system and a change of identity to try to start over. Finding philandering spouses who think rendezvousing on a different planet will keep them safe from discovery. Tracking down missing kids and absent parents. Still, I was surprised to the point of hesitating a second when we stepped through the Iron Pig Concourse Farcaster onto an empty stone plateau which seemed to stretch to infinity. Except for the bronze rectangle of the Farcaster portal behind us, there was no sign of civilization anywhere. The air smelled like rotten eggs. The sky was a yellow-brown cauldron of sick-looking clouds. The ground around us was gray and scaled and held no visible life, not even lichen. I had no idea how far away the horizon really was, but we felt high and it looked far, and there was no hint of trees, shrubs, or animal life in the distance either. Where the hell are we? I asked. I had been sure that I knew all of the worlds in the web. Mudja, said Johnny, pronouncing it something like Mudja. I never heard of it, I said, putting one hand in my pocket and finding the pearl-handled grip of Dad's automatic. It's not officially in the web yet, said the cybrid. Officially, it's a colony of Parvati. But it's only light minutes from the force base there, and the Farcaster connections have been set up before Mudja joins the Protectorate. I looked at the desolation. The sulfur dioxide stench was making me ill, and I was afraid it was going to ruin my suit. Colonies? Nearby? No. There are several small cities on the other side of the planet. What's the nearest inhabited area? Nanda Devi. A town of about 300 people. It's more than 2,000 kilometers to the south. Then why put a Farcaster portal here? Potential mining sites, said Johnny. He gestured toward the Gray Plateau. Heavy metals. The consortium authorized over a hundred Farcaster portals in this hemisphere for easy access once the development began. Okay, I said. It's a good place for a murder. Why'd you come here? I don't know. It was part of the memory section lost. Who'd you come with? I don't know that either. What do you know? The young man put his graceful hands in his pockets. Whoever... Whatever attacked me used a type of weapon known in the Corps as an AIDS-2 virus. What's that? AIDS-2 was a human plague disease back long before the Hegira, said Johnny. It disabled the immune system. This virus works the same with an AI. In less than a second, it infiltrates security systems and turns lethal phagocyte programs against the host, against the AI itself, against me. So you couldn't have contracted this virus naturally? Johnny smiled. Impossible. It's comparable to asking a shooting victim if he might not have fallen on the bullets. 
I shrugged. Look, if you want a datum net or AI expert, you've come to the wrong woman. Other than accessing the sphere like twenty billion other chumps, I know zilch about the ghost world. I used the old term to see if it would get a rise out of him. I know, said Johnny, still equable. That's not what I want you to do. What do you want me to do? Find out who brought me here and killed me, and why. All right. Why do you think this is where the murder took place? Because this is where I regained control of my cybrid when I was reconstituted. You mean your cybrid was incapacitated while the virus destroyed you? Yes. And how long did that last? My death? Almost a minute before my reserve persona could be activated. I laughed. I couldn't help myself. What is amusing, M. Lamia? Your concept of death, I said. The hazel eyes looked sad. Perhaps it is amusing to you, but you have no idea what a minute of disconnection means to an element of the Technicore. It is eons of time and information, millennia of non-communication. Yeah, I said, able to hold back my own tears without too much effort. So what did your body, your cybrid, do while you were changing personae tapes or whatever? I presume it was comatose. It can't handle itself autonomously? Oh, yes, but not when there's a general systems failure. So, where did you come to? Pardon me? When you reactivated the cybrid, where was it? Johnny nodded in understanding. He pointed to a boulder less than five meters from the forecaster. Lying there? On this side or the other side? The other side. I went over and examined the spot. No blood. No notes, no murder weapons left lying about. Not even a footprint or indication that Johnny's body had lain there for that eternity of a minute. A police forensics team might have read volumes into the microscopic and biotic clues left there, but all I could see was hard rock. If your memory's really gone, I said, how do you know someone else came here with you? I accessed the Farcaster records. Did you bother to check the mystery person or person's name on the universal card charge? We both forecast on my card, said Johnny. Just one other person? Yes. I nodded. Farcaster records would solve every interworld crime if the portals were true teleportation. The transport data record could have recreated the subject down to the last gram and follicle. Instead, a Farcaster essentially is just a crude hole ripped in space-time by a phased singularity. If the Farcaster criminal doesn't use his or her own card, the only data we get are origination and destination. Where'd you two forecast from? I asked. Tau Cetai Center. You have the portal code? Of course. Let's go there and finish this conversation, I said. This place stinks to high heaven. TC Squared, the age-old nickname for Tau Cetai Center, is certainly the most crowded world in the web. Besides its population of five billion people scrabbling for room on less than half the land area of old Earth, it has an orbital ring ecology that is home for half a billion more. In addition to being the capital of the hegemony and home of the Senate, TC Squared is the business nexus for web trade. Naturally, the portal number Johnny had found brought us to a 600 portal terminex in one of the biggest spires in New London, one of the oldest and largest city sections. Hell, I said, let's get a drink. There was a choice of bars near the Terminex, and I picked one that was relatively quiet. A simulated ship's tavern, dark, cool, with plenty of fake wood and brass. I ordered a beer. I never drink the hard stuff or use flashback when on a case. Sometimes I think that need for self-discipline is what keeps me in the business. Johnny also ordered a beer, a dark German brew bottled on Renaissance Vector. I found myself wondering what vices a cybrid might have. I said, what else did you find out before coming to see me? The young man opened his hands. Nothing. Shit, I said reverently. This is a joke. With all the powers of an AI at your disposal, you can't trace your cybrid's whereabouts and actions for a few days prior to your accident? No. Johnny sipped his beer. Rather, I could, but there are important reasons why I do not want my fellow AIs to find me investigating. You suspect one of them? 
Instead of answering, Johnny handed me a flimsy of his universal card purchases. The blackout caused by my murder left five standard days unaccounted for. Here are the card charges for that time. I thought you said you were only disconnected for a minute. Johnny scratched his cheek with one finger. I was lucky to lose only five days' worth of data, he said. I waved over the human waiter and ordered another beer. Look, I said. Johnny, whoever you are, I'll never be able to get an angle on this case unless I know more about you and your situation. Why would someone want to kill you if they know you'll be reconstituted or whatever the hell it is? I see two possible motives, said Johnny over his beer. I nodded. One would be to create just the memory loss they succeeded in getting, I said. That would suggest that whatever it was they wanted you to forget, it had occurred or come to your attention in the past week or so. What's the second motive? To send me a message, said Johnny. I just don't know what it is, or from who. Do you know who would want to kill you? No. No guesses at all? None. Most murders, I said, are acts of sudden mindless rage committed by someone the victim knows well. Family, a friend or lover. A majority of the premeditated ones are usually carried out by someone close to the victim. Johnny said nothing. There was something about his face that I found incredibly attractive. A sort of masculine strength combined with a feminine sense of awareness. Perhaps it was the eyes. Do AIs have families? I asked. Feuds? Squabbles? Lover's spats? No. He smiled slightly. There are quasi-family arrangements, but they share none of the requirements of emotion or responsibility that human families exhibit. AI families are primarily convenient code groups for showing where certain processing trends originated. So you don't think another AI attacked you? It's possible. Johnny rotated his glass in his hands. I just do not see why they would attack me through my cybrid. Easier access? Perhaps. But it complicates things for the assailant. An attack in Denim Plane would have been infinitely more lethal. Also, I do fail to see any motive for another AI. It makes no sense. I'm a threat to no one. Why do you have a cybrid, Johnny? Maybe if I understand your role in things, I could get at a motive. He picked up a pretzel and played with it. I have a cybrid. In some ways I am a cybrid because my function is to observe and react to human beings. In a sense, I was human once myself. I frowned and shook my head. So far nothing he'd said had made sense. You've heard of personality retrieval projects? He asked. No. A standard year ago, when the Force Sims recreated the personality of General Horace Glennon Height, to see what made him such a brilliant general? It was in all the news. Yeah. Well, I am, or was, an earlier and much more complicated retrieval project. My core persona was based on a pre hegira Old Earth poet. Ancient. Born late 18th century, Old Calendar. How the hell can they reconstruct a personality that lost in time? Writings, said Johnny. His letters. Diaries critical biographies, testimony of friends, but mostly through his verse. The sim recreates the environment, plugs in the known factors, and works backward from the creative products. Voila, a persona core. Crude at first, but by the time I came into being, relatively refined. Our first attempt was a 20th century poet named Ezra Pound. Our persona was opinionated to the point of absurdity, prejudiced beyond rationality and functionally insane. It took a year of tinkering before we discovered that the persona was accurate. It was the man who had been nuts. A genius, but nuts. And then what? I said. They build your personality around a dead poet. Then what? This becomes the template upon which the AI has grown, said Johnny. The cybrid allows me to carry out my role in the datum plane community. As poet? Johnny smiled again. More as poem he said. A poem? An ongoing work of art, but not in the human sense. A puzzle, perhaps. A variable enigma which occasionally offers unusual insights into more serious lines of analysis. I don't get it, I said. 
It probably does not matter. I very much doubt if my purpose was the cause of the assault. What do you think was the cause? I have no idea. I felt us closing a circle. All right, I said. I'll try to find out what you were doing and who you were with during these lost five days. Is there anything besides the credit flimsy that you can think of to help? Johnny shook his head. You know, of course, why it is important for me to know the identity and motive of my assailant? Sure, I said. They might try it again. Precisely. How can I get hold of you if I need to? Johnny passed me an access chip. A secure line, I said. Very. Okay, I said. I'll get back to you if and when I get some information. We moved out of the bar and toward the Terminex. He was moving away when I took three quick steps and grabbed his arm. It was the first time that I had touched him. Johnny, what's the name of the old earth poet they resurrected? Retrieved. Whatever, the one they built your AI persona on. The attractive cybrid hesitated. I noticed that his eyelashes were very long. How can it be important? he asked. Who knows what's important? He nodded. Keats, he said, born in A.D. 1795, died of tuberculosis in 1821. John Keats. Following someone through a series of forecaster changes is damn near impossible, especially if you want to remain undetected. The web cops can do it, given about 50 agents assigned to the task, plus some exotic and damned expensive high-tech toys, not to mention the cooperation of the Transit Authority. For a solo, the task is almost impossible. Still, it was fairly important for me to see where my new client was headed. Johnny did not look back as he crossed the Terminex Plaza. I moved to a nearby kiosk and watched through my pocket-sized imager as he punched codes on a manual disk key, inserted his card, and stepped through the glowing rectangle. The use of the manual disk key probably meant that he was headed for a general access portal, since private caster codes are usually imprinted on eyes-only chips. Great. I'd narrowed his destination down to approximately two million portals on a hundred and fifty-some web worlds and half that many moons. With one hand, I pulled the red lining out of my overcoat while I hit replay on the imager, watching through the eyepiece as it magnified the disky sequence. I tugged out a red cap to go with my new red jacket and pulled the brim low over my face. Moving quickly across the plaza, I queried my comm log about the nine-digit transfer code I'd seen on the imager. I knew the first three digits meant the world of Qingdao Shizhuang Pana. I'd memorized all the planetary prefixes, and was told an instant later that the portal code led to a residential district in the first expansion city of Wanzian. I hurried to the first open booth and cast there, stepping out onto a small Terminex plaza paved in worn brick. Ancient oriental shops leaned against one another, eaves of their pagoda roofs hanging over narrow side streets. People thronged the plaza and stood in doorways and while most of those in sight were obviously descendants of the long-flight exiles who settled THP, many were off-worlders. The air smelled of alien vegetation, sewage, and cooking rice. Damn, I whispered. There were three other Farcaster portals there, and none were in constant use. Johnny could have Farcast out immediately. Instead of casting back to Lucis, I spent a few minutes checking the plaza and side streets. By this time the melanin pill I'd swallowed had worked, and I was a young black woman, or man, it was hard to tell in my trendy red balloon jacket and polarized visor, strolling idly while taking pictures with my tourist imager. The trace pellet I'd dissolved in Johnny's second German beer had had more than enough time to work. The UV-positive microspores were almost hanging in the air by now. I could almost follow the trail of exhalations he had left. Instead, I found a bright yellow handprint on a dark wall. Bright yellow to my especially fit advisor, of course, invisible out of the UV spectrum, and then followed the trail of vague splotches where saturated clothing had touched market stalls or stone. Johnny was eating in a Cantonese restaurant less than two blocks from the Terminex Plaza. The frying food smelled delicious, but I restrained myself from entering, checking prices in alley bookstalls and haggling in the market for almost an hour before he finished, returned to the plaza and far cast out. This time he used a chip code. A private portal, certainly, possibly a private home. And I took two chances by using my pilot fish card to follow him. 
two chances because first the card is totally illegal and would someday cost me my license if caught. Less than likely if I kept using Daddy Silva's obscenely expensive but aesthetically perfect shape changer chips. And second, I ran a better than even chance of ending up in the living room of Johnny's house. Never an easy situation to talk one's way out of. It was not his living room. Even before I'd located the street signs, I recognized the familiar extra tug of gravity, the dim bronze light, the scent of oil and ozone in the air, and knew I was home on Lucis. Johnny had cast into a medium-security private residential tower in one of the Bergson hives. Perhaps that was why he'd chosen my agency. We were almost neighbors, less than six hundred clicks apart. My cybrid was not in sight. I walked purposefully so as not to alert any security vids programmed to respond to loitering. There was no residence directory, no numbers or names on the apartment doorways, and no listings accessible by comlog. I guessed that there were about 20,000 residential cubbies in East Bergson Hive. The telltales were fading as the spore soup died, but I checked only two of the radial corridors before I found a trail. Johnny lived far out on a glass-floored wing about a methane lake. His palm lock showed a faintly glowing handprint. I used my cat burglar tools to take a reading of the lock, and then I cast home. All in all, I'd watched my man go out for Chinese food and then go home for the night. Enough accomplished for one day. B.B. Serbringer was my AI expert. B.B. worked in hegemony flow control records and statistics, and spent most of his life reclining on a free-fall couch with half a dozen micro-leads running from his skull, while he communed with other bureaucrats in Dedham Plain. I'd known him in college when he was a pure cyberpuke, a twentieth-generation hacker, cortically shunted when he was twelve standard. His real name was Ernest, but he'd earned the nickname B.B. when he went out with a friend of mine named Shayla Toyo. Shayla had seen him naked on their second date and had laughed for a solid half hour. Ernest was, and is, almost two meters tall, but masses less than fifty kilos. Shayla said that he had a butt like two BBs, and, like most cruel things do, the nickname stuck. I visited him in one of the windowless worker monoliths on T.C. Squared. No cloud towers for B.B. in his ilk. So, Braun, he said, how come you're getting information literate in your old age? You're too old to get a real job. I just want to know about AIs, B.B. Only one of the most complex topics in the known universe, he sighed, and looked longingly at his disconnected neural shunt and metacortex leads. Cyberpukes never come down, but civil servants are required to dismount for lunch. B.B. was like most cyberpukes in that he never felt comfortable exchanging information when he wasn't riding a data wave. So what do you want to know, he said. Why did the A.I.s drop out? I had to start somewhere. B.B. made a convoluted gesture with his hands. They said they had projects which were not compatible with total immersion in hegemony. Read human affairs. Truth is, nobody knows. But they're still around. Still managing things? Sure. The system couldn't run without them. You know that, Braun. Even the all thing couldn't work without AI management of the real-time Schwarzschild patterning. Okay, I said, cutting him off before he lapsed into cyber pukies. But what are their other projects? No one knows. Branner and Swayze up at Art Intel Corp. think that the AIs are pursuing the evolution of consciousness on a galactic scale. We know they have their own probes out far deeper into the outback than... What about Cybrids? Cybrids? B.B. sat up and looked interested for the first time. Why do you mention Cybrids? Why are you surprised that I mention them, B.B.? He absently rubbed his shunt socket. Well, first of all, most people forget they exist. Two centuries ago, it was all alarmism and pod people taking over and all that. But now nobody thinks about them. Also, I just ran across an anomaly advisory yesterday that said that cybrids were disappearing. Disappearing? It was my turn to sit up. You know, being phased out. The AIs used to maintain about a thousand licensed cybrids in the web, about half of them based right here on TC Squared. Last week's census showed about two-thirds of those had been recalled in the past month or so. What happens when an AI recalls its cybrid? I don't know. They're destroyed, I suppose. AIs don't like to waste things, so I imagine the genetic materials recycled somehow. Why are they being recycled? 
Nobody knows, Braun. But then most of us don't know why the AIs do most of the things they do. Do experts see them, the AIs, as a threat? Are you kidding? Six hundred years ago, maybe. Two centuries ago, the secession made us leery. But if the things wanted to hurt humanity, they could have done it long before this. Worrying about AIs turning on us is about as productive as worrying that farm animals are going to revolt. Except the AIs are smarter than we, I said. Yeah, well, there is that. Bebe, have you heard of personality retrieval projects? Like the Glennon Height thing? Sure, everyone has. I even worked on one at Reich's University a few years ago. But they're passé. No one's doing them anymore. Why is that? Jesus, you don't know shit about anything, do you, Braun? The personality retrieval projects were all washouts. Even with the best sim control. They got the Force OCS HTN network involved. You can't factor all variables successfully. The persona template becomes self-aware. I don't mean just self-aware like you and me, but self-aware that it's an artificially self-aware persona. And that leads to terminal strange loops and non-harmonic labyrinths that go straight to Escher space. Translate, I said. B.B. sighed and glanced at the blue and gold time band on the wall. Five minutes and his mandatory lunch hour was over. He could rejoin the real world. Translated, he said. The retrieved personality breaks down. Goes crazy. Psycho city. Bug fuck. All of them. All of them. But the AIs are still interested in the process? Oh, yeah? Who says? They've never done one. All the retrieval efforts I've ever heard of were human-run. Mostly botched university projects. Brain-dead academics spending fortunes to bring back dead academic brains. I forced a smile. There were three minutes until he could plug back in. Were all the retrieved personalities given cybrid remotes? Uh-uh. What gave you that idea, Braun? None were. Couldn't work. Why not? It'd just fuck up the stim sim. Plus you'd need perfect clone stock and an interactive environment precise to the last detail. You see, kiddo, with a retrieved personality, you let it live in its world via full-scale sim and then you just sneaked a few questions in via dreams or scenario interactives. Pulling a persona out of sim reality into slow time. This was the cyberpuke's age-old term for the, pardon the expression, real world. Would just drive it bugfuck all the sooner, he finished. I shook my head. Yeah, well, thanks, B.B. I moved to the door. There were thirty seconds left before my old college friend could escape from slow time. B.B., I said as an afterthought, have you ever heard of a persona retrieved from an old earth poet named John Keats? Keats? Oh, sure, there was a big write-up on that in my undergrad text. Marty Carolus did that about fifty years ago at New Cambridge. What happened? The usual. Persona went strange, Luke. But before it broke up, it died a full sim death. Some ancient disease. B.B. glanced at the clock, smiled, and lifted his shunt. Before clicking it into his skull socket, he looked at me again, almost beatifically. I remember now, he said through his dreamy smile. It was tuberculosis. If our society ever opted for Orwell's Big Brother approach, the instrument of choice for oppression would have to be the credit wake. In a totally non-cash economy with only a vestigial barter black market, a person's activities could be tracked in real time by monitoring the credit wake of his or her universal card. There were strict laws protecting card privacy, but laws had a bad habit of being ignored or abrogated when societal push came to totalitarian shove. Johnny's credit wake for the five-day period leading to his murder showed a man of regular habits and modest expenses. Before following up the leads on the credit flimsy, I'd spent a dull two days following Johnny himself. Data. He lived alone in East Bergson Hive. A routine check showed that he'd lived there about seven local months, less than five standard. In the morning, he had breakfast at a local cafe and then forecast to Renaissance Vector, where he worked for about five hours, evidently gathering research of some sort in the print archives followed by a light lunch at a courtyard vendor stand, another hour or two in the library, and then cast home to Lucis or to some favorite eating spot on another world. In his cubby by 2200 hours. 
more forecasting than the average Lucian middle-class drone, but an otherwise uninspiring schedule. The credit flimsies confirmed that he had held to the agenda on the week he was murdered, with the addition of a few extra purchases. Shoes one day, groceries the next, and one stop at a bar on Renaissance 5 on the day of his murder. I joined him for dinner at the small restaurant on Red Dragon Street, near the Qingdao Shizhuang Pana portal. The food was very hot, very spicy, and very good. How's it going? he asked. Great. I'm a thousand marks richer than when we met, and I found a good Cantonese restaurant. I'm glad my money is going toward something important. Speaking of your money, where does it come from? Hanging out in a Renaissance Vector library can't pay much. Johnny raised an eyebrow. I live on a small inheritance. Not too small, I hope. I want to be paid. It will be adequate for our purposes, M. Lamia. Have you discovered anything of interest? I shrugged. Tell me what you do in that library. Can it possibly be Germain? Yeah, it could be. He looked at me strangely. Something about his eyes made me go weak at the knees. You remind me of someone, he said softly. Oh? From anyone else, that line would have been cause for an exit. Who? I asked. A woman I once knew. Long ago. He brushed fingers across his brow as if he were suddenly tired or dizzy. What was her name? Fanny. The word was almost whispered. I knew who he was talking about. John Keats had a fiancé named Fanny. Their love affair had been a series of romantic frustrations which almost drove the poet mad. When he died in Italy, alone except for one fellow traveler, feeling abandoned by friends and his lover, Keats had asked that unopened letters from Fanny and a lock of her hair be buried with him. I'd never heard of John Keats before this week. I'd accessed all this shit with my comm log. I said, So what do you do at the library? The cybrid cleared his throat. I'm researching a poem, searching for fragments of the original. Something by Keats? Yes. Wouldn't it be easier to access it? Of course. But it is important for me to see the original, to touch it. I thought about that. What's the poem about? He smiled, or at least his lips did. The hazel eyes still seemed troubled. It's called Hyperion. It's difficult to describe what it's about. Artistic failure, I suppose. Keats never finished it. I pushed aside my plate and sipped warm tea. You say Keats never finished it. Don't you mean you never finished it? His look of shock had to be genuine. Unless AIs were consummate actors. For all I knew, they could be. Good God, he said. I'm not John Keats. Having a persona based upon a retrieval template no more makes me Keats than having the name Lamia makes you a monster. There have been a million influences that have separated me from that poor sad genius. You said I reminded you of Fanny. An echo of a dream. Bless. You've taken RNA learning medication, yes? Yes. It's like that. Memories which feel hollow. A human waiter brought fortune cookies. Do you have any interest in visiting the real Hyperion? I asked. What's that? The Outback World. Somewhere beyond poverty, I think. Johnny looked puzzled. He had broken open the cookie but had not yet read the fortune. It used to be called Poet's World, I think, I said. It even has a city named after you, after Keats. The young man shook his head. I'm sorry, I haven't heard of the place. How can that be? Don't AIs know everything? His laugh was short and sharp. This one knows very little. He read his fortune. Be wary of sudden impulses. I crossed my arms. You know, except for that parlor trick with the bank manager, Hollow, I have no proof that you are what you say you are. Give me your hand. My hand? Yes, either one. Thank you. Johnny held my right hand in both of his. His fingers were longer than mine. Mine were stronger. Close your eyes, he said. I did. 
There was no transition. One instant I was sitting in the Blue Lotus on Red Dragon Street, and the next I was nowhere, somewhere, streaking through gray-blue datum plain, banking along chrome-yellow information highways, passing over and under and through great cities of glowing information storage, red skyscrapers sheathed in black security ice, simple entities like personal accounts or corporate files blazing like burning refineries in the night. Above it all, just out of sight, as if poised in twisted space, hung the gigantic weights of the AIs, their simplest communications pulsing like violent heat lightning along the infinite horizons. Somewhere in the distance, all but lost in the maze of three-dimensional neon that partitioned one tiny second of arc in the incredible datasphere of one small world, I sensed rather than saw those soft hazel eyes waiting for me. Johnny released my hand. He cracked my fortune cookie open. The strip of paper read, Invest wisely in new ventures. Jesus, I whispered. B.B. had taken me flying in Datum Plane before, but without a shunt, the experience had been a shadow of this. It was the difference between watching a black and white hollow of a fireworks display and being there. How do you do that? Will you be making any progress on the case tomorrow? He asked. I regained my composure. Tomorrow, I said, I plan to solve it. Well, maybe not solve it, but at least get things moving. The last charge on Johnny's credit flimsy had been the bar on Renaissance 5. I checked it out the first day, of course, talked to several of the regulars since there was no human bartender, but had come up with no one who remembered Johnny. I'd been back twice with no greater luck. But on the third day I went back to stay until something broke. The bar was definitely not in the class of the wood and brass place Johnny and I had visited on T.C. Squared. This place was tucked on a second floor of a decaying building in a run-down neighborhood, two blocks from the Renaissance Library where Johnny spent his days. Not the kind of place he would stop in on the way to the Farcaster Plaza, but just the kind of place he might end up if he met someone in or near the library, someone who wanted to talk in private. I'd been there six hours and was getting damn tired of salted nuts and flat beer, when an old derelict came in. I guessed that he was a regular by the way he didn't pause in the doorway or look around, but headed straight for a small table in the back and ordered a whiskey before the serving mech had come to a full stop. When I joined him at the table, I realized that he wasn't so much a derelict as an example of the tired men and women I'd seen in the junk shops and street stalls in that neighborhood. He squinted up at me through defeated eyes. May I sit down? Depends, sister. What are you selling? I'm buying. I sat, set my beer mug on the table, and slid across a flat photo of Johnny entering the Farcaster booth on T.C. Squared. Seen this guy? The old man glanced at the photo and returned his full attention to his whiskey. Maybe. I waved over the mech for another round. If you did see him, it's your lucky day. The old man snorted and rubbed the back of his hand against the gray stubble on his cheek. If it is, it'll be the first time in a long fucking time. He focused on me. How much? For what? Information. How much depends on the information. Have you seen him? I removed a black market fifty mark bill from my tunic pocket. Yeah. The bill came down to the table, but remained in my hand. When? Last Tuesday. Tuesday morning. That was the correct day. I slid the fifty marks to him and removed another bill. Was he alone? The old man licked his lips. Let me think. I don't think. No, he was there. He pointed toward a table at the rear. Two other guys with him. One of them. Well, that's why I remembered. What's that? The old man rubbed finger and thumb in a gesture as old as greed. Tell me about the two men, I coaxed. The young guy, your guy. He was with one of them, you know, the nature freaks with robes. You see him on HTV all the time. Them and their damn trees. Trees? A Templar? I said, astounded. What would a Templar be doing in a Renaissance 5 bar? If he'd been after Johnny, why would he wear his robe? That would be like a murderer going out to do business in a clown suit. Yeah, Templar. Brown robe, 
sort of oriental looking. A man? Yeah, I said he was. Can you describe him more? Nah, Templar, tall son of a bitch. Couldn't see his face very well. What about the other one? The old man shrugged. I removed a second bill and set them both near my glass. Did they come in together? I prompted. The three of them? I don't. I can't. No, wait. Your guy and the Templar guy came in first. I remember seeing the robe before the other guy sat down. Describe the other man. The old man waved over the mech and ordered a third drink. I used my card and the servitor slid away on noisy repellers. Like you, he said. Sort of like you. Short, I said. Strong arms and legs, a Lucian? Yeah, I guess so. Never been there. What else? No hair, said the old man. Just a, what do you call it, like my niece used to wear, a ponytail. A cue, I said. Yeah, whatever. He started to reach for the bills. Couple more questions. Did they argue? Nah, don't think so. Talked real quiet. Place is pretty empty that time of day. What time of day was it? Morning, about ten o'clock. This coincided with the credit flimsy code. Did you hear any of the conversation? Uh-uh. Who did most of the talking? The old man took a drink and furrowed his brow in thought. Templar guy did it first. Your man seemed to be answering questions. Seemed surprised once when I was looking. Shocked? Uh-uh, just surprised. Like the guy in the robe had said something he didn't expect. You said the Templar did most of the talking at first. Who spoke later? My guy? Uh-uh. The one with the ponytail. Then they left. All three of them left? Nah. Your guy in the ponytail. The Templar stayed behind? Yeah, I guess so. I think. I went to the lab. When I got back, I don't think he was there. What way did the other two go? I don't know, God damn it. I wasn't paying much attention. I was having a drink, not playing spy. I nodded. The mech rolled over again, but I waved it away. The old man scowled at its back. So they weren't arguing when they left? No sign of a disagreement or that one was forcing the other to leave? Who? My guy in the queue. Uh-uh. Shit, I don't know. He looked down at the bills in his grimy hand and at the whiskey in the mech's display panel, realizing, perhaps, that he wasn't going to get any more of either from me. Why do you want to know all this shit, anyway? I'm looking for the guy, I said. I looked around the bar. About twenty customers sat at tables. Most of them looked like neighborhood regulars. Anyone else here who might have seen them? Or somebody else you might remember who was here? Uh-uh, he said dully. I realized then that the old man's eyes were precisely the color of the whiskey he'd been drinking. I stood, set a final twenty-mark bill on the table. Thanks, friend. Any time, sister. The mech was rolling toward him before I'd reached the door. I walked back toward the library, paused a minute in the busy Farcaster Plaza, and stood there a minute. Scenario so far? Johnny had met the Templar, or been approached by him, either in the library or outside when he arrived in mid-morning. They went somewhere private to talk, the bar, and something the Templar said surprised Johnny. A man with a cue, possibly a Lucian, showed up and took over the conversation. Johnny and Q left together. Sometime after that, Johnny farcast to T.C. Squared and then farcast from there with one other person, possibly Q or the Templar, to Mudya, where someone tried to kill him. Did kill him. Too many gaps. Too many someones. Not a hell of a lot to show for a day's work. I was debating whether to cast back to Lucis when my comm log chirped on the restricted comm frequency I'd given to Johnny. His voice was raw. M. Lamia, come quickly, please. I think they've just tried again. To kill me. The coordinates which followed were for the East Bergson Hive. I ran for the Farcaster. The door to Johnny's cubby was open a crack. 
There was no one in the corridor, no sounds from the apartment. Whatever had happened hadn't brought the authorities yet. I brought out Dad's automatic pistol from my coat pocket, jacked around into the chamber, and clicked on the laser targeting beam with a single motion. I went in low, both arms extended, the red dot sliding across the dark walls, a cheap print on the far wall, a darker hall leading into the cubby. The foyer was empty. The living room and media pit were empty. Johnny lay on the floor of the bedroom, his head against the bed. Blood soaked the sheet. He struggled to prop himself up, fell back. The sliding door behind him was open and a dank industrial wind blew in from the open mall beyond. I checked the single closet, short hall, kitchen niche, and came back to step out on the balcony. The view was spectacular from the perch two hundred or so meters up the curved hive wall, looking down the ten or twenty kilometers of the trench mall. The roof of the hive was a dark mass of girders another hundred or so meters above. Thousands of lights, commercial hollas, and neon lights glowed from the mall, joining in the haze of distance to a brilliant throbbing electric blur. There were hundreds of similar balconies on this wall of the hive, all deserted. The nearest was twenty meters away. They were the kind of thing rental agents liked to point to as a plus. God knows that Johnny probably paid plenty extra for an outside room. But the balconies were totally impractical because of the strong wind rushing up toward the ventilators, carrying the usual grit and debris, as well as the eternal hive scent of oil and ozone. I put my pistol away and went back to check on Johnny. The cut ran from his hairline to his eyebrow, superficial but messy. He was sitting up as I returned from the bathroom with a sterile dry pad and pressed it against the cut. What happened? I said. Two men were waiting in the bedroom when I came in. They'd bypassed the alarms on the balcony door. You deserve a refund on your security tax, I said. What happened next? We struggled. They seemed to be dragging me toward the door. One of them had an injector, but I managed to knock it out of his hand. What made them leave? I activated the in-house alarms. But not hive security? No. I didn't want them involved. Who hit you? Johnny smiled sheepishly. I did. They released me. I went after them. I managed to trip and fall against the nightstand. Not a very graceful brawl on either side, I said. I switched on a lamp and checked the carpet until I found the injection ampule where it had rolled under the bed. Johnny eyed it as if it were a viper. What's your guess, I said. More aids, too? He shook his head. I know a place where we can get it analyzed, I said. My guess is that it's just a hypnotic trank. They just wanted you to come along, not to kill you. Johnny moved the dry pad and grimaced. The blood was still flowing. Why would anyone want to kidnap a cybrid? You tell me. I'm beginning to think that the so-called murder was just a botched kidnapping attempt. Johnny shook his head again. I said, did one of the men wear a cue? I don't know. They wore caps and osmosis masks. Was either one tall enough to be a Templar, or strong enough to be a Lucian? A Templar? Johnny was surprised. No. One was about average web height. The one with the ampule could have been Lucian, strong enough. So you went after a Lucian thug with your bare hands. Do you have some bioprocessors or augmentation implants I don't know about? No. I was just mad. I helped him to his feet. So AIs get angry? I do. Come on, I said. I know an automated med clinic that's discount. Then you'll be staying with me for a while. With you? Why? Because you've graduated from just needing a detective, I said. Now you need a bodyguard. My cubby wasn't registered in the hive zoning schematic as an apartment. I'd taken over a renovated warehouse loft from a friend of mine who'd run afoul of loan sharks. My friend had decided late in life to emigrate to one of the outback colonies, and I'd gotten a good deal on a place just to click down the corridor from my office. The environment was a little rough, and sometimes the noise from the loading docks could drown out conversation, but it gave me ten times the room of a normal cubby, and I could use my weights and workout equipment right at home. Johnny honestly seemed intrigued by the place, and I had to kick myself for being pleased. Next thing you knew, I'd be putting on lipstick and body rouge for this cybrid. So why do you live on Lucis? I asked him. Most off-worlders find the gravity of pain and the scenery monotonous. 
plus your research materials at the library on Renaissance 5. Why here? I found myself looking and listening very carefully as he answered. His hair was straight on top, parted in the middle, and fell in reddish-brown curls to his collar. He had the habit of resting his cheek on his fist as he spoke. It struck me that his dialect was actually the non-dialect of someone who has learned a new language perfectly, but without the lazy shortcuts of someone born to it. And beneath that there was a hint of lilt that brought back the overtones of a cat burglar I'd known who had grown up on Asquith, a quiet backwater web world settled by first expansion immigrants from what had once been the British Isles. I have lived on many worlds, he said. My purpose is to observe. As a poet. He shook his head, winced, and gingerly touched the stitches. No, I'm not a poet. He was. Despite the circumstances, there was an energy and vitality to Johnny that I'd found in too few men. It was hard to describe, but I'd seen rooms full of more important personages rearrange themselves to orbit around personalities like his. It was not merely his reticence and sensitivity. It was an intensity that he emanated, even when merely observing. Why do you live here? he asked. I was born here. Yes, but you spent your childhood years on Tau Cetai Center. Your father was a senator. I said nothing. Many people expected you to go into politics, he said. Did your father's suicide dissuade you? It wasn't suicide, I said. No. All the news reports in the inquest said it was, I said tonelessly. But they were wrong. My father never would have taken his own life. So it was murder? Yes. Despite the fact that there was no motive or hint of a suspect? Yes. I see, said Johnny. The yellow glow from the loading dock lamps came through the dusty windows and made his hair gleam like new copper. Do you like being a detective? When I do it well, I said. Are you hungry? No. Then let's get some sleep. You can have the couch. Do you do it well often, he said. Being a detective? We'll see tomorrow. In the morning, Johnny forecast a Renaissance vector at about the usual time, waited a moment in the plaza, and then cast to the old settler's museum on Sol Draconi Septum. From there he jumped to the main Terminex on Nordholm, and then cast to the Templar world of God's Grove. We'd worked out the timing ahead of time, and I was waiting for him on Renaissance 5, standing back in the shadows of the colonnade. A man with a cue was the third through after Johnny. There was no doubt he was Lucian. Between the hive pallor, the muscle and body mass, and the arrogant way of talking, he might have been my long-lost brother. He never looked at Johnny, but I could tell that he was surprised when the cybrid circled around to the outbound portals. I stayed back and only caught a glimpse of his card, but would have bet anything that it was a tracer. Q was careful in the old settler's museum, keeping Johnny in sight but checking his own back as well. I was dressed in a Zen Gnostics meditation jumper, isolation visor and all, and I never looked their way as I circled to the museum out portal and cast directly to God's Grove. It made me feel funny leaving Johnny alone through the museum and Nordholm Terminex, but both were public places and it was a calculated risk. Johnny came through the World Tree arrival portal right on time and bought a ticket for the tour. His shadow had to scurry to catch up, breaking cover to board the omnibus skimmer before it left. I was already settled in the rear seat on the upper deck, and Johnny found a place near the front, just as we had planned. Now I was wearing basic tourist garb, and my imager was one of a dozen in action when Q hurried to take his place three rows behind Johnny. The tour of the World Tree is always fun. Dad first took me there when I was only three standard. But this time, as the skimmer moved above branches the size of freeways, and circled higher around a trunk the width of Olympus Mons, I found myself reacting to the glimpses of hooded Templars with something approaching anxiety. Johnny and I had discussed various clever and infinitely subtle ways to trail Q if he showed up, to follow him to his lair and spend weeks if necessary deducing his game. In the end, I opted for something less than the subtle approach. The omnibus had dumped us out near the Muir Museum, and people were milling around on the plaza torn between spending ten marks for a ticket to educate themselves or going straight for the gift shop, when I walked up to Q, gripped him by the upper arm, and said in conversational tones, Hi. 
Do you mind telling me what the fuck you want with my client? There's an old stereotype that says that Lucians are as subtle as a stomach pump and about half as pleasant. If I'd helped confirm the first part of that, Q went a long way toward reinforcing the second prejudice. He was fast. Even with my seemingly casual grip paralyzing the muscles of his right arm, the knife in his left hand sliced up and around in less than a second. I let myself fall to my right, the knife slicing air centimeters from my cheek, hitting pavement and rolling as I palmed the neural stunner and came up on one knee to meet the threat. No threat. Q was running. Away from me. Away from Johnny. He shoved tourists aside, dodged behind them, moving toward the museum entrance. I slid the stunner back into its wristband and began running myself. Stunners are great close-range weapons, as easy to aim as a shotgun without the dire effects if the spread pattern finds innocent bystanders, but they aren't worth anything beyond eight or ten meters. On full dispersal, I could give half the tourists in the plaza a miserable headache, but Q was already too far away to bring down. I ran after him. Johnny ran toward me. I waved him back. My place, I shouted. Use the locks. Q had reached the museum entrance, and now he looked back at me. The knife was still in his hand. I charged at him, feeling something like joy at the thought of the next few minutes. Q vaulted a turnstile and shoved tourists aside to get through the doors. I followed. It was only when I reached the vaulted interior of the Grand Hall and saw him shoving his way up the crowded escalator to the excursion mezzanine that I realized where he was headed. My father had taken me on the Templar excursion when I was three. The Farcaster portals were permanently open. It took about three hours to walk all the guided tours on the thirty worlds where the Templar ecologists had preserved some bit of nature which they thought would please the Muir. I couldn't remember for sure, but I thought the paths were loop trails with the portals relatively close together for easy transit by Templar guides and maintenance people. Shit. A uniformed guard near the tour portal saw the confusion as Q cut through and stepped forward to intercept the rude intruder. Even from fifteen meters away I could see the shock and disbelief on the old guard's face as he staggered backward, the hilt of Q's long knife protruding from his chest. The old guard, probably a retired local cop, looked down, face white, touched the bone hilt gingerly as if it were a gag, and collapsed face first on the mezzanine tiles. Tourists screamed. Someone yelled for a medic. I saw Q shove a Templar guide aside and throw himself through the glowing portal. This was not going as I'd planned. I vaulted for the portal without slowing. Through and half sliding on the slippery grass of a hillside. Sky lemon yellow above us. Tropical sense. I saw startled faces turn my way. Q was halfway to the other farcaster cutting through elaborate flower beds and kicking aside bonsai topiary. I recognized the world of Fuji and careened down the hillside, clambering uphill again through the flower beds, following the trail of destruction Q had left. Stop that man, I screamed, realizing how foolish it sounded. No one made a move except for a Nipponese tourist who raised her imager and recorded a sequence. Q looked back, shoved past a gawking tour group, and stepped through the forecast portal. I had the stunner in my hand again and waved it at the crowd. Back! Back! They hastily made room. I went through warily, stunner raised. Q no longer had his knife, but I didn't know what other toys he carried. Brilliant light on water. The violet waves of Mare Infinitus. The path was a narrow wooden walkway ten meters above the support floats. It led out and away curving above a fairyland coral reef and a sargasso of yellow island kelp before curving back, but a narrow catwalk cut across to the portal at the end of the trail. Q had climbed the no-access gate and was halfway across the catwalk. I ran the ten paces to the edge of the platform, selected tight beam, and held the stunner on full auto, sweeping the invisible beam back and forth as if I were aiming a garden hose. Q seemed to stumble a half-step, but then made the last ten meters to the portal and dived through. I cursed and climbed the gate, ignoring shouts from a Templar guide behind me. I caught a glimpse of a sign which reminded tourists to don therm gear, and then I was through the portal, barely sensing the shower-tingle sensation of passing through the Farcaster screen. A blizzard roared, 
whipping against the arched containment field which turned the tourist trail into a tunnel through fierce whiteness. Sol Draconi Septum, the northern reaches where Templar lobbying of the All Thing had stopped the colonial heating project in order to save the Arctic Wraiths. I could feel the 1.7 standard gravity on my shoulders like the yoke of my workout machine. It was a shame that Q was a Lucian also. If he'd been web standard in physique, there would have been no contest if I caught him here. Now we would see who was in better shape. Q was fifty meters down the trail and looking back over his shoulder. The other forecaster was somewhere near, but the blizzard made anything off the trail invisible and inaccessible. I began loping after him. In deference to the gravity, this was the shortest of the Templar excursion trails, curving back after only two hundred or so meters. I could hear Q's panting as I closed on him. I was running easily. There was no way that he was going to beat me to the next forecaster. I saw no tourists on the trail, and so far no one had given chase. I thought that this would not be a bad place to interrogate him. Q was thirty meters short of the exit portal. When he turned, dropped to one knee, and aimed an energy pistol. The first bolt was short, possibly because of the unaccustomed weight of the weapon in Sol Draconi's gravity field, but it was close enough to leave a scorched slash of slagged walkway and melted permafrost within a meter of me. He adjusted his aim. I went out through the containment field, shouldering my way through the elastic resistance and stumbling into drifts above my waist. The cold air burned my lungs, and wind-driven snow caked my face and bare arms in seconds. I could see Q looking for me from within the lighted pathway, but the blizzard dimness worked in my favor now, as I threw myself through drifts in his direction. Q forced his head, shoulders, and right arm through the field wall, squinting in the barrage of icy particles which coated his cheeks and brow in an instant. His second shot was high, and I felt the heat of the bolt as it passed over. I was within ten meters of him now. I set the stunner on widest dispersal and sprayed it in his direction without lifting my head from the snowdrift where I had dropped. Q let the energy pistol tumble into the snow and fell back through the containment field. I screamed in triumph, my shout lost in the wind roar, and staggered toward the field wall. My hands and feet were distant things now, beyond the pain of cold. My cheeks and ears burned. I put the thought of frostbite out of my mind and threw myself against the field. It was a Class Three field, designed to keep out the elements and anything as huge as an Arctic wraith, while allowing the occasional errant tourist or errant bent Templar re-entry to the path. But in my cold, weakened condition I found myself batting against it for half a moment like a fly against plastic, my feet slipping on snow and ice. Finally I threw myself forward, landing heavily and clumsily, dragging my legs through. The sudden warmth of the pathway set me to shaking uncontrollably. Shards of sleet fell from me as I forced myself to my knees, then to my feet. Q ran the last five yards to the exit portal with his right arm dangling as if broken. I knew the nerve-fire agony of a neural stunner and did not envy him. He looked back once as I began running toward him, and then he went through. Maui Covenant the air was tropical and smelled of ocean and vegetation. The sky was an old earth blue. I saw immediately that the trail had led to one of the few free modal isles which the Templars had saved from hegemony domestication. It was a large isle, perhaps half a kilometer from end to end, and from the access portal's vantage point on a wide deck encircling the main tree sail trunk, I could see the expansive sail leaves filling with wind and the indigo rudder vines trailing far behind. The exit portal lay only fifteen meters away, down a staircase. But I saw at once that Q had run the other way, along the main trail, toward a cluster of huts and concession stands near the edge of the aisle. It was only here, halfway along the Templar excursion trail, that they allowed human structures to shelter weary hikers while they purchased refreshments or souvenirs to benefit the Templar Brotherhood. I began jogging down the wide staircase to the trail below, still shivering, my clothes soaked with rapidly melting snow. Why was Q running toward the cluster of people there? I saw the bright carpets laid out for rental and understood. The hawking mats were illegal on most web worlds, but still a tradition on Maui Covenant because of the Siri legend. Less than two meters long and a meter wide, the ancient playthings lay waiting to carry tourists out over the sea and back again to the wandering isle. If Q reached one of those... 
I broke into a full sprint, catching the other Lucy in a few meters short of the hawking mat area and tackling him just below the knees. We rolled into the concession stand area, and the few tourists there shouted and scattered. My father taught me one thing which any child ignores at his or her own peril. A good big guy can always beat a good little guy. In this case, we were about even. Q twisted free and jumped to his feet, falling into an arms-out, fingers-splayed oriental fighting stance. Now we'd see who the better guy was. Q got the first blow in, feinting a straight-fingered jab with his left hand and coming up and around with a swinging kick instead. I ducked, but he connected solidly enough to make my left shoulder and upper arm go numb. Q danced backward. I followed. He swung a close-fisted right-handed punch. I blocked it. He chopped with his left hand. I blocked with my right forearm. Q danced back, whirled, and unleashed a left-footed kick. I ducked caught his leg as it passed over and dumped him on the sand. Q jumped up. I knocked him down with a short left hook. He rolled away and scrambled to his knees. I kicked him behind his left ear, pulling the blow enough to leave him conscious. Too conscious, I realized a second later, as he ran four fingers under my guard in an attempted heart jab. Instead, he bruised the layers of muscle under my right breast. I punched him full force in the mouth, sending blood spraying as he rolled to the waterline and lay still. Behind us, people ran toward the exit portal, calling to the few others to get the police. I lifted Johnny's would-be assassin by his cue, dragged him to the edge of the aisle, and dipped his face in the water until he came to. Then I rolled him over and lifted him by his torn and stained shirt front. We would have only a minute or two until someone arrived. Q stared up at me with a glazed stare. I shook him once and leaned close. Listen, my friend, I whispered. We're going to have a short but sincere conversation. We'll start with who you are and why you're bothering the guy you were following. I felt the surge of current before I saw the blue. I cursed and let go of his shirt front. The electrical nimbus seemed to surround Q's entire body at once. I jumped back, but not before my own hair stood on end and surge control alarms on my comm log chirped urgently. Q opened his mouth to scream, and I could see the blue within like a poorly done hollow special effect. His shirt front sizzled, blackened, and burst into flame. Beneath it, his chest grew blue spots like an ancient film burning through. The spots widened, joined, widened again. I looked into his chest cavity and saw organs melting in blue flame. He screamed again, audibly this time, and I watched as teeth and eyes collapsed into blue fire. I took another step back. Q was burning now, the orange-red flame superseding the blue glow. His flesh exploded outward with flame as if his bones had ignited. Within a minute he was a smoking caricature of charred flesh, the body reduced to the ancient dwarf boxer posture of burning victims everywhere. I turned away and put a hand over my mouth, searching the faces of the few watchers to see if any of them could have done this. Wide, frightened eyes stared back. Far above, gray security uniforms burst from the forecaster. Damn! I looked around. The tree sails surged and billowed overhead. Radiant gossamers, beautiful even in daylight, flitted among tropical vegetation of a hundred hues. Sunlight danced on blue ocean. The way to both portals was blocked. The security guard leading the group had drawn a weapon. I was to the first hawking mat in three strides trying to remember from my one ride two decades earlier how the flight threads were activated. I tapped designs in desperation. The hawking mat went rigid and lifted ten centimeters off the beach. I could hear the shouts now as security guards reached the edge of the crowd. A woman in gaudy Renaissance minor garb pointed my way. I jumped off the hawking mat, gathered up the other seven mats, and jumped aboard my own. Barely able to find the flight designs under the tumble of rugs, I slapped the forward controls until the mat lurched into flight, almost tumbling me off as it rose. Fifty meters out, thirty meters high, I dumped the other mats into the sea and swiveled to see what was happening on the beach. Several gray uniforms were huddled around the burned remains. Another pointed a silver wand in my direction. Delicate needles of pain tingled along my arm, shoulders, and neck. My eyelids drooped, and I almost slid off the mat to my right. 
I gripped the far side with my left hand, slumped forward, and tapped at the ascent design with fingers made of wood. Climbing again, I fumbled at my right sleeve for my own stunner. The wristband was empty. A minute later, I sat up and shook off most of the effects of the stun, although my fingers still burned and I had a fierce headache. The modal aisle was far behind, shrinking more each second. A century ago, the island would have been driven by the bands of dolphins brought here originally during the Hegira, but the hegemony pacification program during the Siri Rebellion had killed off most of the aquatic mammals, and now the islands wandered listlessly, carrying their cargo of web tourists and resort owners. I checked the horizons for another island, a hint of one of the rare mainlands. Nothing. Or, rather, blue sky, endless ocean, and soft brushstrokes of clouds far to the west. Or was it to the east? I pulled my comm log off my belt lock and keyed in general datasphere access, then stopped. If the authorities had chased me this far, the next step would be to pinpoint my location and send out a skimmer or security EMV. I wasn't sure if they could trace my comm log when I logged in, but I saw no reason to help them. I thumbed the comm link on standby and looked around again. Good move, Braun. Poking along at two hundred meters on a three-century-old hawking mat with who knows how many, or how few, hours of charge in its flight threads, possibly a thousand clicks or more from land of any sort. And lost. Great. I crossed my arms and sat back to think. M. Lamia? Johnny's soft voice almost made me jump off the mat. Johnny? I stared at the comm log. It was still on standby. The general comm frequency indicator was dark. Johnny, is that you? Of course. I thought you'd never turn your comm log on. How did you trace me? What band are you calling on? Never mind that. Where are you headed? I laughed and told him that I didn't have the slightest idea. Can you help? Wait. There was the briefest second of pause. All right, I have you on one of the weather mapping sats. A terribly primitive thing. Good thing your hawking man has a passive transponder. I stared at the rug that was the only thing between me and a long, loud fall to the sea. It does. Can the others track me? They could, said Johnny but I'm jamming this particular signal. Now where do you want to go? Home. I'm not sure if that's wise after the death of, ah, uh, our suspect. I squinted, suddenly suspicious. How do you know about that? I didn't say anything. Be serious, M. Lamia. The security bands are full of it on Six Worlds. They have a reasonable description of you. Shit. Precisely. Now, where would you like to go? Where are you? I asked. My place? No. I left there when the security bands mentioned you. I'm... near a farcaster. That's where I need to be. I looked around again. Ocean, sky, a hint of clouds. At least no fleets of EMVs. All right, said Johnny's disembodied voice. There's a powered-down force multiportal less than ten clicks from your present location. I shielded my eyes and rotated 360 degrees. The hell there is, I said. I don't know how far away the horizon is on this world, but it's at least forty clicks, and I can't see anything. Submersible base, said Johnny. Hang on, I'm going to take control. The hawking mat lurched again, dipped once, and then fell steadily. I held on with both hands and resisted the urge to scream. Submersible, I called against the wind rush. How far? Do you mean how deep? Yeah. Eight fathoms. I converted the archaic units to meters. This time I did scream. That's almost fourteen meters underwater. Where else do you expect a submersible to be? What the hell do you expect me to do, hold my breath? The ocean rushed toward me. Not necessary, said my comm log. The hawking mat has a primitive crash field. It should easily hold for a mere eight fathoms. Please hang on. I hung on. Johnny was waiting for me when I arrived. The submersible had been dark and dank with the sweat of abandonment. 
The Farcaster had been of a military variety I'd never seen before. It was a relief to step into sunlight and a city street with Johnny waiting. I told him what had happened with Q. We walked empty streets past old buildings. The sky was pale blue, fading toward evening. No one was in sight. Hey, I said, stopping. Where are we? It was an incredibly earth-like world, but the sky, the gravity, the texture of the place was like nothing I'd visited. Johnny smiled. I'll let you guess. Let's walk some more. There were ruins to our left as we walked down a wide street. I stopped and stared. That's the Colosseum, I said. The Roman Colosseum on Old Earth. I looked around at the aging buildings, the cobblestone streets, and the trees swaying slightly in a soft breeze. This is a reconstruction of the old earth city of Rome, I said, trying to keep the astonishment out of my voice. New earth? I knew at once that it wasn't. I'd been to new earth numerous times, and the sky tones, smells, and gravity had not been like this. Johnny shook his head. This is nowhere in the web. I stopped walking. That's impossible. By definition, any world which could be reached by Farcaster was in the web. Nonetheless, it is not in the web. Where is it, then? Old Earth. We walked on. Johnny pointed out another ruin. The Forum. Descending a long staircase, he said, Ahead is the Piazza di Spagna, where we'll spend the night. Old Earth, I said. My first comment in twenty minutes. Time travel? That is not possible, Amelia. A theme park, then? Johnny laughed. It was a pleasant laugh, unself-conscious and easy. Perhaps. I don't really know its purpose or function. It is an analog. An analog. I squinted at the red setting sun just visible down a narrow street. It looks like the hollows I've seen of old earth. It feels right, even though I've never been there. It is very accurate. Where is it? I mean, what star? I don't know the number, said Johnny. It's in the Hercules cluster. I managed not to repeat what he said, but I stopped and sat down on one of the steps. With the Hawking Drive, humankind had explored, colonized, and linked with Farcaster worlds across many thousands of light years. But no one had tried to reach the exploding core suns. We had barely crawled out of the cradle of one spiral arm. The Hercules Cluster. Why has the Technicorps built a replica of Rome in the Hercules Cluster? I asked. Johnny sat next to me. We both looked up as a whirling mass of pigeons exploded into flight and wheeled above the rooftops. I don't know, Amelia. There is much that I have not learned, at least partially because I have not been interested until now. Braun, I said. Excuse me. Call me Braun. Johnny smiled and inclined his head. Thank you, Braun. One thing, though. I do not believe that it is a replica of the city of Rome alone. It is all of old earth. I set both hands on the sun-warmed stone of the step I was sitting on. All of old earth? All of its continents? Cities? I believe so. I haven't been out of Italy and England except for a sea voyage between the two but I believe the analog is complete. Why, for God's sake? Johnny nodded slowly. That may indeed be the case. Why don't we go inside and eat and talk more about this? It may relate to who tried to kill me and why. Inside was an apartment in a large house at the foot of the marble stairs. Windows looked out on what Johnny called the piazza, and I could see up the staircase to a large yellow-brown church above, and down to the square where a boat-shaped fountain tossed water into the evening stillness. Johnny said that the fountain had been designed by Bernini, but the name meant nothing to me. The rooms were small but high-ceilinged, with rough but elaborately carved furniture from an era I did not recognize. There was no sign of electricity or modern appliances. The house did not respond when I spoke to it at the door, and again in the apartment upstairs. As dusk fell over the square and city outside the tall windows, 
The only lights were a few street lamps of gas or some more primitive combustible. This is out of old Earth's past, I said, touching the thick pillows. I raised my head, suddenly understanding. Keats died in Italy, early 19th or 20th century. This is then. Yes, early 19th century, 1821 to be precise. The whole world is a museum? Oh, no. Different areas are different eras, of course. It depends upon the analog being pursued. I don't understand. We had moved into a room cluttered with thick furniture, and I sat on an oddly carved couch by a window. A film of gold evening light still touched the spire of the tawny church up the steps. Pigeons wheeled white against blue sky. Are there millions of people, cybrids, living on this fake old earth? I do not believe so, said Johnny. Only the number necessary for the particular analog project. He saw that I still did not understand, and took a breath before continuing. When I awoke here, there were cybrid analogs of Joseph Severn, Dr. Clark, the landlady, Anna Angeletti, young Lieutenant Elton, and a few others. Italian shopkeepers, the owner of the trattoria across the square who used to bring us our food, passers-by, that sort of thing. No more than a score at the most. What happened to them? They were probably recycled. Like the man with the cue. Cue? I suddenly stared across the darkening room at Johnny. He was a cybrid? Without doubt. The self-destruction you described is precisely the way I would rid myself of this cybrid if I had to. My mind was racing. I realized how stupid I had been, how little I had learned about anything. Then it was another AI who tried to kill you. It seems that way. Why? Johnny made a gesture with his hands possibly to erase some quantum of knowledge that died with my cybrid. Something I had learned only recently, and the other AI, or AIs, knew would be destroyed in my systems crash. I stood, paced back and forth, and stopped at the window. The darkness was settling in earnest now. There were lamps in the room, but Johnny made no move to light them, and I preferred the dimness. It made the unreality of what I was hearing even that much more unreal. I looked into the bedroom. The western windows admitted the last of the light. Bedclothes glowed whitely. You died here, I said. He did, said Johnny. I am not he. But you have his memories. Half-forgotten dreams. There are gaps. But you know what he felt. I remember what the designers thought that he felt. Tell me. What? Johnny's skin was very pale in the gloom. His short curls looked black. What it was like to die. What it was like to be reborn. Johnny told me, his voice very soft, almost melodic, lapsing sometimes into an English too archaic to be understood, but far more beautiful to the ear than the hybrid tongue we speak today. He told me what it was like to be a poet obsessed with perfection, far harsher toward his own efforts than even the most vicious critic. And the critics were vicious. His work was dismissed, ridiculed, described as derivative and silly. Too poor to marry the woman he loved, loaning money to his brother in America and thus losing the last chance of financial security. And then the brief glory of growing into the full maturation of his poetic powers, just as he fell prey to the consumption which had claimed his mother and his brother Tom. Then sent off to exile in Italy, reputedly for his health, while knowing all the while it meant a lonely, painful death at the age of twenty-six. He talked of the agony of seeing Fanny's handwriting on the letters he found too painful to open. He talked of the loyalty of the young artist Joseph Severn, who had been chosen as a traveling companion for Keats by friends who had abandoned the poet at the end, of how Severn had nursed the dying man and stayed with him during the final days. He told of the hemorrhages in the night of Dr. Clark bleeding him and prescribing exercise and good air, and of the ultimate religious and personal despair which had led Keats to demand his own epitaph be carved in stone as, Here lies one whose name was writ in water.
Only the dimmest light from below outlined the tall windows. Johnny's voice seemed to float in the night-scented air. He spoke of awakening after his death in the bed where he died, still attended by the loyal Severn and Dr. Clark, of remembering that he was the poet John Keats, the way one remembers an identity from a fast-fading dream, while all the while knowing that he was something else. He told of the illusion continued, the trip back to England, the reunion with the Fanny who was not Fanny, and the near mental breakdown this had engendered. He told of his inability to write further poetry, of his increasing estrangement from the cybrid impostors, of his retreat into something resembling catatonia combined with hallucinations of his true AI existence in the nearly incomprehensible, to a nineteenth-century poet, Technicor, and of the ultimate crumbling of the illusion and the abandonment of the Keats project. In truth, he said, the entire evil charade made me think of nothing so much as a passage in a letter I wrote, he wrote, to his brother George some time before his illness. Keats said, May there not be superior beings amused with any graceful, though instinctive attitude my mind may fall into, as I am entertained with the alertness of a stoat or the anxiety of a deer? Though a quarrel in the streets is a thing to be hated, the energies displayed in it are fine. By a superior being, our reasonings may take the same tone. Though erroneous, they may be fine. This is the very thing in which consists poetry. You think the Keats project was evil? I asked. Anything which deceives is evil, I believe. Perhaps you are more John Keats than you are willing to admit. No. The absence of poetic instinct showed otherwise even in the midst of the most elaborate illusion. I looked at the dark outlines of shapes in the dark house. Do the A.I.s know that we're here? Probably. Almost surely. There is no place that I can go that the Technicore cannot trace and follow. But it was the web authorities and brigands from whom we fled, no? But you know now that it was someone, some intelligence in the Technicore, who assaulted you. Yes, but only in the web. Such violence in the core would not be tolerated. There came a noise from the street. A pigeon, I hoped. Wind blowing trash across cobblestones, perhaps. I said, how will the Technicore respond to my being here? I have no idea. Surely it must be a secret. It is. Something they consider irrelevant to humanity. I shook my head, a futile gesture in the darkness. The recreation of old earth. The resurrection of how many? Human personalities as cybrids on this recreated world. A.I.s killing A.I.s. Irrelevant. I laughed, but managed to keep the laughter under control. Jesus wept, Johnny. Almost certainly. I moved to the window, not caring what sort of target I would afford anyone in the dark street below, and fumbled out a cigarette. They were damp from the afternoon's chase through the snowdrifts, but one lighted when I struck it. Johnny, earlier when you said that the old earth analog was complete, I said, why for God's sake? And you said something like, that may be the case. Was that just a wise-ass comment, or did you mean something? I mean that it might indeed be for God's sake. Explain. Johnny sighed in the darkness. I don't understand the exact purpose of the Keats Project or the other old earth analogs, but I suspect that it is part of a Technicore project going back at least seven standard centuries to realize the ultimate intelligence. The ultimate intelligence, I said, exhaling smoke. Uh-huh. So the Technicore is trying to... what? To build God? Yes. Why? There is no simple answer, Braun any more than there is a simple answer to the question of why humankind has sought God in a million guises for ten thousand generations. But with the core, the interest lies more in the quest for more efficiency, more reliable ways to handle... variables. But the Technicore can draw on itself in the megadatasphere of two hundred worlds. And there still will be blanks in the predictive powers. I threw my cigarette out the window, watching the ember fall into the night. The breeze was suddenly cold. I hugged my arms. How does all this, Old Earth, the Resurrection Projects, the Cybrids, 
How does it lead to creating the ultimate intelligence? I don't know, Braun. Eight standard centuries ago, at the beginning of the first information age, a man named Norbert Wiener wrote, Can God play a significant game with his own creature? Can any creator, even a limited one, play a significant game with his own creature? Humanity dealt with this inconclusively with their early AIs. The core wrestles with it in the resurrection projects. Perhaps the UI program has been completed, and all of this remains a function of the ultimate creature-creator, a personality whose motives are as far beyond the core's understanding as the core's are beyond humanity's. I started to move in the dark room, bumped a low table with my knee, and remained standing. None of which tells us who is trying to kill you, I said. No. Johnny rose and moved to the far wall. A match flared and he lighted a candle. Our shadows wavered on the walls and ceiling. Johnny came closer and softly gripped my upper arms. The soft light painted his curls and eyelashes copper and touched his high cheekbones and firm chin. Why are you so tough? he asked. I stared at him. His face was only inches from mine. We were the same height. Let go, I said. Instead, he leaned forward and kissed me. His lips were soft and warm, and the kiss seemed to last for hours. He's a machine, I thought. Human, but a machine behind that. I closed my eyes. His soft hand touched my cheek, my neck, the back of my head. Listen, I whispered when we broke apart for an instant. Johnny did not let me finish. He lifted me in his arms and carried me into the other room the tall bed, the soft mattress and deep comforter. The candlelight from the other room flickered and danced as we undressed each other in a sudden urgency. We made love three times that night, each time responding to slow, sweet imperatives of touch and warmth and closeness and the escalating intensity of sensation. I remember looking down at him the second time. His eyes were closed. Hair fell loosely across his forehead, the candlelight showing the flush across his pale chest his surprisingly strong arms and hands rising to hold me in place. He had opened his eyes that second to look back at me, and I saw only the emotion and passion of that moment reflected there. Sometime before dawn we slept, and just as I turned away and drifted off, I felt the cool touch of his hand on my hip in a movement protective and casual, without being possessive. They hit us just after first light. There were five of them, not Lucian, but heavily muscled, all men, and they worked well together as a team. The first I heard them was when the door to the apartment was kicked open. I rolled out of bed, jumped to the side of the bedroom door, and watched them come through. Johnny sat up and shouted something as the first man leveled a stunner. Johnny had pulled on cotton shorts before going to sleep. I was nude. There are real disadvantages to fighting in the nude when one's opponents are dressed, but the greatest problem is psychological. If you can get over the sense of heightened vulnerability, the rest is easy to compensate for. The first man saw me, decided to stun Johnny anyway, and paid for the mistake. I kicked the weapon out of his hand and clubbed him down with a blow behind the left ear. Two more men pushed into the room. This time both of them were smart enough to deal with me first. Two others leaped for Johnny. I blocked a stiff-fingered jab, parried a kick that would have done real damage, and backed away. There was a tall dresser to my left, and the top drawer came out smooth and heavy. The big man in front of me shielded his face with both arms, so that the thick wood splintered, but the instinctive reaction gave me a second's opening and I took it, putting my entire body into the kick. Number two man grunted and fell back against his partner. Johnny was struggling, but one of the intruders had him around the throat in a chokehold while the other pinned his legs. I came off the floor in a crouch accepted the blow from my number two and leaped across the bed. The guy holding Johnny's legs went through the glass and wood of the window without a word. Someone landed on my back, and I completed the roll across the bed and floor, bringing him up against the wall. He was good. He took the blow on his shoulder and went for a nerve pinch beneath my ear. He had a second of trouble because of the extra layers of muscle there, and I got an elbow deep into his stomach and rolled away. The man choking Johnny dropped him and delivered a textbook perfect kick to my ribs. I took half the impact, feeling at least one rib go, and spun inside, attempting no elegance as I used my left hand to crush his left testicle. 
The man screamed and was out of it. I'd never forgotten the stunner on the floor, and neither had the last of the opposition. He scurried around to the far side of the bed, out of reach, and dropped to all fours to grab the weapon. Definitely feeling the pain from the broken rib now, I lifted the massive bed with Johnny in it and dropped it on the guy's head and shoulders. I went under the bed from my side, retrieved the stunner, and backed into an empty corner. One guy had gone out the window. We were on the second floor. The first man to enter was still lying in the doorway. The guy I'd kicked had managed to get to one knee and both elbows. From the blood on his mouth and chin, I guessed that a rib had punctured a lung. He was breathing very raggedly. The bed had crushed the skull of the other man on the floor. The guy who'd been choking Johnny was curled up near the window, holding his crotch and vomiting. I stunned him into silence and went over to the one I'd kicked and lifted him by the hair. Who sent you? Fuck you. He sprayed some bloody spittle in my face. Maybe later, I said. Again, who sent you? I placed three fingers against his side where the rib cage seemed concave and pressed. The man screamed and went very white. When he coughed, the blood was too red against pale skin. Who sent you? I sent four fingers against his ribs. The bishop. He tried to levitate away from my fingers. What bishop? Shrike Temple. Lucis. Don't, please. Oh, shit. What were you going to do with him? Us. Nothing. Oh, god damn. Don't. I need a medic. Please. Sure. Answer. Stun him. Bring him back to the temple. Lucis. Please. I can't breathe. And me. Kill you if you resisted. Okay, I said, lifting him a little higher by his hair. We're doing fine here. What did they want him for? I don't know. He screamed very loudly. I kept one eye on the doorway to the apartment. The stunner was still in my palm under a fistful of hair. I don't know, he gasped. He was hemorrhaging in earnest now. The EMV. Roof. Where'd you cast in? Don't know. I swear. Some city in the water. Car's set to return there. Please. I ripped at his clothes. No comlog, no other weapons. There was a tattoo of a blue trident just above his heart. Gowanda, I said. Yeah. Parvati Brotherhood. Outside the web. Probably very hard to trace. All of you? Yeah. Please, get me some help. Oh, shit. Please. He sagged, almost unconscious. I dropped him, stepped back, and sprayed the stun beam over him. Johnny was sitting up, rubbing his throat and staring at me with a strange gaze. Get dressed, I said. We're leaving. The EMV was an old, transparent Vicken Scenic with no palm locks on the ignition plate or disc key. We caught up to the Terminator before we had crossed France and looked down on darkness that Johnny said was the Atlantic Ocean. Except for lights of the occasional floating city or drilling platform, the only illumination came from the stars and the broad swimming pool glows of the undersea colonies. Why are we taking their vehicle? asked Johnny. I want to see where they forecast from. He said the Lucis Shrike Temple. Yeah, now we'll see. Johnny's face was barely visible as he looked down at the dark sea twenty clicks below. Do you think those men will die? One was already dead, I said. The guy with the punctured lung will need help. Two of them will be okay. I don't know about the one who went out the window. Do you care? Yes. The violence was barbaric. Though a quarrel in the street is a thing to be hated, the energies displayed in it are fine, I quoted. They weren't cybrids, were they? I think not. So, there are at least two groups out to get you. The A.I.s and the Bishop of the Shrike Temple. And we still don't know why. I do have an idea now. I swiveled in the foam recliner. The constellations above us, familiar neither from hollows of old Earth's skies nor from any web world I knew, cast just enough light to allow me to see Johnny's eyes. 
Tell me, I said. Your mention of Hyperion gave me a clue, he said. The fact that I had no knowledge of it. Its absence said that it was important. The strange case of the dog barking in the night, I said. What? Nothing. Go on. Johnny leaned closer. The only reason that I would not be aware of it is that some elements of the Technicor have blocked my knowledge of it. Your Cybrid. It was strange to talk to Johnny that way now. You spend most of your time in the web, don't you? Yes. Wouldn't you run across mention of Hyperion somewhere? It's in the news every once in a while, especially when the Shrike cult's topical. Perhaps I did hear. Perhaps that is why I was murdered. I lay back and looked at the stars. Let's go ask the bishop, I said. Johnny said that the lights ahead were an analog of New York City in the mid-21st century. He didn't know what resurrection project the city had been rebuilt for. I took the EMV off auto and dropped lower. Tall buildings from the phallic symbol era of urban architecture rose from the swamps and lagoons of the North American littoral. Several had lights burning. Johnny pointed to one decrepit but oddly elegant structure and said, The Empire State Building. Okay, I said. Whatever it is, that's where the EMV wants to land. Is it safe? I grinned at him. Nothing in life's safe. I let the car have its head and we dropped to a small open platform below the building's spire. We got out and stood on the cracked balcony. It was quite dark except for the few building lights far below and the stars. A few paces away, a vague blue glow outlined a farcaster portal where elevator doors may once have been. I'll go first, I said. But Johnny had already stepped through. I palmed the borrowed stunner and followed him. I'd never been in the Shrike Temple on Lucis before, but there was no doubt that we were there now. Johnny stood a few paces ahead of me, but other than him there was no one around. The place was cool and dark and cavernous, if caverns could really be that large. A frightening polychrome sculpture which hung from invisible cables rotated to unfelt breezes. Johnny and I both turned as the Farcaster portal winked out of existence. Well, we did their work for them, didn't we? I whispered to Johnny. Even the whispers seemed to echo in the red-lit hall. I hadn't planned on Johnny casting to the temple with me. The light seemed to come up then, not really illuminating the great hall, but widening its scope so that we could see the semicircle of men there. I remembered that some were called exorcists and others lectors, and there was some other category I forgot. Whoever they were, it was alarming to see them standing there, at least two dozen of them, their robes variations on red and black, and their high foreheads glowing from the red light above. I had no trouble recognizing the bishop. He was from my world, although shorter and fatter than most of us, and his robe was very red. I did not try to hide the stunner. It was possible that if they all tried to rush us, I could bring them all down. Possible, but not probable. I could not see any weapons, but their robes could have hidden entire arsenals. Johnny walked toward the bishop, and I followed. Ten paces from the man, we stopped. The bishop was the only one not standing. His chair was made of wood and looked as if it could be folded so that the intricate arms, supports, back, and legs could be carried in a compact form. One couldn't say the same for the mass of muscle and fat evident under the bishop's robes. Johnny took another step forward. Why did you try to kidnap my cybrid? He spoke to the Shrike cult holy man as if the rest of us were not there. The bishop chuckled and shook his head. My dear entity, it is true that we wished your presence in our place of worship, but you have no evidence that we were involved in any attempt to kidnap you. I'm not interested in evidence, said Johnny. I'm curious as to why you want me here. I heard rustling behind us, and I swiveled quickly. The stunner charged and pointed. But the broad circle of Shrike priests remained motionless. Most were out of the stunner's range. I wished that I had brought my father's projectile weapon with me. The bishop's voice was deep and textured and seemed to fill the huge space. Surely you know that the Church of the Final Atonement has a deep and abiding interest in the world of Hyperion. Yes. 
And surely you are aware that during the past several centuries, the persona of the old earth poet Keats has been woven into the cultural mythos of the Hyperion colony? Yes. So? The bishop rubbed his cheek with a large red ring on one finger. So when you offered to go on the Shrike pilgrimage, we agreed. We were distressed when you reneged on this offer. Johnny's look of amazement was most human. I offered. When? Eight local days ago, said the bishop, in this room. You approached us with the idea. Did I say why I wanted to go on the, the Shrike pilgrimage? You said that it was, I believe the phrase you used was, important for your education. We can show you the recording if you wish. All such conversations in the temple are recorded. Or you may have a duplicate of the recording to view at your own convenience. Yes, said Johnny. The bishop nodded, and an acolyte, or whatever the hell he was, disappeared into the gloom for a moment, and returned with a standard video chip in his hand. The bishop nodded again, and the black-robed man came forward and handed the chip to Johnny. I kept the stunner ready until the guy had returned to the semicircle of watchers. Why did you send the Gowandas after us? I asked. It was the first time I'd spoken in front of the bishop, and my voice sounded too loud and too raw. The Shrike holy man made a gesture with one pudgy hand. M. Keats had expressed an interest in joining our holiest pilgrimage. Since it is our belief that the final atonement is drawing closer each day, this is of no little importance to us. Consequently, our agents reported that M. Keats may have been the victim of one or more assaults, and that a certain private investigator, you, M. Lamia, was responsible for destroying the cybrid bodyguard provided M. Keats by the Technicor. Bodyguard? It was my turn to sound amazed. Of course, said the bishop. He turned toward Johnny. The gentleman with the queue who was recently murdered on the Templar excursion. Was this not the same man whom you introduced as your bodyguard a week earlier? He is visible in the recording. Johnny said nothing. He seemed to be straining to remember something. At any rate, continued the bishop, we must have your answer about the pilgrimage before the week is out. The Sequoia Sempervirens departs from the web in nine local days. But that's a Templar tree ship, said Johnny. They don't make the long leap to Hyperion. The bishop smiled. In this case it does. We have reason to believe that this may be the last church-sponsored pilgrimage, and we have chartered the Templar craft to allow as many of the faithful as possible to make the trip. The bishop gestured, and red and black-robed men faded back into darkness. Two exorcists came forward to fold his stool as the bishop stood. Please give us your answer as soon as possible. He was gone. The remaining exorcist stayed to show us out. There were no more forecasters. We exited by the main door of the temple and stood on the top step of the long staircase, looking down on the concourse mall of Hive Center and breathing in the cool, oil-scented air. My father's automatic was in the drawer where I had left it. I made sure there was a full load of flechettes, palmed the magazine back in, and carried the weapon into the kitchen where breakfast was cooking. Johnny sat at the long table, staring down through gray windows at the loading dock. I carried the omelets over and set one in front of him. He looked up as I poured the coffee. Do you believe him, I asked, that it was your idea? You saw the video recording. Recordings can be faked. Yes, but this one wasn't. Then why did you volunteer to go on this pilgrimage? And why did your bodyguard try to kill you after you talked to the Shrike Church and the Templar captain? Johnny tried the omelet, nodded, and took another forkful. The bodyguard is a complete unknown to me. He must have been assigned to me during the week lost to memory. His real purpose, obviously, was to make sure that I did not discover something, or if I did stumble upon it, to eliminate me. Something in the web or in datum plane? In the web, I presume. We need to know who he, it, worked for and why they assigned him to you. I do know, said Johnny. I just asked. The Corps responds that I requested a bodyguard. The Cybrid was controlled by an AI nexus which corresponds to a security force. 
ask why he tried to kill you. I did. They emphatically deny that such a thing is possible. Then why was this so-called bodyguard slinking around after you a week after the murder? They respond that while I did not request security again after my discontinuity, the Corps authorities felt that it would be prudent to provide protection. I laughed. Some protection. Why the hell did he run on the Templar world when I caught up to him? They aren't even trying to give you a plausible story, Johnny. No. Nor did the bishop explain how the Shrike Church had Farcaster access to Old Earth, or whatever you call that stage-set world. And we did not ask. I didn't ask because I wanted to get out of that damn temple in one piece. Johnny didn't seem to hear. He was sipping his coffee, his gaze focused somewhere else. What? I said. He turned to look at me, tapping his thumbnail on his lower lip. There is a paradox here, Braun. What? If it was truly my aim to go to Hyperion, for my Cybrid to travel there, I could not have remained in the Technicore. I would have had to invest all consciousness in the Cybrid itself. Why? But even as I asked, I saw the reason. Think. Datum plane itself is an abstract, a commingling of computer and AI-generated data spheres and the quasi-perceptual Gibsonian matrix designed originally for human operators, now accepted as common ground for man, machine, and AI. But AI hardware exists somewhere in real space, I said, somewhere in the Technicore. Yes, but that is irrelevant to the function of AI consciousness, said Johnny. I can be anywhere the overlapping data spheres allow me to travel. All of the web worlds, of course, Datum Plane, and any of the Technicore constructs such as Old Earth. But it's only within that milieu that I can claim consciousness or operate sensors or remotes such as this Cybrid. I set my coffee cup down and stared at the thing I had loved as a man during the night just past. Yes? The colony worlds have limited data spheres, said Johnny. While there is some contact with the Technicore via fat line transmissions, it is an exchange of data only, rather like the first information age computer interfaces, rather than a flow of consciousness. Hyperion's data sphere is primitive to the point of non-existence, and from what I can access, the core has no contact whatsoever with that world. Would that be normal? I asked. I mean, with a colony world that far away? No. The core has contact with every colony world with such interstellar barbarians as the Alsters and with other sources the hegemony could not imagine. I sat stunned. With the Alsters? Since the war on Brescia a few years earlier, the Alsters had been the Webb's prime bogeymen. The idea of the core, the same congregation of AIs which advises the Senate and the All Thing, and which allow our entire economy, forecaster system, and technological civilization to run, the idea of the Corps being in touch with the Alsters was frightening. And what the hell did Johnny mean by other sources? I didn't really want to know right then. But you said it is possible for your Cybrid to travel there, I said. What did you mean by investing all consciousness in your Cybrid? Can an AI become human? Can you exist only in your Cybrid? It has been done, Johnny said softly. Once. A personality reconstruction not too different from my own. A twentieth-century poet named Ezra Pound. He abandoned his AI persona and fled from the web in his cybrid. But the Pound reconstruction was insane. Or sane, I said. Yes. So all of the data and personality of an AI can survive in a cybrid's organic brain? Of course not, Braun. Not one percent of one percent of my total consciousness would survive the transition. Organic brains can't process even the most primitive information the way we can. The resultant personality would not be the AI persona. Neither would it be a truly human consciousness or cybrid. Johnny stopped in mid-sentence and turned quickly to look out the window. After a long minute, I said, What is it? I reached out a hand but did not touch him. He spoke without turning. Perhaps I was wrong to say that the consciousness would not be human, he whispered. It is possible that the resulting persona could be human, touched with a certain divine madness and metahuman perspective. It could be. 
if purged of all memory of our age, of all consciousness of the core. It could be the person the cybrid was programmed to be. John Keats, I said. Johnny turned away from the window and closed his eyes. His voice was hoarse with emotion. It was the first time I had heard him recite poetry. Fanatics have their dreams, wherewith they weave a paradise for a sect. The savage, too, from forth the loftiest fashion of his sleep, guesses at heaven. Pity these have not traced upon vellum or wild Indian leaf the shadows of melodious utterance. But bare of laurel they live, dream, and die. For poesy alone can tell her dreams, with the fine spell of words alone can save imagination from the sable charm and dumb enchantment. Who alive can say, Thou art no poet, mayst not tell thy dreams? Since every man whose soul is not a clod hath visions, and would speak if he had loved, and been well nurtured in his mother tongue. Whether the dream now proposed to rehearse be poets or fanatics will be known when this warm scribe my hand is in the grave. I don't get it, I said. What does it mean? It means, said Johnny, smiling gently, that I know what decision I made and why I made it. I wanted to cease being a cybrid and become a man. I wanted to go to Hyperion. I still do. Somebody killed you for that decision a week ago, I said. Yes. And you're going to try again? Yes. Why not invest consciousness in your cybrid here? Become human in the web? It would never work, said Johnny. What you see as a complex interstellar society is only a small part of the core reality matrix. I would be constantly confronted with and at the mercy of the AIs. The Keats persona, reality, would never survive. All right, I said. You need to get out of the web. But there are other colonies. Why Hyperion? Johnny took my hand. His fingers were long and warm and strong. Don't you see, Braun? There is some connection here. It may well be that Keats's dreams of Hyperion were some sort of transtemporal communication between his then persona and his now persona. If nothing else, Hyperion is the key mystery of our age, physical and poetic. And it is quite probable that he, that I, was born, died, and was born again to explore it. It sounds like madness to me, I said. Delusions of grandeur. Almost certainly, laughed Johnny. And I never have been happier. He grabbed my arms and brought me to my feet, his arms around me. Will you go with me, Braun? Go with me to Hyperion? I blinked in surprise, both at his question and the answer which filled me like a rush of warmth. Yes, I said. I'll go. We went into the sleeping area then and made love the rest of that day, sleeping finally to awaken to the low light of Ship 3 in the industrial trench outside. Johnny was lying on his back, his hazel eyes open and staring at the ceiling, lost in thought. But not so lost he did not smile and put his arm around me. I nestled my cheek against him, settling into the small curve where shoulder meets chest, and went back to sleep. I was wearing my best clothes a suit of black whipcord, a blouse woven of Renaissance silk with a Carvnell bloodstone at the throat, a cocked Eulen Bray tricorn, when Johnny and I farcast to T.C. Squared the next day. I left him in the wood and brass bar near the central terminex, but not before I slid Dad's automatic across to him in a paper bag and told him to shoot anyone who even looked cross-eyed at him. Web English is such a subtle tongue, he said. That phrase is older than the web, I said. Just do it. I squeezed his hand and left without looking back. I took a skycab to the administration complex and walked my way through about nine security checks before they let me into the center grounds. I walked the half-click across Deer Park, admiring the swans in the nearby lake and the white buildings on the hilltop in the distance, and then there were nine more checkpoints before a center security woman led me up the flagstone path to Government House, a low, graceful building set amid flower gardens and landscaped hills. There was an elegantly furnished waiting room, but I barely had time to sit down on an authentic pre hegira de Kooning before an aide appeared and ushered me into the CEO's private office. 
Now Enoch Gladstone came around the desk to shake my hand and show me to a chair. It was strange to see her in person again, after all those years of watching her on HTV. She was even more impressive in the flesh. Her hair was cut short but seemed to be blowing back in gray-white waves. Her cheeks and chin were as sharp and Lincoln-esque as all the history-prone pundits insisted, but it was the large, sad brown eyes which dominated the face and made one feel as if he or she were in the presence of a truly original person. I found that my mouth was dry. Thank you for seeing me, M. Executive. I know how busy you are. I'm never too busy to see you, Braun, just as your father was never too busy to see me when I was a junior senator. I nodded. Dad had once described Maina Gladstone as the only political genius in the hegemony. He knew that she would be CEO someday despite her late start in politics. I wished Dad had lived to see it. How is your mother, Braun? She's well, M. Executive. She rarely leaves our old summer place on Freeholm anymore, but I see her every Christmas fest. Gladstone nodded. She had been sitting casually on the edge of a massive desk which the tabloid said had once belonged to an assassinated president. Not Lincoln, of the pre-mistake USA. But now she smiled and went around to the simple chair behind it. I miss your father, Braun. I wish he were in this administration. Did you see the lake when you came in? Yes. Do you remember sailing toy boats there with Mike Creston when you were both toddlers? Just barely, M. Executive. I was pretty young. Maina Gladstone smiled. An intercom chimed, but she waved it into silence. How can I help you, Braun? I took a breath. M. Executive, you may be aware that I'm working as an independent private investigator. I didn't wait for her nod. A case I've been working on recently has led me back to Dad's suicide. Braun, you know that was investigated most thoroughly. I saw the commission's report. Yeah, I said. I did too. But recently I've discovered some very strange things about the Technicore and its attitude toward the world Hyperion. Weren't you and Dad working on a bill that would have brought Hyperion into the Hegemony Protectorate? Gladstone nodded. Yes, Braun, but there were over a dozen other colonies being considered that year. None were allowed in. Right. But did the Corps or the AI Advisory Council take a special interest in Hyperion? The CEO tapped a stylus against her lower lip. What kind of information do you have, Braun? I started to answer, but she held up a blunt finger. Wait. She keyed an interactive. Thomas, I'll be stepping out for a few minutes. Please be sure that the Sol Draconi trade delegation is entertained if I fall a bit behind schedule. I didn't see or key anything else, but suddenly a blue and gold Farcaster portal hummed into life near the far wall. She gestured me to go through first. A plain of gold, knee-high grass stretched to horizons which seemed farther away than most. The sky was a pale yellow with burnished copper streaks which may have been clouds. I didn't recognize the world. Maina Gladstone stepped through and touched the comlog design on her sleeve. The Farcaster portal winked out. A warm breeze blew spice scents to us. Gladstone touched her sleeve again, glanced skyward, and nodded. I'm sorry for the inconvenience, Braun. Castrop Roxel has no data sphere or sats of any kind. Now please go ahead with what you were saying. What kind of information have you come across? I looked around at the empty grasslands. Nothing to warrant this security, probably. I've just discovered that the Technicore seems very interested in Hyperion. They've also built some sort of analog to old Earth. An entire world. If I expected shock or surprise, I was disappointed. Gladstone nodded. Yes, we know about the old Earth analog. I was shocked. Then why hasn't it ever been announced? If the Corps can rebuild old Earth, a lot of people would be interested. Gladstone began walking, and I strolled with her, walking faster to keep up with her long-legged strides. Braun, it would not be in the hegemony's interest to announce such a thing. Our best human intelligence sources have no idea why the Corps is doing such a thing. They have offered no insight. The best policy now is to wait. What information do you have about Hyperion? 
I had no idea whether I could trust Maina Gladstone, old times or not. But I knew that if I was going to get information, I would have to give some. They built an analog reconstruction of an old earth poet, I said, and they seem obsessed with keeping any information about Hyperion away from him. Gladstone picked a long stem of grass and sucked on it. The John Keats hybrid. Yes. I was careful not to show surprise this time. I know that Dad was pushing hard to get protectorate status for Hyperion. If the Corps has some special interest in the place, they may have had something to do, may have manipulated. His apparent suicide? Yeah. The wind moved gold grass in waves. Something very small scurried away in the stalks at our feet. It is not beyond the realm of possibility, Braun. But there was absolutely no evidence. Tell me what this cybrid is going to do. First, tell me why the core is so interested in Hyperion. The older woman spread her hands. If we knew that, Braun, I would sleep much easier nights. As far as we know, the Technicore has been obsessed with Hyperion for centuries. When CEO Yevshensky allowed King Billy of Asquith to recolonize the planet, it almost precipitated a true secession of AIs from the web. Recently, the establishment of our fatline transmitter there brought about a similar crisis. But the AIs didn't secede. No, Braun, it appears that, for whatever reason, they need us almost as badly as we need them. But if they're so interested in Hyperion, why don't they allow it into the web so they can go there themselves? Gladstone ran a hand through her hair. The bronze clouds far above rippled in what must be a fantastic jet stream. They are adamant about Hyperion not being admitted to the web, she said. It is an interesting paradox. Tell me what the Cybrid is going to do. First, tell me why the Corps is obsessed with Hyperion. We do not know for sure. Best guess, then. CEO Gladstone removed the stem of grass from her mouth and regarded it. We believe that the Corps is embarked on a truly incredible project, which would allow them to predict everything to handle every variable of space, time, and history as a quantum of manageable information. Their ultimate intelligence project, I said, knowing that I was being careless and not caring. This time CEO Gladstone did register shock. How do you know about that? What does that project have to do with Hyperion? Gladstone sighed. We don't know for sure, Braun. But we do know that there is an anomaly on Hyperion which they have not been able to factor into their predictive analyses. Do you know about the so-called time tombs that the Shrike Church holds holy? Sure. They've been off limits to tourists for a while. Yes. Because of an accident to a researcher there a few decades ago, our scientists have confirmed that the anti-entropic fields around the tombs are not merely a protection against time's erosive effects as has been widely believed. What are they? the remnants of a field or force which has actually propelled the tombs and their contents backward in time from some distant future. Contents, I managed, but the tombs are empty, ever since they were discovered. Empty now, said Maina Gladstone. But there is evidence that they were full, will be full when they open, in our near future. I stared at her. How near? Her dark eyes remained soft, but the movement of her head was final. I have told you too much already, Braun. You are forbidden to repeat it. We'll ensure that silence if necessary. I hid my own confusion by finding a piece of grass to strip for chewing. All right, I said. What's going to come out of the tombs? Aliens? Bombs? Some sort of reverse time capsules? Gladstone smiled tightly. If we knew that, Braun, we would be ahead of the Corps, and we are not. The smile disappeared. One hypothesis is that the tombs relate to some future war, a settling of future scores by rearranging the past, perhaps. A war between who, for Christ's sakes? She opened her hands again. We need to be getting back, Braun. Would you please tell me what the Keats hybrid is going to do now? 
I looked down and then back up to meet her steady gaze. I couldn't trust anyone, but the Corps and the Shrike Church already knew Johnny's plans. If this was a three-sided game, perhaps each side should know in case there was a good guy in the bunch. He's going to invest all consciousness in the Cybrid, I said, rather clumsily. He's going to become human, M. Gladstone, and then go to Hyperion. I'm going with him. The CEO of the Senate and all thing, chief officer for a government which spanned almost two hundred worlds and billions of people, stared at me in silence for a long moment. Then she said, He plans to go with the Templar ship on the pilgrimage, then? Yes. No, said Meinar Gladstone. What do you mean? I mean that these Sequoia Sempervirens will not be allowed to leave hegemony space. There will be no pilgrimage unless the Senate decides it is in our interest. Her voice was iron hard. Johnny and I'll go by spinship, I said. The pilgrimage is a loser's game anyway. No, she said. There will be no more civilian spinships to Hyperion for some time. The word civilian tipped me. War? Gladstone's lips were tight. She nodded. Before most spin ships could reach the region. A war with the Ousters? Initially. View it as a way to force the issue between the Technicore and ourselves, Braun. We will either have to incorporate the Hyperion system into the web to allow it force protection, or it will fall to a race which despises and distrusts the core and all AIs. I didn't mention Johnny's comment that the Corps had been in touch with the Ousters. I said, A way to force the issue. Fine. But who manipulated the Ousters into attacking? Gladstone looked at me. If her face was Lincoln-esque at that moment, then Old Earth's Lincoln was one tough son of a bitch. It's time to get back, Braun. You appreciate how important it is that none of this information gets out. I appreciate the fact that you wouldn't have told me unless you had a reason to, I said. I don't know who you want this stuff to go to, but I know I'm a messenger, not a confidant. Don't underestimate our resolve to keep this classified, Braun. I laughed. Lady, I wouldn't underestimate your resolve in anything. Maina Gladstone gestured for me to step through the Farcaster portal first. I know a way we can discover what the Corps is up to, said Johnny, as we rode alone in a rented jet boat on Mare Infinitus. But it would be dangerous. So what else is new? I'm serious. We should only attempt it if we feel that it is imperative to understand what the Corps fears from Hyperion. I do. We will need an operative. Someone who is an artist in datum plane operations. Someone smart, but not so smart that they won't take a chance. And someone who would risk everything and keep the secret just for the ultimate in cyberpuke pranks. I grinned at Johnny. I've got just the man. B.B. lived alone in a cheap apartment at the base of a cheap tower in a cheap T.C. squared neighborhood. But there was nothing cheap about the hardware that filled most of the space in the four-room flat. Most of B.B.'s salary for the past standard decade had gone into state-of-the-art cyberpuke toys. I started by saying that we wanted him to do something illegal. B.B. said that, as a public employee, he couldn't consider such a thing. He asked what the thing was. Johnny began to explain. B.B. leaned forward, and I saw the old cyberpuke gleam in his eyes from our college days. I half expected him to try to dissect Johnny right there just to see how a cybrid worked. Then Johnny got to the interesting part, and B.B.'s gleam turned into a sort of green glow. When I self-destruct my AI persona, said Johnny, the shift to cybered consciousness will take only nanoseconds. But during that time, my section of the core perimeter defenses will drop. The security phages will fill the gap before too many more nanoseconds pass, but during that time... Entry to the core, whispered BB, his eyes glowing like some antique BDT. It would be very dangerous, stressed Johnny. To my knowledge, no human operator has ever penetrated core periphery. B.B. rubbed his upper lip. There's a legend that Cowboy Gibson did it before the core seceded, he mumbled. But nobody believes it. And Cowboy disappeared. Even if you penetrate, said Johnny, 
there would be insufficient time to access except for the fact that I had the data coordinates. Fan-fucking-tastic, whispered B.B. He turned back to his console and reached for his shunt. Let's do it. Now, I said. Even Johnny looked taken aback. Why wait? B.B. clicked in his shunt and attached metacortex leads, but left the deck idling. Are we doing this or what? I went over next to Johnny on the couch and took his hand. His skin was cool. He showed no expression now, but I could imagine what it must be like to be facing imminent destruction of one's personality in previous existence. Even if the transfer worked, the human with the John Keats persona would not be Johnny. He's right, said Johnny. Why wait? I kissed him. All right, I said. I'm going in with Bibi. No! Johnny squeezed my hand. You can't help, and the danger would be terrible. I heard my own voice, as implacable as Meina Gladstone's. Perhaps. But I can't ask Bibi to do this if I won't. And I won't leave you in there alone. I squeezed his hand a final time and went over to sit by Bibi at the console. How do I connect with this fucking thing, Bibi? You've read all the cyberpuke stuff. You know all about the terrible beauty of Danum Plain, the three-dimensional highways with their landscapes of black ice and neon perimeters, and day-glow strange loops and shimmering skyscrapers of data blocks under hovering clouds of AI presence. I saw all of it riding piggyback on BB's carrier wave. It was almost too much, too intense, too terrifying. I could hear the black threats of the hulking security phages. I could smell death on the breath of the counter-thrust tapeworm viruses even through the ice screens. I could feel the weight of the AI's wrath above us. We were insects under elephants' feet. And we hadn't even done anything yet except travel approved dataways on a logged-in access errand Bibi had dreamed up. Some homework stuff for his flow control records and statistics job. And I was wearing stick-on leads, seeing things in a datum plain version of fuzzy black and white TV while Johnny and Bibi were viewing full Stim Sim Hala, as it were. I don't know how they took it. Okay, whispered Bibi in some datum plain equivalent of a whisper. We're here. Where? All I saw was an infinite maze of bright lights and even brighter shadows, ten thousand cities arrayed in four dimensions. Corporiphery, whispered Bibi. Hang on, it's about time. I had no arms to hang on to and nothing physical in this universe to grasp, but I concentrated on the waveform shades that were our data truck and clung. Johnny died then. I've seen a nuclear explosion firsthand. When Dad was a senator, he took Mom and me to Olympus Command School to see a force demonstration. For the last course, the audience viewing pod was forecast to some godforsaken world, Armagast, I think and a force-ground recon platoon fired a clean tactical nuke at a pretend adversary some nine clicks away. The viewing pod was shielded with a Class 10 containment field, polarized. The nuke only a 50-kiloton field tactical, but I'll never forget the blast. The shock wave rocking the 80-ton pod like a leaf on its repellers. The physical shock of light so obscenely bright that it polarized our field to midnight and still brought tears to our eyes and clamored to get in. This was worse. A section of datum plane seemed to flash and then to implode on itself. Reality flushed down a drain of pure black. Hang on, B.B. screamed against datum plane static that rasped at my bones, and we were whirling, tumbling, sucked into the vacuum like insects in an oceanic vortex. Somehow, incredibly, impossibly, black-armored phages thrust toward us through the din and madness. B.B. avoided one, turned the other's acid membranes against itself. We were being sucked into something colder and blacker than any void in our reality could ever be. There, called Bibi, his voice analog almost lost in the tornado rush of ripping datasphere. There what? Then I saw it. A thin line of yellow rippling in the turbulence like a cloth banner in a hurricane. Bibi rolled us, found our own wave to carry us against the storm, matched coordinates that danced past me too quickly to see and we were riding the yellow band into... Into what? Frozen fountains of fireworks. Transparent mountain ranges of data. Endless glaciers of ROM works. 
access ganglia spreading like fissures, iron clouds of semi-sentient internal process bubbles, glowing pyramids of primary source stuff, each guarded by lakes of black ice and armies of black pulse phages. Shit, I whispered to no one in particular. Phoebe followed the yellow band down, in, through. I felt a connection as if someone had suddenly given us a great mass to carry. Got it, screamed Bibi, and suddenly there was a sound louder and larger than the maelstrom of noise surrounding and consuming us. It was neither klaxon nor siren, but it was both in its tone of warning and aggression. We were climbing out of it all. I could see a vague wall of gray through the brilliant chaos and somehow knew it to be the periphery, the vacuum dwindling but still breaching the wall like a shrinking black stain. We were climbing out but not quickly enough. The phages hit us from five sides. During the twelve years I've been an investigator, I've been shot once, knifed twice. I've had more than this one rib broken. This hurt more than all that combined. B.B. was fighting and climbing at the same time. My contribution to the emergency was to scream. I felt cold claws on us, pulling us down, back into the brightness and noise and chaos. B.B. was using some program, some formula of enchantment to fight them off, but not enough. I could feel the blows slamming home, not against me primarily, but connecting to the matrix analog that was B.B. We were sinking back. Inexorable forces had us in tow. Suddenly, I felt Johnny's presence, and it was as if a huge, strong hand had scooped us up lifted us through the periphery wall an instant before the stain snapped our lifeline to existence and the defensive field crashed together like steel teeth. We moved at impossible speed down congested dataways, passing datum plane couriers and other operator analogs like an EMV ripping past ox carts. Then we were approaching a slow time gate, leapfrogging gridlocked exiting operator analogs in some four-dimensional high jump. I felt the inevitable nausea of transition as we came up out of the matrix. Light burned my retinas. Real light. Then the pain washed in and I slumped over the console and groaned. Come on, Braun. It was Johnny, or someone just like Johnny, helping me to my feet and moving us both toward the door. Bebe, I gasped. No. I opened aching eyes long enough to see B.B. Serbringer draped across his console. His Stetson had fallen off and rolled to the floor. B.B.'s head had exploded, spattering most of the console with gray and red. His mouth was open and a thick white foam still issued from it. It looked like his eyes had melted. Johnny caught me, half lifted me. We have to go, he whispered. Someone will be here any minute. I closed my eyes and let him take me away from there. I awoke to dim red light and the sound of water dripping. I smelled sewage, mildew, and the ozone of uninsulated fiber optic cables. I opened one eye. We were in a low space, more cave than room, with cables snaking from a shattered ceiling and pools of water on the slime cake tiles. The red light came from somewhere beyond the cave. A maintenance access shaft, perhaps, or auto mech tunnel. I moaned softly. Johnny was there, moving from the rough bedroll of blankets to my side. His face was darkened with grease or dirt, and there was at least one fresh cut. Where are we? He touched my cheek. His other arm went around my shoulders and helped me to a sitting position. The awful view shifted and tilted, and for a moment I thought I was going to be sick. Johnny helped me drink water from a plastic tumbler. Dreg's hive, said Johnny. I'd guessed even before I was fully conscious. Dreg's hive is the deepest pit on Lucis, a no-man's land of mech tunnels and illegal burrows occupied by half the web's outcasts and outlaws. It was in Dreg's hive that I'd been shot several years ago and still bore the laser scar above my left hip bone. I held the tumbler out for more water. Johnny fetched some from a steel therm and came back. I panicked for a second as I fumbled in my tunic pocket and on my belt. Dad's automatic was gone. 
Johnny held the weapon up and I relaxed, accepting the cup and drinking thirstily. B.B., I said, hoping for a moment that it had all been a terrible hallucination. Johnny shook his head. There were defenses that neither of us had anticipated. B.B.'s incursion was brilliant, but he couldn't outfight core omegaphages. But half the operators in Datum Plain felt echoes of the battle. B.B. is already the stuff of legend. Fucking great, I said, and gave a laugh that sounded suspiciously like the beginning of a sob. The stuff of legend. And B.B.'s dead. For fuck all nothing. Johnny's arm was tight around me. Not for nothing, Braun. He made the grab, and passed the data to me before he died. I managed to sit fully upright and to look at Johnny. He seemed the same, the same soft eyes, same hair, same voice. But something was subtly different, deeper. More human? You, I said. Did you make the transfer? Are you... Human. John Keats smiled at me. Yes, Braun. Or as close to human as someone forged in the core could ever be. But you remember. Me. Bibi. What's happened? Yes. And I remember first looking into Chapman's Homer. And my brother Tom's eyes as he hemorrhaged in the night. And Severn's kind voice when I was too weak to open my own eyes to face my fate and our night in Piazza di Spagna, when I touched your lips and imagined Fanny's cheek against mine. I remember, Braun. For a second I was confused, and then hurt, but then he set his palm against my cheek, and he touched me. There was no one else, and I understood. I closed my eyes. Why are we here? I whispered against his shirt. I couldn't risk using a farcaster. The Corps could trace us at once. I considered the spaceport, but you were in no condition to travel. I chose the dregs. I nodded against him. They'll try to kill you. Yes. Are the local cops after us? The hegemony police? Transit cops? No, I don't think so. The only ones who have challenged us so far were two bands of Gwandas and some of the dregs dwellers. I opened my eyes. What happened with the Gowandas? There were more deadly hoodlums and contract killers in the web, but I'd never run across any. Johnny held up Dad's automatic and smiled. I don't remember anything after B.B., I said. You were injured by the phage backlash. You could walk, but we were the cause of more than a few odd looks in the concourse. I bet. Tell me about what B.B. discovered. Why is the Corps obsessed with Hyperion? Eat first, said Johnny. It's been more than twenty-eight hours. He crossed the dripping width of the cave room and returned with a self-heating packet. It was basic hollow fanatic fare. Flash-dried and reheated cloned beef, potatoes which had never seen soil, and carrots which looked like some sort of deep-sea slugs. Nothing had ever tasted so good. Okay, I said. Tell me. The Technocore has been divided into three groups for as long as the Corps has existed, said Johnny. The stables are the old line AIs, some of them dating back to pre-mistake days. At least one of them gained sentience in the first information age. The stables argue that a certain level of symbiosis is necessary between humanity and the Corps. They've promoted the Ultimate Intelligence Project as a way to avoid rash decisions, to delay until all variables can be factored. The Volatiles are the force behind the secession three centuries ago. The Volatiles have done conclusive studies that show how humankind's usefulness is past, and from this point on, human beings constitute a threat to the Corps. They advocate immediate and total extinction. Extinction, I said. After a moment, I asked, Can they do it? Of humans in the web, yes, said Johnny. Core intelligences not only create the infrastructure for hegemony society, but are necessary for everything from force deployment to the fail-safes on stockpile nuclear and plasma arsenals. Did you know about this when you were in the Corps? No, said Johnny. As a pseudo-poet cybrid retrieval project, I was a freak, a pet, 
a partial thing allowed to roam the web the way a pet is let out of the house each day. I had no idea there were three camps of AI influence. Three camps, I said. What's the third? And where does Hyperion come in? Between the stables and the volatiles are the ultimates. For the past five centuries, the ultimates have been obsessed with the UI project. The existence or extinction of the human race is of interest to them only in how it applies to the project. To this date, they have been a force for moderation, an ally of the stables, because it is their perception that such reconstruction and retrieval projects as the old Earth experiment are necessary to the culmination of the UI. Recently, however, the Hyperion issue has caused the Ultimates to move toward the Volatiles views. Since Hyperion was explored four centuries ago, the Corps has been concerned and nonplussed. It was immediately obvious that the so-called Time Tombs were artifacts launched backward in time from a point at least 10,000 years in the galaxy's future. More disturbing, however, is the fact that Corps predictive formulae have never been able to factor the Hyperion variable. Braun, to understand this, you must realize how much the Corps relies upon prediction. Already, without UI input, the Corps knows the details of the physical, human, and AI future to a margin of 98.9995% for a period of at least two centuries. The AI Advisory Council to the All Thing, with its vague, Delphic utterances, considered so indispensable by humans, is a joke. The Corps drops tidbits of revelations to the hegemony when it serves the Corps' purposes sometimes to aid the volatiles, sometimes the stables, but always to please the ultimate. Hyperion is a rent in the entire predictive fabric of the core's existence. It is the penultimate oxymoron, a non-factorable variable. Impossible as it seems, Hyperion appears to be exempt from the laws of physics, history, human psychology, and AI prediction as practiced by the core. The result has been two futures two realities, if you will, one in which the Shrike Scourge, soon to be released on the web and interstellar humanity, is a weapon from the core-dominated future, a retroactive first strike from the volatiles who rule the galaxy millennia hence. The other reality sees the Shrike invasion, the coming interstellar war, and the other products of the Time Tomb's opening as a human fist struck back through time, a final twilight effort by the ousters, ex-colonials, and other small bands of humans who escaped the Volatiles' extinction programs. Water dripped on tile. Somewhere in the tunnels nearby, a mech cauterizer's warning siren echoed from ceramic and stone. I leaned against the wall and stared at Johnny. Interstellar war, I said. Both scenarios demand an interstellar war? Yes, there is no escaping that. Can both core groups be wrong in their prediction? No. What happens on Hyperion is problematic, but the disruption in the web and elsewhere is quite clear. The Ultimates use this knowledge as the prime argument for hurrying the next step in core evolution. And what did BB's stolen data show about us, Johnny? Johnny smiled, touched my hand, but did not hold it. It showed that I am somehow part of the Hyperion unknown. Their creation of a Keats hybrid was a terrible gamble. Only my apparent lack of success as a Keats analog allowed the stables to preserve me. When I made up my mind to go to Hyperion, the volatiles killed me with the clear intention of obliterating my AI existence if my cybrid again made that decision. You did. What happened? They failed. In the Corps' limitless arrogance, they failed to take two things into account. First, that I might invest all consciousness in my cybrid and thus change the nature of the Keats analog. Second, that I would go to you. Me? He took my hand. Yes, Braun. It seems that you also are part of the Hyperion Unknown. I shook my head, realizing that there was a numbness in my scalp above and behind my left ear. I raised my hand, half expecting to find damage from the datum plane fight. Instead, my fingers encountered the plastic of a neural shunt socket. I jerked my other hand from Johnny's grasp and stared at him in horror. He'd had me wired while I was unconscious. Johnny held up both hands, palms toward me. I had to, Braun. It may be necessary for the survival of both of us. I made a fist. You fucking low-life son of a bitch! Why do I need to interface directly, you lying bastard? 
Not with the Corps, Johnny said softly. With me. You? My arm and fist quivered with the anticipation of smashing his bat-cloned face. You, I sneered. You're human now, remember? Yes, but certain cybrid functions remain. Do you remember when I touched your hand several days ago and brought us to Datum Plain? I stared at him. I'm not going to Datum Plain again. No, nor am I. But I may need to relay incredible amounts of data to you within a very short period of time. I brought you to a black market surgeon in the dregs last night. She implanted a Shron disc. Why? The Shron loop was tiny, no larger than my thumbnail, and very expensive. It held countless field bubble memories, each capable of holding near-infinite bits of information. Shron loops could not be accessed by the biological carrier and thus were used for courier purposes. A man or woman could carry AI personalities or entire planetary data spheres in a Shron loop. Hell, a dog could carry all that. Why? I said again, wondering if Johnny or some forces behind Johnny were using me as such a courier. Why? Johnny moved closer and put his hand around my fist. Trust me, Braun. I don't think I trusted anyone since Dad blew his brains out twenty years ago, and Mom retreated into the pure selfishness of her seclusion. There was no reason in the universe to trust Johnny now. But I did. I relaxed my fist and took his hand. All right, said Johnny. Finish your meal and we'll get busy trying to save our lives. Weapons and drugs were the two easiest things to buy in Dreg's Hive. We spent the last of Johnny's considerable stash of black marks to buy weapons. By 2200 hours, we each wore whiskered Titan poly body armor. Johnny had a Gwanda's mirror black helmet, and I wore a Force Surplus command mask. Johnny's power gauntlets were massive and a bright red. I wore osmosis gloves with killing trim. Johnny carried an ouster hell whip captured on Brescia and had tucked a laser wand in his belt. Along with Dad's automatic, I now carried a Steiner Gin minigun on a gyroed waist brace. It was slaved to my command visor, and I could keep both hands free while firing. Johnny and I looked at each other and began giggling. When the laughter stopped, there was a long silence. Are you sure the Shrike Temple here on Lucis is our best chance? I asked for the third or fourth time. We can't forecast, said Johnny. All the Corps has to do is record a malfunction and we're dead. We can't even take an elevator from the lower levels. We'll have to find unmonitored stairways and climb the hundred and twenty floors. The best chance to make the temple is straight down the concourse mall. Yes, but will the Shrike Church people take us in? Johnny shrugged, a strangely insectoid gesture in his combat outfit. The voice through the Gowanda helmet was metallic. They're the only group which has a vested interest in our survival and the only ones with enough political pull to shield us from the hegemony while finding transit for us to Hyperion. I pushed up my visor. Maina Gladstone said that no future pilgrimage flights to Hyperion would be allowed. The Dome of Mirror Black nodded judiciously. Well, fuck Maina Gladstone, said my poet lover. I took a breath and walked to the opening of our niche, our cave, our last sanctuary. Johnny came up behind me. Body armor rubbed against body armor. Ready, Braun? I nodded, brought the minigun around on its pivot and started to leave. Johnny stopped me with a touch. I love you, Braun. I nodded, still tough. I forgot that my visor was up and he could see my tears. The hive is awake all twenty-eight hours of the day. But through some tradition, Third Shift was the quietest, the least populated. We would have had a better chance at the height of First Shift rush hour along the pedestrian causeways. But if the Gowandas and Thuggies were waiting for us, the death toll of civilians would have been staggering. It took us more than three hours to climb our way to Concourse Mall, not up a single staircase, but along an endless series of mech corridors, abandoned access verticals swept clean by the Luddite riots eighty years ago and a final stairway that was more rust than metal. We exited onto a delivery corridor less than half a click from the Shrike Temple. I can't believe it was so easy, I whispered to him on intercom. 
They are probably concentrating people on the spaceport and private forecaster clusters. We took the least exposed walkway onto the concourse, 30 meters below the first shopping level and 400 meters below the roof. The Shrike Temple was an ornate, freestanding structure now less than half a click away. A few off-hour shoppers and joggers glanced at us and then moved quickly away. I had no doubt that the mall police were being paged, but I'd be surprised if they showed up too quickly. A gang of brightly painted street thugs exploded from a lift shaft, hollering and whooping. They carried pulse knives, chains, and power gauntlets. Startled, Johnny wheeled toward them with the hell whip sending out a score of targeting beams. The minigun whirred out of my hands, shifting from aiming point to aiming point as I moved my eyes. The gang of seven kids skidded to a halt, held up their hands and backed away, eyes wide. They dropped into the lift shaft and were gone. I looked at Johnny. Black mirrors looked back. Neither of us laughed. We crossed to the northbound shopping lane. The few pedestrians scurried for open shop fronts. We were less than a hundred meters from the temple stairs. I could actually hear my heartbeat in the force helmet earphones. We were within fifty meters of the stairs. As if called, an acolyte or priest of some sort appeared at the ten-meter door of the temple and watched us approach. Thirty meters. If anyone was going to intercept us, they would have done it before this. I turned toward Johnny to say something funny. At least twenty beams and half that many projectiles hit us at once. The outer layer of the Titan poly exploded outward, deflecting most of the projectile energy in the counterblast. The mirrored surface beneath bounced most of the killing light. Most of it. Johnny was flung off his feet by the impact. I went to one knee and let the minigun train on the laser source. Ten stories up along the residential hive wall. My visor opaqued. Body armor burned off in a steam of reflective gas. The minigun sounded precisely like the kind of chainsaw they use in history holodramas. Ten stories up, a five-meter section of balcony and wall disintegrated in a cloud of explosive flechettes and armor-piercing rounds. Three heavy slugs struck me from behind. I landed on my palms, silenced the minigun, and swiveled. There were at least a dozen of them on each level, moving quickly in precise combat choreography. Johnny had reached his knees and was firing the hell whip in orchestrated bursts of light, working his way through the rainbow to beat bounce defenses. One of the running figures exploded into flame as the shop window behind it turned to molten glass and spattered fifteen meters onto the concourse. Two more men came up over the level railings, and I sent them back with a burst from the minigun. An open skimmer came down from the rafters, repellers laboring as it banked around pylons. Rocket fire slammed into concrete around Johnny and me. Shop fronts vomited a billion shards of glass over us. I looked, blinked twice, targeted and fired. The skimmer lurched sideways struck an escalator with a dozen cowering civilians on it, and tumbled in a mass of twisting metal and exploding ordnance. I saw one shopper leap in flames to the high floor eighty meters below. Left, shouted Johnny over the tight beam intercom. Four men in combat armor had dropped from an upper level using personal lift packs. The polymerized chameleon armor labored to keep up with the shifting background, but only succeeded in turning each man into a brilliant kaleidoscope of reflections. One moved inside the sweep arc of my minigun to neutralize me while the other three went for Johnny. He came in with a pulse blade, ghetto style. I let it chew at my armor, knowing it would get through to forearm flesh, but using it to buy the second I needed. I got it. I killed the man with the rigid edge of my gauntlet and swept the minigun fire into the three worrying Johnny. Their armor went rigid, and I used the gun to sweep them backward like someone hosing down a littered sidewalk. Only one of the men got to his feet before I blew them all off the level overhang. Johnny was down again. Parts of his chest armor were gone, melted away. I smelled cooking flesh, but saw no mortal wounds. I half crouched, lifted him. Leave me, Braun. Run. The stairs. The tight beam was breaking up. Fuck off, I said, getting my left arm around him enough to support him, while allowing room for the minigun to track. I'm still getting paid to be your bodyguard. They were sniping at us from both walls of the hive, the rafters, and the shopping levels above us. I counted at least twenty bodies on the walkways. About half were brightly clad civilians. 
The power assist on the left leg of my armor was grinding. Straight-legged, I awkwardly pulled us another ten meters toward the temple stairs. There were several Shrike priests at the head of the stairs now, seemingly oblivious to the gunfire all around them. Above. I swiveled, targeted, and fired in one moment, hearing the gun go empty after one burst and seeing the second skimmer get off its missiles in the instant before it became a thousand pieces of hurtling, unrelated metal and torn flesh. I dropped Johnny heavily to the pavement and fell on him, trying to cover his exposed flesh with my body. The missiles detonated simultaneously, several in air burst and at least two burrowing. Johnny and I were lifted into the air and hurled fifteen or twenty meters down the pitching walkway. Good thing. The alloy and ferro-concrete pedestrian strip where we had been a second before burned, bubbled, sagged, and tumbled down onto the flaming walkway below. There was a natural moat there now, a gap between most of the other ground troops and us. I rose, slapped away the useless minigun and mount pulled off useless shards of my own armor, and lifted Johnny in both arms. His helmet had been blown off, and his face was very bad. Blood seeped through a score of gaps in his armor. His right arm and left foot had been blown off. I turned and began carrying him up the Shrike Temple stairs. There were sirens and security skimmers filling the concourse flyspace now. The Gowandas on the upper levels and far side of the tumbled walkway ran for cover. Two of the commandos who had dropped on lift packs ran up the stairs after me. I did not turn. I had to lift my straight and useless left leg for every step. I knew that I had been seriously burned on my back and side, and there were shrapnel wounds elsewhere. The skimmers whooped and circled but avoided the temple steps. Gunfire rattled up and down them all. I could hear metal-shod footsteps coming rapidly behind me. I managed another three steps. Twenty steps above, impossibly far away, the bishop stood amid a hundred temple priests. I made another step and looked down at Johnny. One eye was open, staring up at me. The other was closed with blood and swollen tissue. It's all right, I whispered, aware for the first time that my own helmet was gone. It's all right. We're almost there. I managed one more step. The two men in bright black combat armor blocked my way. Both had lifted visors streaked with deflection scars, and their faces were very hard. Put him down, bitch, and maybe we'll let you live. I nodded tiredly, too tired to take another step or do anything but stand there and hold him in both arms. Johnny's blood dripped on white stone. I said put the son of a bitch down, and... I shot both of them one in the left eye and one in the right, never lifting Dad's automatic from where I held it under Johnny's body. They fell away. I managed another step, and then another. I rested a bit and then lifted my foot for another. At the top of the stairs, the group of black and red robes parted. The doorway was very tall and very dark. I did not look back, but I could hear from the noise behind us that the crowd on the concourse was very large. The bishop walked by my side as I went through the doors and into the dimness. I laid Johnny on the cool floor. Robes rustled around us. I pulled my own armor off where I could, then batted at Johnny's. It was fused to his flesh in several places. I touched his burned cheek with my good hand. I'm sorry. Johnny's head stirred slightly and his eye opened. He lifted his bare left hand to touch my cheek, my hair, the back of my head. Fanny. I felt him die then. I also felt the surge as his hand found the neural shunt, the white light warmth of the surge to the Shron loop as everything Johnny Keats ever was or would be exploded into me. Almost, almost it was like his orgasm inside me two nights earlier the surge and throb and sudden warmth and stillness after, with the echo of sensation there. I lowered him to the floor and let the acolytes remove the body, taking it out to show the crowd and the authorities and the ones who waited to know. I let them take me away. I spent two weeks in a Shrike Temple recovery crash. Burns healed, scars removed, alien metal extracted, skin grafted, 
flesh regrown, nerves rewoven, and still I hurt. Everyone except the Shrike priests lost interest in me. The Corps made sure that Johnny was dead, that his presence in the Corps had left no trace, that his cybrid was dead. The authorities took my statement, revoked my license, and covered things up as best they could. The web press reported that a battle between Dreg's level hive gangs had erupted onto the concourse mall. Numerous gang members and innocent bystanders were killed. The police contained it. A week before word came that the hegemony would allow the Yggdrasil to sail with pilgrims for the war zone near Hyperion, I used a temple farcaster to cast a renaissance vector where I spent an hour alone in the archives there. The papers were in vacuum press, so I could not touch them. The handwriting was Johnny's. I had seen his writing before. The parchment was yellow and brittle with age. There were two fragments. The first read, The day is gone, and all its sweets are gone. Sweet voice, sweet lips, soft hand and softer breast. Warm breath, light whisper, tender semitone. Bright eyes, accomplished shape, and languorous waist. Faded the flower and all its budded charms. Faded the sight of beauty from my eyes. Faded the shape of beauty from my arms. Faded the voice, warmth, whiteness, paradise. Vanished unseasonably at shut of eve, when the dusk holiday, or holy night, a fragrant curtained love begins to weave the woof of darkness thick for hid delight. But as I've read love's missal through today, he'll let me sleep, seeing I fast and pray. The second fragment was in a wilder hand and on rougher paper, as if slashed across a notepad in haste. This living hand, now warm and capable, of earnest grasping wood, if it were cold, and in the icy silence of the tomb, so haunt thy days and chill thy dreaming nights, that thou wouldst wish thine own heart dry of blood, so in my veins red life might stream again, and thou be conscience calmed. See, here it is. I hold it towards you. I'm pregnant. I think that Johnny knew it. I don't know for sure. I'm pregnant twice. Once with Johnny's child and once with the Schwan Loop memory of what he was. I don't know if the two are meant to be linked. It will be months before the child is born and only days before I face the Shrike. But I remember those minutes after Johnny's torn body was taken out to the crowd and before I was led away for help. They were all there in the darkness. Hundreds of the priests and acolytes and exorcists and ostiaries and worshippers. And as one voice they began to chant, there in that red dimness under the revolving sculpture of the Shrike, and their voices echoed in gothic vaults. And what they chanted went something like this. Blessed be she. Blessed be the mother of our salvation. Blessed be the instrument of our atonement. Blessed be the bride of our creation. Blessed be she. I was injured and in shock. I didn't understand it then. I don't understand it now. But I know that when the time arrives and the Shrike comes, Johnny and I will face it together. It was long after dark. The tram car rode between stars and ice. The group sat in silence, the only sound the creak of cable. After a time had passed, Lenore Hoyt said to Braun Lamia, You also carry the cruciform. Lamia looked at the priest. Colonel Kassad leaned toward the woman. Do you think Het Mistine was the Templar who had spoken to Johnny? Possibly, said Braun Lamia. I never found out. Kassad did not blink. Were you the one who killed Mistine? No. Martin Silenus stretched and yawned. We have a few hours before sunrise, he said. Anyone else interested in getting some sleep? Several heads nodded. I'll stay up to keep watch, said Fedmon Kassad. I'm not tired. I'll keep you company, said the consul. I'll heat some coffee for the therm, said Braun Lamia. When the others slept, the infant Rachel making soft cooing sounds in her sleep, the other three sat at the windows and watched the stars burn cold and distant in the high night. 6. 
Kronos Keep jutted from the easternmost rim of the Great Bridal Range, a grim, baroque heap of sweating stones with three hundred rooms and halls, a maze of lightless corridors leading to deep halls, towers, turrets, balconies overlooking the northern moors, air shafts rising half a kilometer to light and rumored to drop to the world's labyrinth itself, parapets scoured by cold winds from the peaks above, stairways, inside and out, carved from the mountain stone and leading nowhere. Stained glass windows a hundred meters tall set to catch the first rays of solstice sun or the moon on midwinter night. Painless windows, the size of a man's fist looking out on nothing in particular. An endless array of bas-relief, grotesque sculptures in half-hidden niches. And more than a thousand gargoyles staring down from eave and parapet, transept and sepulcher. Peering down through wood rafters in the great halls, and positioned so as to peer in the blood-tinted windows of the northeast face, their winged and hunchbacked shadows moving like grim sundial hours, cast by sunlight in the day and gas-fed torches at night. And everywhere in Kronos Keep, signs of the Shrike Church's long occupation, atonement altars draped in red velvet, hanging and freestanding sculptures of the Avatar with polychrome steel for blades and blood gems for eyes. More statues of the Shrike, carved from the stone of narrow stairways and dark halls, so that nowhere in the night would one be free of the fear of touching hands emerging from rock, the sharp curve of blade descending from stone, four arms enveloping in a final embrace. As if in a last measure of ornamentation, a filigree of blood in many of the once-occupied halls and rooms, arabesques of red spattered in almost recognizable patterns along walls and tunnel ceilings, bedclothes caked hard with rust-red substance and a central dining hall filled with the stench of food rotting from a meal abandoned weeks earlier, the floor and table, chairs and wall adorned with blood, stained clothing, and shredded robes lying in mute heaps. And everywhere the sound of flies. Jolly fucking place, isn't it? said Martin Silenus, his voice echoing. Father Hoyt took several steps deeper into the great hall. Afternoon light from the west-facing skylight forty meters above fell in dusty columns. It's incredible, he whispered. St. Peter's in the New Vatican is nothing like this. Martin Silenus laughed. Thick light outlined his cheekbones and satyr's brows. This was built for a living deity, he said. Fedmon Kassad lowered his travel bag to the floor and cleared his throat. Surely this place predates the Shrike Church. It does, said the consul, but they've occupied it for the past two centuries. It doesn't look too occupied now, said Braun Lamia. She held her father's automatic in her left hand. They had all shouted during their first twenty minutes in the keep, but the dying echoes, silences, and buzz of flies in the dining hall had reduced them to silence. Sad King Billy's androids and Bond clones built the goddamn thing, said the poet. Eight local years of labor before the spin ships arrived. It was supposed to be the greatest tourist resort in the web, the jumping-off point for the time tombs and the city of poets. But I suspect that even then the poor schmuck android laborers knew the locals' version of the Shrike story. Saul Weintraub stood near an eastern window, holding his daughter up so that soft light fell across her cheek and curled fist. All that matters little now, he said. Let's find a corner free of carnage where we can sleep and eat our evening meal. Are we going on tonight? asked Braun Lamia. To the tombs? asked Silenus, showing real surprise for the first time on the voyage. You'd go to the Shrike in the dark? Lamia shrugged. What difference does it make? The consul stood near a leaded glass door leading to a stone balcony and closed his eyes. His body still lurched and balanced to the movement of the tram car. The night and day of travel above the peaks had blurred together in his mind, lost in the fatigue of almost three days without sleep and his rising tension. He opened his eyes before he dozed off standing up. We're tired, he said. We'll stay here tonight and go down in the morning. Father Hoyt had gone out onto the narrow ledge of balcony. He leaned on a railing of jagged stone. Can we see the tombs from here? No, said Silenus. They're beyond that rise of hills. But see those white things to the north and west a bit? Those things gleaming like shards of broken teeth in the sand? Yes. 
that's the city of poets. King Billy's original site for Keats and for all things bright and beautiful. The locals say that it's haunted now by headless ghosts. Are you one of them? asked Lamia. Martin Silenus turned to say something, looked a moment at the pistol still in her hand, shook his head and turned away. Footsteps echoed from an unseen curve of staircase, and Colonel Cassad re-entered the room. There are two small storerooms above the dining hall, he said. They have a section of balcony outside, but no other access than this stairway. Easy to defend. The rooms are clean. Silenus laughed. Does that mean nothing can get at us, or that when something does get at us, we'll have no way to get out? Where would we go? asked Saul Weintraub. Where indeed, said the consul. He was very tired. He lifted his gear and took one handle of the heavy Mobius cube, waiting for Father Hoyt to lift the other end. Let's do what Kassad says. Find a space to spend the night. Let's at least get out of this room. It stinks of death. Dinner was the last of their dried rations, some wine from Silenus's last bottle, and some stale cake which Saul Weintraub had brought along to celebrate their last evening together. Rachel was too little to eat the cake, but she took her milk and went to sleep on her stomach on a mat near her father. Lenore Hoyt removed a small balalaika from his pack and strummed a few chords. I didn't know you played, said Braun Lamia. Poorly. The consul rubbed his eyes. I wish we had a piano. You do have one, said Martin Silenus. The consul looked at the poet. Bring it here, said Silenus. I'd welcome a scotch. What are you talking about, snapped Father Hoyt. Makes sense. His ship, said Silenus. Do you remember our dear departed voice of the bush, Mustine, telling our consul friend that his secret weapon was that nice hegemony single ship sitting back at Keats Spaceport? Call it up, your consul ship. Bring it on in. Kassad moved away from the stairway where he had been placing trip beams. The planet's datasphere is dead. The comsats are down. The orbiting force ships are on tight beam. How is he supposed to call it? It was Lamia who spoke. A fat line transmitter. The consul moved his stare to her. Fat line transmitters are the size of buildings, said Kassad. Braun Lamia shrugged. What Mustine said made sense. If I were the consul, if I were one of the few thousand individuals in the entire damn web to own a single ship, I'd be damn sure I could fly it in on a remote if I needed it. The planet's too primitive to depend on its comm net. The ionosphere's too weak for shortwave. The commsats are the first things to go in a skirmish. I'd call it by fat line. And the size, said the consul. Braun Lamia returned the diplomat's level gaze. The hegemony can't yet build portable fat line transmitters. There are rumors that the ousters can. The consul smiled. From somewhere there came a scrape, and then the sound of metal crashing. Stay here, said Kassad. He removed a death wand from his tunic, canceled the trip beams with his tactical comm log, and descended from sight. I guess we're under martial law now, said Silenus when the colonel was gone. Mars Ascendant. Shut up, said Lamia. Do you think it's the Shrike? asked Hoyt. The consul made a gesture. The Shrike doesn't have to clank around downstairs. It can simply appear. Here. Hoyt shook his head. I mean the Shrike that has been the cause of everyone's absence. The signs of slaughter here in the keep. The empty villages might be the result of the evacuation order, said the consul. No one wants to stay behind to face the ousters. The SDF forces have been running wild. Much of the carnage could be their doing. With no bodies, laughed Martin Silenus. Wishful thinking. Our absent hosts downstairs dangle now on the Shrike steel tree, where ere long we too will be. Shut up, Braun Lamia said tiredly. And if I don't, grinned the poet, will you shoot me, madam? Yes. The silence lasted until Colonel Kassad returned. He reactivated the trip beams and turned to the group seated on packing crates and flow foam cubes. It was nothing. Some carrion birds, 
harbingers, I think the locals call them, had come in through the broken glass doors in the dining hall and were finishing the feast. Silenus chuckled. Harbingers, very appropriate. Kassad sighed, sat on a blanket with his back to a crate, and poked at his cold food. A single lantern brought from the wind wagon lighted the room, and the shadows were beginning to mount the walls in the corners away from the door to the balcony. It's our last night, said Kassad. One more story to tell. He looked at the consul. The consul had been twisting his slip of paper with the number seven scrawled on it. He licked his lips. What's the purpose? The purpose of the pilgrimage has been destroyed already. The other stirred. What do you mean? asked Father Hoyt. The consul crumpled the paper and threw it into a corner. For the Shrike to grant a request, the band of pilgrims must constitute a prime number. We had seven. Mustine's disappearance reduces us to six. We go to our deaths now with no hope of a wish being granted. Superstition, said Lamia. The consul sighed and rubbed his brow. Yes, but that is our final hope. Father Hoyt gestured toward the sleeping infant. Can't Rachel be our seventh? Saul Weintraub rubbed his beard. No, a pilgrim must come to the tombs of his or her own free will. But she did once, said Hoyt. Maybe it qualifies. No, said the consul. Martin Silenus had been writing notes on a pad, but now he stood and paced the length of the room. Jesus Christ, people, look at us. We're not six fucking pilgrims, we're a mob. Hoyt there with his cruciform carrying the ghost of Paul de Ray. Our semi-sentient erg in the box there. Colonel Cassad with his memory of Moneta. M. Braun there, if we are to believe her tale, carrying not only an unborn child, but a dead romantic poet. Our scholar with the child his daughter used to be. Me with my muse. The consul with whatever fucking baggage he's brought to this insane track. My God, people, we should have received a fucking group rate for this trip. Sit down, said Lamia, in a dead even tone. No, he's right, said Hoyt. Even the presence of Father DeRay in cruciform must affect the prime number superstition somehow. I say that we press on in the morning in the belief that... Look, cried Braun Lamia, pointing to the balcony doorway where the fading twilight had been replaced with pulses of strong light. The group went out into the cool evening air, shielding their eyes from the staggering display of silent explosions which filled the sky. Pure white fusion bursts expanding like explosive ripples across a lapis pond. Smaller, brighter plasma implosions in blue and yellow and brightest red, curling inward like flowers folding for the night. The lightning dance of gigantic hell-whip displays, beams the size of small worlds cutting their swath across light hours and being contorted by the riptides of defensive singularities. The aurora shimmer of defense fields leaping and dying under the assault of terrible energies, only to be reborn nanoseconds later. Amid it all, the blue-white fusion tails of torch ships, and larger warships slicing perfectly true lines across the sky, like diamond scratches on blue glass. The ousters, breathed Braun Lamia. The war's begun, said Kassad. There was no elation in his voice, no emotion of any kind. The consul was shocked to discover that he was weeping silently. He turned his face from the group. Are we in danger here? asked Martin Silenus. He sheltered under the stone archway of the door, squinting at the brilliant display. Not at this distance, said Kassad. He raised his combat binoculars, made an adjustment, and consulted his tactical comm log. Most of the engagements are at least three AU away. The ousters are testing the forced space defenses. He lowered the glasses. It's just begun. Has the Farcaster been activated yet? asked Braun Lamia. Are the people being evacuated from Keats and the other cities? Kassad shook his head. I don't believe so. Not yet. The fleet will be fighting a holding action until the cislunar sphere is completed. Then the evacuation portals will be open to the web while force units come through by the hundreds. He raised the binoculars again. It'll be a hell of a show. Look! It was Father Hoyt pointing this time not at the fireworks display in the sky, but out across the low dunes of the northern moors. 
several kilometers toward the unseen tombs, a single figure was just visible as a speck of a form throwing multiple shadows under the fractured sky. Kassad trained his glasses on the figure. The Shrike? asked Lamia. No, I don't think so. I think it's... a Templar by the looks of the robe. Hetmestine! cried Father Hoyt. Kassad shrugged and handed the glasses around. The consul walked back to the group and leaned on the balcony. There was no sound but the whisper of wind, but that made the violence of explosions above them more ominous somehow. The consul took his turn looking when the glasses came to him. The figure was tall and robed, its back to the keep, and strode across the flashing vermilion sands with purposeful intent. Is he headed toward us, or the tombs? asked Lamia. The tombs, said the consul. Father Hoyt leaned elbows on the ledge and raised his gaunt face to the exploding sky. If it is, Mistine, then we're back to seven, aren't we? He'll arrive hours before us, said the consul. Half a day if we sleep here tonight as we proposed. Hoyt shrugged. That can't matter too much. Seven set out on the pilgrimage. Seven will arrive. The Shrike will be satisfied. If it is, Mistine, said Colonel Cassad. Why the charade on the wind wagon? And how did he get here before us? There were no other tram cars running, and he couldn't have walked over the bridle range passes. We'll ask him when we arrive at the tombs tomorrow, Father Hoyt said tiredly. Braun Lamia had been trying to raise someone on her comlog's general com frequencies. Nothing emerged but the hiss of static and the occasional growl of distant EMPs. She looked at Colonel Cassad. When do they start bombing? I don't know. It depends upon the strength of the force fleet defenses. The defenses weren't very good the other day when the Alster scouts got through and destroyed the Yggdrasil, said Lamia. Kassad nodded. Hey, said Martin Silenus, are we sitting on a fucking target? Of course, said the consul. If the Alsters are attacking Hyperion to prevent the opening of the time tombs, as M. Lamia's tale suggests, then the tombs and this entire area would be a primary target. For nukes? asked Silenus, his voice strained. Almost certainly, answered Kassad. I thought something about the anti-entropic fields kept ships away from here, said Father Hoyt. Crude ships, said the consul, without looking back at the others from where he leaned on the railing. The anti-entropic fields won't bother guided missiles, smart bombs, or hell with beams. It won't bother mech infantry, for that matter. The ousters could land a few attack skimmers or automated tanks and watch on remote while they destroy the valley. But they won't, said Braun Lamia. They want to control Hyperion, not destroy it. I wouldn't wager my life on that supposition, said Kassad. Lamia smiled at him. But we are, aren't we, Colonel? Above them a single spark separated itself from the continuous patchwork of explosions, grew into a bright orange ember, and streaked across the sky. The group on the terrace could see the flames, hear the tortured shriek of atmospheric penetration. The fireball disappeared beyond the mountains behind the keep. Almost a minute later the consul realized that he had been holding his breath, his hands rigid on the stone railing. He let out air in a gasp. The others seemed to be taking a breath at the same moment. There had been no explosion, no shock wave rumbling through the rock. A dud? asked Father Hoyt. Probably an injured force skirmisher trying to reach the orbital perimeter or the spaceport at Keats, said Colonel Kassad. He didn't make it, did he? asked Lamia. Kassad did not respond. Martin Silenus lifted the field glasses and searched the darkening moors for the Templar. Out of sight, said Silenus. The good captain either rounded that hill just this side of the time tombs valley, or he pulled his disappearing act again. It's a pity that we'll never hear his story, said Father Hoyt. He turned toward the consul. But we'll hear yours, won't we? The consul rubbed his palms against his pant legs. His heart was racing. Yes, he said, realizing even as he spoke that he had finally made up his mind. I'll tell mine. The wind roared down the east slopes of the mountains and whistled along the escarpment of Kronos Keep. The explosions above them seemed to have diminished ever so slightly, but the coming of darkness made each one look even more violent than the last. 
Let's go inside, said Lamia, her words almost lost in the wind sound. It's getting cold. They had turned off the single lamp, and the interior of the room was lighted only by the heat lightning pulses of color from the sky outside. Shadows sprang into being, vanished, and appeared again as the room was painted in many colors. Sometimes the darkness would last several seconds before the next barrage. The consul reached into his traveling bag and took out a strange device, larger than a comlog, oddly ornamented, and fronted with a liquid crystal disk key like something out of a history hollow. Secret fat line transmitter? Braun Lamia asked dryly. The consul's smile showed no humor. It's an ancient comlog. It came out during the Hegira. He removed a standard microdisc from a pouch on his belt and inserted it. Like Father Hoyt, I have someone else's tale to tell before you can understand my own. Christ on a stick, sneered Martin Silenus. Am I the only one who can tell a straightforward story in this fucking herd? How long do I have to... The consul's movement surprised even himself. He rose, spun, caught the smaller man by the cape and shirt front, slammed him against the wall, draped him over a packing crate with a knee in Silenus's belly and a forearm against his throat and hissed, one more word from you, poet, and I'll kill you. Silenus began to struggle, but a tightening on his windpipe and a glance at the consul's eyes made him cease. His face was very white. Colonel Kassad silently, almost gently, separated the two. There will be no more comments, he said. He touched the death wand in his belt. Martin Silenus went to the far side of the circle, still rubbing his throat, and slumped against a crate without a word. The consul strode to the door, took several deep breaths, and walked back to the group. He spoke to everyone but the poet. I'm sorry. It is just that I never expected to share this. The light from outside surged red and then white, followed by a blue glow which faded to near darkness. We know, Braun Lamia said softly. We all felt that way. The consul touched his lower lip, nodded, roughly cleared his throat, and came to sit by the ancient comlog. The recording is not as old as the instrument, he said. It was made about fifty standard years ago. I'll have some more to say when it's over. He paused as if there were more to be said, shook his head, and thumbed the antique disc key. There were no visuals. The voice was that of a young man. In the background one could hear a breeze blowing through grass or soft branches, and more distantly the roll of surf. Outside, the light pulsed madly as the tempo of the distant space battle quickened. The consul tensed as he waited for the crash and concussion. There was none. He closed his eyes and listened with the others. The Consul's Tale Remembering Siri I climbed the steep hill to Siri's tomb on the day the islands returned to the shallow seas of the equatorial archipelago. The day is perfect, and I hate it for being so. The sky is as tranquil as tales of old earth seas. The shallows are dappled with ultramarine tints, and a warm breeze blows in from the sea to ripple the russet willow grass on the hillside near me. Better low clouds and gray gloom on such a day. Better mist or a shrouding fog which sets the masts in first sight harbor dripping and raises the lighthouse horn from its slumbers. Better one of the great sea simoons blowing up out of the cold belly of the south lashing before it the modal isles and their dolphin herders until they seek refuge in the lee of our atolls and stony peaks. Anything would be better than this warm spring day, when the sun moves through a vault of sky so blue that it makes me want to run, to jump in great loping arcs, and to roll in the soft grass as Siri and I have done at just this spot. Just this spot. I paused to look around. The willow grass bends and ripples like the fur of some great beast as the salt-tinged breeze gusts up out of the south. I shield my eyes and search the horizon, but nothing moves there. Out beyond the lava reef, the sea begins to chop and lift itself in nervous strokes. Siri, I whisper. I say her name without meaning to do so. A hundred meters down the slope, the crowd pauses to watch me and to catch its collective breath. The procession of mourners and celebrants stretches for more than a kilometer to where the white buildings of the city begin. I can make out the gray and balding head of my younger son in the vanguard. 
He is wearing the blue and gold robes of the hegemony. I know that I should wait for him, walk with him, but he and the other aging council members cannot keep up with my young, ship-trained muscles and steady stride. But decorum dictates that I should walk with him and my granddaughter Lyra and my nine-year-old grandson. To hell with it, and to hell with them. I turn and jog up the steep hillside. Sweat begins to soak my loose cotton shirt before I reach the curving summit of the ridge and catch sight of the tomb. Ceres' tomb. I stop. The wind chills me, although the sunlight is warm enough as it glints off the flawless white stone of the silent mausoleum. The grass is high near the sealed entrance to the crypt. Rows of faded festival pennants on ebony staffs line the narrow gravel path. Hesitating, I circle the tomb and approach the steep cliff edge a few meters beyond. The willow grass is bent and trampled here where irreverent picnickers have laid their blankets. There are several fire rings formed from the perfectly round, perfectly white stones purloined from the border of the gravel path. I cannot stop a smile. I know the view from here, the great curve of the outer harbor with its natural seawall, the low white buildings of first sight, and the colorful hulls and masts of the catamarans bobbing at anchorage. Near the pebble beach beyond Common Hall, a young woman in a white skirt moves toward the water. For a second I think that it is Siri, and my heart pounds. I half prepare to throw up my arms in response to her wave, but she does not wave. I watch in silence as the distant figure turns away and is lost in the shadows of the old boat building. Above me, far out from the cliff, a wide-winged Thomas Hawk circles above the lagoon on rising thermals and scans the shifting blue kelp beds with its infrared vision, seeking out harp seals or torpids. Nature is stupid, I think, and sit in the soft grass. Nature sets the stage all wrong for such a day, and then it is insensitive enough to throw in a bird searching for prey which have long since fled the polluted waters near the growing city. I remember another Thomas Hawk on that first night when Siri and I came to this hilltop. I remember the moonlight on its wings, and the strange haunting cry which echoed off the cliff and seemed to pierce the dark air above the gaslights of the village below. Siri was sixteen. No, not quite sixteen. And the moonlight that touched the hawk's wings above us also painted her bare skin with milky light and cast shadows beneath the soft circles of her breasts. We looked up guiltily when the bird's cry cut the night, and Siri said, It was the nightingale and not the lark that pierced the fearful hollow of thine ear. Huh? I said. Siri was almost sixteen. I was nineteen. But Siri knew the slow pace of books and the cadences of theater under the stars. I knew only the stars. Relax, young shipman, she whispered, and pulled me down beside her then. It's only an old Tom's hawk hunting. Stupid bird. Come back, shipman. Come back, Marin. The Los Angeles had chosen that moment to rise above the horizon and to float like a wind-borne ember west across the strange constellations of Maui Covenant, Ceres' world. I lay next to her and described the workings of the great hawking drive spin ship which was catching the high sunlight against the drop of night above us, and all the while my hand was sliding lower along her smooth side. Her skin seemed all velvet and electricity, and her breath came more quickly against my shoulder. I lowered my face to the hollow of her neck, to the sweat and perfume essence of her tousled hair. Siri, I say, and this time her name is not unbidden. Below me, below the crest of the hill and the shadow of the white tomb, the crowd stands and shuffles. They are impatient with me. They want me to unseal the tomb, to enter, and to have my private moment in the cool, silent emptiness that has replaced the warm presence that was Siri. They want me to say my farewells so they can get on with their rites and rituals open the farcaster doors and join the waiting world web of the hegemony. To hell with that. And to hell with them. I pull up a tendril of the thickly woven willow grass, chew on the sweet stem, and watch the horizon for the first sign of the migrating islands. The shadows are still long in the morning light. The day is young. I will sit here for a while and remember. I will remember Siri. Siri was a, what, a bird, I think, 
the first time I saw her. She was wearing some sort of mask with bright feathers. When she removed it to join in the Racine quadrille, the torchlight caught the deep auburn tints of her hair. She was flushed, cheeks aflame, and even from across the crowded common I could see the startling green of her eyes contrasting with the summer heat of her face and hair. It was festival night, of course. The torches danced and sparked to the stiff breeze coming in off the harbor, and the sound of the flutists on the break wall playing for the passing aisles was almost drowned out by surf sounds and the crack of pennants snapping in the wind. Siri was almost sixteen, and her beauty burned more brightly than any of the torches set round the throng-filled square. I pushed through the dancing crowd and went to her. It was five years ago for me. It was more than sixty-five years ago for us. It seems only yesterday. This is not going well. Where to start? What say we go find a little nookie, kid? Mike Osho was speaking. Short, squat, his pudgy face a clever caricature of a Buddha, Mike was a god to me then. We were all gods, long-lived if not immortal, well-paid if not quite divine. The hegemony had chosen us to help crew one of its precious quantum leap spin ships, so how could we be less than gods? It was just that Mike, brilliant, mercurial, irreverent Mike, was a little older and a little higher in the shipboard pantheon than young Marin Aspic. Ha, zero probability of that, I said. We were scrubbing up after a twelve-hour shift with the Farcaster construction crew. Shuttling the workers around their chosen singularity point, some 163,000 kilometers out from Maui Covenant, was a lot less glamorous for us than the four-month leap from hegemony space. During the C-plus portion of the trip, we had been master specialists. Forty-nine starship experts, shepherding some two hundred nervous passengers. Now the passengers had their hard suits on, and we shipmen had been reduced to serving as glorified truck drivers as the construction crew wrestled the bulky singularity containment sphere into place. Zero probability, I repeated, unless the groundlings have added a whorehouse to that quarantine island they leased us. Nope, they haven't, grinned Mike. He and I had our three days of planetary R&R &R coming up, but we knew from Shipmaster Singh's briefings and the moans of our shipmates that the only ground time we had to look forward to would be spent on a seven-by-four-kilometer island administered by the hegemony. It wasn't even one of the modal isles we had heard about, just another volcanic peak near the equator. Once there, we could count on real gravity underfoot, unfiltered air to breathe, and the chance to taste unsynthesized food. But we could also count on the fact that the only intercourse we would have with the Maui Covenant colonists would be through buying local artifacts at the duty-free store. Even those were sold by hegemony trade specialists. Many of our shipmates had chosen to spend their R&R &R on the Los Angeles. So how do we find a little nookie, Mike? The colonies are off limits until the Farcaster's working. That's about sixty years away, local time. Or are you talking about Meg in Spincomp? Stick with me, kid, said Mike. Where there's a will, there's a way. I stuck with Mike. There were only five of us in the dropship. It was always a thrill to me to fall out of high orbit into the atmosphere of a real world, especially a world that looked as much like old Earth as Maui Covenant did. I stared at the blue and white limb of the planet until the seas were down and we were in atmosphere, approaching the twilight terminator in a gentle glide at three times the speed of our own sound. We were gods then, but even gods must descend from their high thrones upon occasion. Ceres' body never ceased to amaze me. That time on the archipelago, three weeks in that huge, swaying treehouse under the billowing tree sails with the dolphin herders keeping pace like outriders, tropical sunsets filling the evening with wonder, the canopy of stars at night, and our own wake marked by a thousand phosphorescent swirls that mirrored the constellations above. And still, it is Ceres' body, I remember. For some reason, shyness, the years of separation, she wore two strips of swimsuit for the first few days of our archipelago stay, and the soft white of her breasts and lower belly had not darkened to match the rest of her tan before I had to leave again. I remember her that first time, triangles in the moonlight as we lay in the soft grass above First Side Harbor, her silk pants catching on a weave of willow grass. There was a child's modesty then the slight hesitation of something given prematurely. But also pride. The same pride that later allowed her to face down the angry mob of separatists on the steps of the hegemony consulate in South Turn 
and send them to their homes in shame. I remember my fifth planet fall, our fourth reunion. It was one of the few times I ever saw her cry. She was almost regal in her fame and wisdom by then. She had been elected four times to the All Thing, and the Hegemony Council turned to her for advice and guidance. She wore her independence like a royal cloak, and her fierce pride had never burned more brightly. But when we were alone in the stone villa south of Feverone, it was she who turned away. I was nervous, frightened by this powerful stranger, but it was Siri, Siri of the straight back and proud eyes, who turned her face to the wall and said through tears, Go away, go away, Marin. I don't want you to see me. I'm a crone, all slack and sagging. Go away. I confess that I was rough with her then. I pinned her wrist with my left hand, using a strength which surprised even me, and tore her silken robe down the front in one move. I kissed her shoulders, her neck, the faded shadows of stretch marks on her taut belly, and the scar on her upper leg from the skimmer crash some forty of her years earlier. I kissed her graying hair and the lines etched in the once smooth cheeks. I kissed her tears. Jesus, Mike, this can't be legal, I'd said when my friend unrolled the hawking mat from his backpack. We were on Island 241, as the hegemony traders had so romantically named the desolate volcanic blemish which they had chosen for our R&R &R site. Island 241 was less than fifty kilometers from the oldest of the colonial settlements, but it might as well have been fifty light years away. No native ships were to put in at the island while Los Angeles crewmen or Farcaster workmen were present. The Maui Covenant colonists had a few ancient skimmers still in working order, but by mutual agreement there would be no overflights. Except for the dormitories, swimming beach, and the duty-free store, there was little on the island to interest us shipmen. Some day, when the last components had been brought in system by the Los Angeles, and the Farcaster finished, hegemony officials would make Island 241 into a center for trade and tourism. Until then, it was a primitive place with a dropship grid, newly finished buildings of the local white stone, and a few board maintenance people. Mike checked the two of us out for three days of backpacking on the steepest and most inaccessible end of the little island. I don't want to go backpacking, for Christ's sake, I'd said. I'd rather stay on the L.A. and plug into a stim sim. Shut up and follow me, said Mike. And like a lesser member of the Pantheon, following an older and wiser deity, I had shut up and followed. Two hours of heavy tramping up the slopes through sharp-branched scrub trees brought us to a lip of lava several hundred meters above the crashing surf. We were near the equator, on a mostly tropical world, but on this exposed ledge the wind was howling and my teeth were chattering. The sunset was a red smear between dark cumulus to the west, and I had no wish to be out in the open when full night descended. Come on, I said. Let's get out of the wind and build a fire. I don't know how the hell we're going to set up a tent on all of this rock. Mike sat down and lit a cannabis stick. Take a look in your pack, kid. I hesitated. His voice had been neutral, but it was the flat neutrality of the practical joker's voice, just before the bucket of water descends. I crouched down and began pawing through the nylon sack. The pack was empty, except for old flow foam packing cubes to fill it out. Those and a harlequin's costume complete with mask and bells on the toes. Are you... is this... are you goddamn crazy? I spluttered. It was getting dark quickly now. The storm might or might not pass to the south of us. The surf was rasping below like a hungry beast. If I had known how to find my own way back to the trade compound in the dark, I might have considered leaving Mike Osho's remains to feed the fishes far below. Now look at what's in my pack, he said. Mike dumped out some flow foam cubes and then removed some jewelry of the type I'd seen handcrafted on Renaissance Vector, an inertial compass, a laser pen which might or might not be labeled a concealed weapon by ship security, another harlequin costume, this one tailored to his more rotund form, and a hawking mat. Jesus, Mike, I said while running my hand over the exquisite design of the old carpet. This can't be legal. I didn't notice any customs agents back there, grinned Mike. And I seriously doubt that the locals have any traffic control ordinances. Yes, but... I trailed off and unrolled the rest of the mat. It was a little more than a meter wide and about two meters long. The rich fabric had faded with age, but the flight threads were still as bright as new copper. 
Where did you get it? I asked. Does it still work? On garden, said Mike, and stuffed my costume and his other gear into his backpack. Yes, it does. It had been more than a century since old Vladimir Sholokov, old Earth emigrant, master lepidopterist, and EM systems engineer, had handcrafted the first hawking mat for his beautiful young niece on New Earth. Legend had it that the niece had scorned the gift, but over the decades the toys had become almost absurdly popular, more with rich adults than with children, until they were outlawed on most Gemini worlds. Dangerous to handle, a waste of shielded monofilaments, almost impossible to deal with in controlled airspace, Hawking mats had become curiosities reserved for bedtime stories, museums, and a few colony worlds. It must have cost you a fortune, I said. Thirty marks, said Mike, and settled himself on the center of the carpet. The old dealer in Carvnell Marketplace thought it was worthless. It was, for him. I brought it back to the ship, charged it up, reprogrammed the inertia chips, and voila. Mike palmed the intricate design, and the mat stiffened and rose fifteen centimeters above the rock ledge. I stared doubtfully. All right, I said. But what if it— It won't, said Mike, and impatiently patted the carpet behind him. It's fully charged. I know how to handle it. Come on, climb on, or stand back. I want to get going before that storm gets any closer. But I don't think— Come on, Marin. Make up your mind. I'm in a hurry. I hesitated for another second or two. If we were caught leaving the island, we would both be kicked off the ship. Ship work was my life now. I had made that decision when I accepted the eight-mission Maui Covenant contract. More than that, I was two hundred light-years and five and a half leap-years from civilization. Even if they brought us back to hegemony space, the round trip would have cost us eleven years' worth of friends and family. The time debt was irrevocable. I crawled on the hovering hawking mat behind Mike. He stuffed the backpack between us, told me to hang on, and tapped at the flight designs. The mat rose five meters above the ledge, banked quickly to the left, and shot out over the alien ocean. Three hundred meters below us, the surf crashed whitely in the deepening gloom. We rose higher above the rough water and headed north into the night. In such seconds of decision, entire futures are made. I remember talking to Siri during our second reunion, shortly after we first visited the villa along the coast near Feverone. We were walking along the beach. Alon had been allowed to stay in the city under Magritte's supervision. It was just as well. I was not truly comfortable with the boy. Only the undeniable green solemnity of his eyes and the disturbing mirror familiarity of his short dark curls and snub of a nose served to tie him to me, to us, in my mind. That and the quick, almost sardonic smile I would catch him hiding from Siri when she reprimanded him. It was a smile too cynically amused and self-observant to be so practiced in a ten-year-old. I knew it well. I would have thought such things were learned, not inherited. You know very little, Siri said to me. She was waiting, shoeless, in a shallow tide pool. From time to time she would lift the delicate shell of a French horn conch, inspect it for flaws, and drop it back into the silty water. I've been well trained, I replied. Yes, I'm sure you've been well trained, agreed Siri. I know you are quite skillful, Marin, but you know very little. Irritated, unsure of how to respond, I walked along with my head lowered. I dug a white lava stone out of the sand and tossed it far out into the bay. Rain clouds were piling along the eastern horizon. I found myself wishing that I was back aboard the ship. I had been reluctant to return this time, and now I knew that it had been a mistake. It was my third visit to Maui Covenant, our second reunion, as the poets and her people were calling it. I was five months away from being twenty-one standard years old. Siri had just celebrated her thirty-seventh birthday three weeks earlier. I've been to a lot of places you've never seen, I said at last. It sounded petulant and childish even to me. Oh, yes, said Siri, and clapped her hands together. For a second, in her enthusiasm, I glimpsed my other Siri, the young girl I had dreamed about during the long nine months of turnaround. Then the image slid back to harsh reality, and I was all too aware of her short hair, the loosening neck muscles, and the cords appearing on the backs of those once-beloved hands. You've been to places I'll never see, 
said Siri in a rush. Her voice was the same, almost the same. Marin, my love, you've already seen things I cannot even imagine. You probably know more facts about the universe than I would guess exist. But you know very little, my darling. What the hell are you talking about, Siri? I sat down on a half-submerged log near the strip of wet sand and drew my knees up like a fence between us. Siri strode out of the tide pool and came to kneel in front of me. She took my hands in hers, and although mine were bigger, heavier, blunter of finger and bone, I could feel the strength in hers. I imagined it as the strength of years I had not shared. You have to live to really know things, my love. Having alone has helped me to understand that. There is something about raising a child that helps to sharpen one's sense of what is real. How do you mean? Siri squinted away from me for a few seconds and absently brushed back a strand of hair. Her left hand stayed firmly around both of mine. I'm not sure, she said softly. I think one begins to feel when things aren't important. I'm not sure how to put it. When you've spent thirty years entering rooms filled with strangers, you feel less pressure than when you've had only half that number in years of experience. You know what the room and the people in it probably hold for you, and you go looking for it. If it's not there, you sense it earlier and leave to go about your business. You just know more about what is, what isn't, and how little time there is to learn the difference. Do you understand, Marin? Do you follow me even a little bit? No, I said. Siri nodded and bit her lower lip. But she did not speak again for a while. Instead, she leaned over and kissed me. Her lips were dry and a little questioning. I held back for a second, seeing the sky beyond her, wanting time to think. But then I felt the warm intrusion of her tongue and closed my eyes. The tide was coming in behind us. I felt a sympathetic warmth and rising as Siri unbuttoned my shirt and ran sharp fingernails across my chest. There was a second of emptiness between us, and I opened my eyes in time to see her unfastening the last buttons on the front of her white dress. Her breasts were larger than I remembered, heavier, the nipples broader and darker. The chill air nipped at both of us until I pulled the fabric down her shoulders and brought our upper bodies together. We slid down along the log to the warm sand. I pressed her closer, all the while wondering how I possibly could have thought her the stronger one. Her skin tasted of salt. Siri's hands helped me. Her short hair pressed back against bleached wood, white cotton, and sand. My pulse outraced the surf. Do you understand, Marin? She whispered to me seconds later as her warmth connected us. Yes, I whispered back. But I did not. Mike brought the hawking mat in from the east toward first sight. The flight had taken over an hour in the dark, and I had spent most of the time huddling from the wind and waiting for the carpet to fold up and tumble us both into the sea. We were still half an hour out when we saw the first of the modal isles. Racing before the storm, tree sails billowing, the islands sailed up from their southern feeding grounds in seemingly endless procession. Many were lit brilliantly, festooned with colored lanterns and shifting veils of gossamer light. You sure this is the way? I shouted. Yes, shouted Mike. He did not turn his head. The wind whipped his long black hair back against my face. From time to time he would check his compass and make small corrections to our course. It might have been easier to follow the aisles. We passed one, a large one almost half a kilometer in length, and I strained to make out details, but the aisle was dark except for the glow of its phosphorescent wake. Dark shapes cut through the milky waves. I tapped Mike on the shoulder and pointed. Dolphins, he shouted. That's what this colony was all about, remember? A bunch of do-gooders during the Hegira wanted to save all the mammals in old Earth's oceans. Didn't succeed. I would have shouted another question, but at that moment the headland and first sight harbor came into view. I had thought the stars were bright above Maui Covenant. I had thought the migrating islands were memorable in their colorful display. But the city of first sight, wrapped about with harbor and hills, was a blazing beacon in the night. Its brilliance reminded me of a torch ship I once had watched while it created its own plasma nova against the dark limb of a sullen gas giant. 
The city was a five-tiered honeycomb of white buildings, all illuminated by warmly glowing lanterns from within and by countless torches from without. The white lava stone of the volcanic island itself seemed to glow from the city light. Beyond the town were tents, pavilions, campfires, cooking fires, and great flaming pyres, too large for function, too large for anything except to serve as a welcome to the returning isles. The harbor was filled with boats, bobbing catamarans with cowbells clanking from their masts, large-hulled, flat-bottomed houseboats built for creeping from port to port in the calm equatorial shallows, but proudly ablaze with strings of lights this night, and then the occasional ocean-going yacht, sleek and functional as a shark. A lighthouse set out on the pincer's end of the harbor reef threw its beam far out to sea, illuminated wave and isle alike, and then swept its light back in to catch the colorful bobbing of ships and men. Even from two kilometers out we could hear the noise. Sounds of celebration were clearly audible. Above the shouts and constant susurration of the surf rose the unmistakable notes of a Bach flute sonata. I learned later that this welcoming chorus was transmitted through hydrophones to the passage channels, where dolphins leaped and cavorted to the music. My God, Mike, how did you know all of this was going on? I asked the main ship computer, said Mike. The hawking mat banked right to keep us far out from the ships and lighthouse beam. Then we curved back in north of first sight toward a dark spit of land. I could hear the soft booming of waves on the shallows ahead. They have this festival every year, Mike went on, but this is their sesquicentennial. The party's been going on for three weeks now and is scheduled to continue another two. There are only about a hundred thousand colonists on this whole world, Marin, and I bet half of them are here partying. We slowed, came in carefully, and touched down on a rocky outcropping not far from the beach. The storm had missed us to the south, but intermittent flashes of lightning and the distant lights of advancing isles still marked the horizon. Overhead, the stars were not dimmed by the glow from first sight just over the rise from us. The air was warmer here, and I caught the scent of orchards on the breeze. We folded up the hawking mat and hurried to get into our harlequin costumes. Mike slipped his laser pen and jewelry into loose pockets. What are those for? I asked as we secured the backpack and hawking man under a large boulder. These? asked Mike as he dangled a Renaissance necklace from his fingers. These are currency in case we have to negotiate for favors. Favors? Favors, repeated Mike. A lady's largesse. Comfort to a weary spacefarer. Nookie to you, kid. Oh, I said, and adjusted my mask and fool's cap. The bells made a soft sound in the dark. Come on, said Mike. We'll miss the party. I nodded and followed him, bells jangling, as we picked our way over stone and scrub toward the waiting light. I sit here in the sunlight and wait. I am not totally certain what I am waiting for. I can feel a growing warmth on my back as the morning sunlight is reflected from the white stone of Ceres' tomb. Ceres, tomb? There are no clouds in the sky. I raise my head and squint skyward as if I might be able to see the L.A. and the newly finished Farcaster array through the glare of atmosphere. I cannot. Part of me knows that they have not risen yet. Part of me knows to the second the time remaining before ship and Farcaster complete their transit to the zenith. Part of me does not want to think about it. Siri, am I doing the right thing? There is the sudden sound of pennants stirring on their staffs as the wind comes up. I sense, rather than see, the restlessness of the waiting crowd. For the first time since my planet fall for this, our sixth reunion, I am filled with sorrow. No, not sorrow, not yet, but a sharp-toothed sadness which soon will open into grief. For years I have carried on silent conversations with Siri, framing questions to myself for future discussion with her, and it suddenly strikes me with cold clarity that we will never again sit together and talk. An emptiness begins to grow inside me. Should I let it happen, Siri? There is no response except for the growing murmurs of the crowd. In a few minutes they will send Donal, my younger and surviving son, or his daughter Lyra and her brother up the hill to urge me on. I toss away the sprig of willow grass I've been chewing on. There is a hint of shadow on the horizon. 
It could be a cloud. Or it could be the first of the isles, driven by instinct and the spring northerlies to migrate back to the great band of the equatorial shallows from whence they came. It does not matter. Siri, am I doing the right thing? There is no answer, and the time grows shorter. Sometimes Siri seemed so ignorant it made me sick. She knew nothing of my life away from her. She would ask questions, but I sometimes wondered if she was interested in the answers. I spent many hours explaining the beautiful physics behind our spin ships, but she never did seem to understand. Once, after I had taken great care to detail the differences between their ancient seed ship and the Los Angeles, Siri astounded me by asking, But why did it take my ancestors eighty years of ship time to reach Mally Covenant? when you can make the trip in a hundred and thirty days. She had understood nothing. Siri's sense of history was at best pitiful. She viewed the hegemony and the world web the way a child would view the fantasy world of a pleasant but rather silly myth. There was an indifference there that almost drove me mad at times. Siri knew all about the early days of the Hegira, at least insofar as they pertained to the Maui Covenant and the colonists and she occasionally would come up with delightful bits of archaic trivia or phraseology, but she knew nothing of post tegyra realities. Names like Garden and the Ousters, Renaissance and Lucis meant little to her. I could mention Salmud Brevi or General Horace Glennon Height, and she would have no associations or reactions at all. None. The last time I saw Siri, she was seventy standard years old. She was seventy years old, and still she had never traveled off-world, used a fat line, tasted any alcoholic drink except wine, interfaced with an empathy surgeon, stepped through a farcaster door, smoked a cannabis stick, received gene tailoring, plugged into a stem sim, received any formal schooling, taken any RNA medication, heard of Zen Gnostics or the Shrike Church, or flown any vehicle except an ancient Vic and Skimmer belonging to her family. Siri had never made love to anyone except me or so she said, and so I believed. It was during our first reunion, that time on the archipelago, when Siri took me to talk with the dolphins. We had risen to watch the dawn. The highest levels of the treehouse were a perfect place from which to watch the eastern sky pale and fade to morning. Ripples of high cirrus turned to rose, and then the sea itself grew molten as the sun floated above the flat horizon. Let's go swimming, said Siri. The rich, horizontal light bathed her skin and threw her shadow four meters across the boards of the platform. I'm too tired, I said. Later. We had lain awake most of the night talking, making love, talking and making love again. In the glare of morning I felt empty and vaguely nauseated. I sensed the slight movement of the aisle under me as a tinge of vertigo, a drunkard's disconnection from gravity. No, let's go now, said Siri, and grasped my hand to pull me along. I was irritated, but did not argue. Siri was twenty-six, seven years older than I during that first reunion, but her impulsive behavior often reminded me of the teenaged Siri I had carried away from the festival only ten of my months earlier. Her deep, unselfconscious laugh was the same. Her green eyes cut as sharply when she was impatient. The long mane of auburn hair had not changed, but her body had ripened filled out with a promise which had been only hinted at before. Her breasts were still high and full, almost girlish, bordered above by freckles that gave way to a whiteness so translucent that a gentle blue tracery of veins could be seen. But they were different somehow. She was different. Are you going to join me or just sit there staring? asked Siri. She had slipped off her captain as we came out onto the lowest deck. Our small ship was still tied to the dock. Above us, the island's tree sails were beginning to open to the morning breeze. For the past several days, Siri had insisted on wearing swim strips when we went into the water. She wore none now. Her nipples rose in the cool air. Won't we be left behind? I asked, squinting up at the flapping tree sails. On previous days, we had waited for the doldrums in the middle of the day when the isle was still in the water, the sea a glazed mirror. Now the jib vines were beginning to pull taut as the thick leaves filled with wind. Don't be silly, said Siri. We could always catch a keel root and follow it back. That or a feeding tendril. Come on. 
She tossed an osmosis mask at me and donned her own. The transparent film made her face look slick with oil. From the pocket of her captain, she lifted a thick medallion and set it in place around her neck. The metal looked dark and ominous against her skin. What's that? I asked. Siri did not lift the osmosis mask to answer. She set the comm threads in place against her neck and handed me the earplugs. Her voice was tinny. Translation disc, she said. Thought you knew all about gadgets, Marin. Last one in's a sea slug. She held the disc in place between her breasts with one hand and stepped off the aisle. I could see the pale globes of her buttocks as she pirouetted and kicked for depth. In seconds, she was only a white blur deep in the water. I slipped my own mask on, pressed the comm threads tight, and stepped into the sea. The bottom of the aisle was a dark stain on a ceiling of crystalline light. I was wary of the thick feeding tendrils, even though Siri had amply demonstrated that they were interested in devouring nothing larger than the tiny zooplankton that even now caught the sunlight like dust in an abandoned ballroom. Keel roots descended like gnarled stalactites for hundreds of meters into the purple depths. The aisle was moving. I could see the faint fibrillation of the tendrils as they trailed along. A wake caught the light ten meters above me. For a second I was choking, the gel of the mask smothering me as surely as the surrounding water would. And then I relaxed and the air flowed freely into my lungs. Deeper, Marin, came Ceres' voice. I blinked, a slow-motion blink as the mask readjusted itself over my eyes, and caught sight of Ceri twenty meters lower grasping a keel root and trailing effortlessly above the colder, deeper currents where the light did not reach. I thought of the thousands of meters of water under me, of the things which might lurk there, unknown, unsought out by the human colonists. I thought of the dark and the depths, and my scrotum tightened involuntarily. Come on down. Siri's voice was an insect buzz in my ears. I rotated and kicked. The buoyancy here was not so great as in old earth seas, but it still took energy to dive so deep. The mass compensated for depth and nitrogen, but I could feel the pressure against my skin and ears. Finally, I quit kicking, grabbed a keel root, and roughly hauled myself down to series level. We floated side by side in the dim light. Siri was a spectral figure here, her long hair swirling in a wine-dark nimbus, the pale strips of her body glowing in the blue-green light. The surface seemed impossibly distant. The widening V of the wake and the drift of the scores of tendrils showed that the isle was moving more quickly now, moving mindlessly to other feeding grounds, distant waters. Where are the... I began to sub-vocalize. Shh, said Siri. She fiddled with the medallion. I could hear them then, the shrieks and trills and whistles and cat purrs and echoing cries. The depths were suddenly filled with strange music. Jesus, I said, and because Siri had tuned our comm threads to the translator, the word was broadcast as a senseless whistle and toot. Hello, she called, and the translated greeting echoed from the transmitter. A high-speed bird's call sliding into the ultrasonic. Hello, she called again. Minutes passed before the dolphins came to investigate. They rolled past us, surprisingly large, alarmingly large, their skin looking slick and muscled in the uncertain light. A large one swam within a meter of us, turning at the last moment so that the white of his belly curved past us like a wall. I could see the dark eye rotate to follow me as he passed. One stroke of his wide fluke kicked up a turbulence strong enough to convince me of the animal's power. Hello, called Siri but the swift form faded into distant haze, and there was a sudden silence. Siri clicked off the translator. Do you want to talk to them? she asked. Sure. I was dubious. More than three centuries of effort had not raised much of a dialogue between man and sea mammal. Mike had once told me that the thought structures of old Earth's two groups of orphans were too different, the reference too few. One prehegyra expert had written that speaking to a dolphin or porpoise was about as rewarding as speaking to a one-year-old human infant. Both sides usually enjoyed the exchange, and there was a simulacrum of conversation, but neither party would come away the more knowledgeable. Siri switched the translator disc back on. Hello, I said. 
There was a final minute of silence, and then our earphones were buzzing while the sea echoed shrill ululations. Distance, no fluke. Hello, tone. Current pulse. Circle me. Funny? What the hell? I asked Siri, and the translator trilled out my question. Siri was grinning under her osmosis mask. I tried again. Hello. Greetings from, uh, the surface. How are you? The large male, I assumed it to be a male, curved in toward us like a torpedo. He arch-kicked his way through the water ten times faster than I could have swum even if I had remembered to don flippers that morning. For a second I thought he was going to ram us, and I raised my knees and clung tightly to the keel root. Then he was past us, climbing for air, while Siri and I reeled from his turbulent wake and the high tones of his shout. No fluke, no feed, no swim, no play, no fun. Siri switched off the translator and floated closer. She lightly grasped my shoulders while I held onto the keel root with my right hand. Our legs touched as we drifted through the warm water. A school of tiny crimson warrior fish flickered above us while the dark shapes of the dolphins circled farther out. Had enough? she asked. Her hand was flat on my chest. One more try, I said. Siri nodded and twisted the disc to life. The current pushed us together again. She slid her arm around me. Why do you herd the islands? I asked the bottlenosed shapes circling in the dappled light. How does it benefit you to stay with the isles? Sounding now, old songs, deep water, no great voices, no shark, old songs, new songs. Siri's body lay along the length of me now. Her left arm tightened around me. Great voices were the whales, she whispered. Her hair fanned out in streamers. Her right hand moved down and seemed surprised at what it found. Do you miss the great voices? I asked the shadows. There was no response. Siri slid her legs around my hips. The surface was a churning bowl of light forty meters above us. What do you miss most of old Earth's oceans? I asked. With my left arm, I pulled Siri closer, slid my hand down along the curve of her back to where her buttocks rose to meet my palm, held her tight. To the circling dolphins, we must have appeared a single creature. Siri lifted herself against me, and we became a single creature. The translator disc had twisted around, so it trailed over Siri's shoulder. I reached to shut it off, but paused as the answer to my question buzzed urgently in our ears. Miss Shark, Miss Shark. Miss Shark, Miss Shark, 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 Shark. I turned off the disc and shook my head. I did not understand. There was so much I did not understand. I closed my eyes as Siri and I moved gently to the rhythms of the current and ourselves, while the dolphins swam nearby, and the cadence of their calls took on the sad, slow trilling of an old lament. Siri and I came down out of the hills and returned to the festival just before sunrise of the second day. For a night and a day we had roamed the hills, eaten with strangers in pavilions of orange silk, bathed together in the icy waters of the Shri, and danced to the music which never ceased going out to the endless file of passing isles. We were hungry. I had awakened at sunset to find Siri gone. She returned before the moon of Maui Covenant rose. She told me that her parents had gone off with friends for several days on a slow-moving houseboat. They had left the family skimmer in first sight. Now we worked our way from dance to dance, bonfire to bonfire, back to the center of the city. We planned to fly west to her family estate near Piverone. It was very late, but First Sight Common still had its share of revelers. I was very happy. I was nineteen, and I was in love, and the point nine three gravity of Maui Covenant seemed much less to me. I could have flown had I wished. I could have done anything. We had stopped at a booth and bought fried dough and mugs of black coffee. Suddenly a thought struck me. I asked, How did you know I was a shipman? Hush, friend Marin. Eat your poor breakfast. When we get to the villa, I will fix a true meal to break our fast. No, I'm serious, I said, and wiped grease off my chin with the sleeve of my less-than-clean Harlequin's costume. This morning you said that you knew right away last night that I was from the ship. Why was that? Was it my accent? My costume? 
Mike and I saw other fellows dressed like this. Siri laughed and brushed back her hair. Just be glad it was I who spied you out, Marin, my love. Had it been my Uncle Gresham or his friends, it would have meant trouble. Oh? Why is that? I picked up one more fried ring and Siri paid for it. I followed her through the thinning crowd. Despite the motion and the music all about, I felt weariness beginning to work on me. They are separatists, said Siri. Uncle Gresham recently gave a speech before the council, urging that we fight rather than agree to be swallowed into your hegemony. He said that we should destroy your Farcaster device before it destroys us. Oh, I said. Did he say how he was going to do that? The last I heard, you folks had no craft to get off-world in. Nay, nor for the past fifty years have we, said Siri. But it shows how irrational the separatists can be. I nodded. Shipmaster Singh and Counselor Hellman had briefed us on the so-called separatists of Maui Covenant. The usual coalition of colonial jingoists and throwbacks, Singh had said. Another reason we go slow and develop the world's trade potential before finishing the Farcaster. The world web doesn't need these yahoos coming in prematurely. And groups like the separatists are another reason to keep you crew and construction workers the hell away from the groundlings. Where is your skimmer? I asked. The common was emptying quickly. Most of the bands had packed up their instruments for the night. Gaily costumed heats lay snoring on the grass or cobblestones amid the litter and unlit lanterns. Only a few enclaves of merriment remained groups dancing slowly to a lone guitar or singing drunkenly to themselves. I saw Mike Osho at once, a patchworked fool, his mask long gone, a girl on either arm. He was trying to teach the Havanagila to a rapt but inept circle of admirers. One of the troop would stumble and they would all fall down. Mike would flog them to their feet among general laughter and they would start again, hopping clumsily to his basso profundo chant. There it is, said Siri and pointed to a short line of skimmers parked behind the common hall. I nodded and waved to Mike, but he was too busy hanging on to his two ladies to notice me. Siri and I had crossed the square and were in the shadows of the old building when the shout went up. Shipman, turn around, you hegemony son of a bitch. I froze, and then wheeled around with fists clenched, but no one was near me. Six young men had descended the steps from the grandstand and were standing in a semicircle behind Mike. The man in front was tall, slim, and strikingly handsome. He was twenty-five or twenty-six years old, and his long blonde curls spilled down on a crimson silk suit that emphasized his physique. In his right hand he carried a meter-long sword that looked to be of tempered steel. Mike turned slowly. Even from a distance I could see his eyes sobering as he surveyed the situation. The women at his side and a couple of the young men in his group tittered as if something humorous had been said. Mike allowed the inebriated grin to stay on his face. You address me, sir? he asked. I address you, you hegemony whore's son, hissed the leader of the group. His handsome face was twisted into a sneer. Bertal, whispered Siri, my cousin, Gresham's younger son. I nodded and stepped out of the shadows. Siri caught my arm. That is twice you have referred unkindly to my mother, sir, slurred Mike. Have she or I offended you in some way? If so, a thousand pardons. Mike bowed so deeply that the bells on his cap almost brushed the ground. Members of his group applauded. Your presence offends me, you hegemony bastard. You stink up our air with your fat carcass. Mike's eyebrows rose comically. A young man near him in a fish costume waved his hand. Oh, come on, Bertal, he's just... Shut up, Farrick. It is this fat shithead I am speaking to. Shithead, repeated Mike, eyebrows still raised. I've traveled two hundred light years to be called a fat shithead? It hardly seems worth it. He pivoted gracefully, untangling himself from the women as he did so. I would have joined Mike then, but Siri clung tightly to my arm, whispering unheard entreaties. When I was free, I saw that Mike was still smiling, still playing the fool but his left hand was in his baggy shirt pocket. Give him your blade, Craig, snapped Bertal. One of the younger men tossed a sword hilt first to Mike. Mike watched it arc by and clang loudly on the cobblestones. You can't be serious, said Mike, 
in a soft voice that was suddenly quite sober. You cretinous cow turd. Do you really think I'm going to play duel with you just because you get a hard-on acting the hero for these yokels? Pick up the sword, screamed Bertal. Or by God, I'll carve you where you stand. He took a quick step forward. The youth's face contorted with fury as he advanced. Fuck off, said Mike. In his left hand was the laser pen. No, I yelled and ran into the light. That pen was used by construction workers to scrawl marks on girders of whiskered alloy. Things happened very quickly then. Bertal took another step and Mike flicked the green beam across him almost casually. The colonist let out a cry and leaped back. A smoking line of black was slashed diagonally across his silk shirt front. I hesitated. Mike had the setting as low as it could go. Two of Bertal's friends started forward and Mike swung the light across their shins. One dropped to his knees cursing and the other hopped away holding his leg and hooting. A crowd had gathered. They laughed as Mike swept off his fool's cap in another bow. I thank you, said Mike. My mother thanks you. Siri's cousin strained against his rage. Froths of spittle spilled on his lips and chin. I pushed through the crowd and stepped between Mike and the tall colonist. Hey, it's all right, I said. We're leaving. We're going now. God damn it, Marin, get out of the way, said Mike. It's all right, I said as I turned to him. I'm with a girl named Siri who has a... Bertal stepped forward and lunged past me with his blade. I wrapped my left arm around his shoulder and flung him back. He tumbled heavily onto the grass. Oh, shit, said Mike as he backed up several paces. He looked tired and a little disgusted as he sat down on a stone step. Oh, damn, he said softly. There was a short line of crimson in one of the black patches on the left side of his harlequin costume. As I watched, the narrow slit spilled over and blood ran down across Mike Osho's broad belly. Oh, Jesus, Mike. I tore a strip of fabric from my shirt and tried to staunch the flow. I could remember none of the first aid we'd been taught as midshipmen. I pawed at my wrist, but my comm log was not there. We had left them on the Los Angeles. It's not so bad, Mike, I gasped. It's just a little cut. The blood flowed down over my hand and wrist. It will serve, said Mike. His voice was held taut by a cord of pain. Damn, a fucking sword. Do you believe it, Marin? Cut down in the prime of my prime by a piece of fucking cutlery out of a fucking one-penny opera. Oh, damn, that smarts. Three-penny opera, I said, and changed hands. The rag was soaked. You know what your fucking problem is, Marin? You're always sticking your fucking two cents in. Oh. Mike's face went white and then gray. He lowered his chin to his chest and breathed deeply. To hell with this kid. Let's go home, huh? I looked over my shoulder. Bertal was slowly moving away with his friends. The rest of the crowd milled around in shock. Call a doctor, I screamed. Get some medics up here. Two men ran down the street. There was no sign of Siri. Wait a minute, wait a minute, said Mike in a stronger voice, as if he had forgotten something important. Just a minute, he said, and died. Died. A real death. Brain death. His mouth opened obscenely. His eyes rolled back so only the white showed and a minute later the blood ceased pumping from the wound. For a few mad seconds I cursed the sky. I could see the L.A. moving across the fading star field, and I knew that I could bring Mike back if I could get him there in a few minutes. The crowd backed away as I screamed and ranted at the stars. Eventually I turned to Bertol. You, I said. The young man had stopped at the far end of the common. His face was ashen. He stared wordlessly. You, I said again. I picked up the laser pen from where it had rolled, clicked the power to maximum, and walked to where Bertal and his friend stood waiting. Later, through the haze of screams and scorched flesh, I was dimly aware of Ceres' skimmer setting down in the crowded square, of dust flying up all around, and of her voice commanding me to join her. We lifted away from the light and madness. 
The cool wind blew my sweat-soaked hair away from my neck. We will go to Feveron, said Siri. Bertol was drunk. The Separatists are a small, violent group. There will be no reprisals. You will stay with me until the Council holds the inquest. No, I said. There. Land there. I pointed to a spit of land not far from the city. Siri landed despite her protests. I glanced at the boulder to make sure the backpack was still there, and then climbed out of the skimmer. Siri slid across the seat and pulled my head down to hers. Marin, my love. Her lips were warm and open, but I felt nothing. My body felt anesthetized. I stepped back and waved her away. She brushed her hair back and stared at me from green eyes filled with tears. Then the skimmer lifted, turned, and sped to the south in the early morning light. Just a minute, I felt like calling. I sat on a rock and gripped my knees as several ragged sobs were torn up out of me. Then I stood and threw the laser pen into the surf below. I tugged out the backpack and dumped the contents on the ground. The hawking mat was gone. I sat back down, too drained to laugh or cry or walk away. The sun rose as I sat there. I was still sitting there three hours later when the large black skimmer from ship security sat down silently beside me. Father? Father, it is getting late. I turned to see my son Donald standing behind me. He is wearing the blue and gold robe of the Hegemony Council. His bald scalp is flushed and beaded with sweat. Donald is only forty-three, but he seems much older to me. Please, father, he says. I nod and rise, brushing off the grass and dirt. We walk together to the front of the tomb. The crowd is pressed closer now. Gravel crunches under their feet as they shift restlessly. Shall I enter with you, father? Donald asks. I pause to look at this aging stranger who is my child. There is little of Siri or me reflected in him. His face is friendly, florid, and tense with the excitement of the day. I can sense in him the open honesty which often takes the place of intelligence in some people. I cannot help but compare this balding puppy of a man to Alon, Alon of the dark curls and silences and sardonic smile. But Alon is thirty-three years dead, cut down in a stupid battle which had nothing to do with him. No, I say, I'll go in by myself. Thank you, Donald. He nods and steps back. The pennants snap above the heads of the straining crowd. I turn my attention to the tomb. The entrance is sealed with a palm lock. I have only to touch it. During the past few minutes I have developed a fantasy which will save me from both the growing sadness within and the external series of events which I have initiated. Siri is not dead. In the last stages of her illness, she had called together the doctors and the few technicians left in the colony, and they rebuilt for her one of the ancient hibernation chambers used in their seed ship two centuries earlier. Siri is only sleeping. What is more, the year-long sleep has somehow restored her youth. When I wake her, she will be the Siri I remember from our early days. We will walk out into the sunlight together, and when the Farcaster doors open, we shall be the first through. Father? Yes. I step forward and set my hand to the door of the crypt. There is a whisper of electric motors, and the white slab of stone slides back. I bow my head and enter Ceres' tomb. Damn it, Marin, secure that line before it knocks you overboard. Hurry! I hurried. The wet rope was hard to coil, harder to tie off. Siri shook her head in disgust and leaned over to tie a bowline knot with one hand. It was our sixth reunion. I had been three months too late for her birthday, but more than five thousand other people had made it to the celebration. The CEO of the All Thing had wished her well in a forty-minute speech. A poet read his most recent verses to the Love Cycle sonnets. The Hegemony ambassador had presented her with a scroll and a new ship, a small submersible powered by the first fusion cells to be allowed on Maui Covenant. Siri had eighteen other ships. 
Twelve belonged to her fleet of swift catamarans that plied their trade between the wandering archipelago and the home islands. Two were beautiful racing yachts that were used only twice a year to win the Founders Regatta and the Covenant Criterium. The other four craft were ancient fishing boats, homely and awkward, well-maintained but little more than scows. Siri had nineteen ships, but we were on a fishing boat, the Ginny Paul. For the past eight days we had fished the shelf of the equatorial shallows, a crew of two, casting and pulling nets, wading knee-deep through stinking fish and crunching trilobites, wallowing over every wave, casting and pulling nets, keeping watch, and sleeping like exhausted children during our brief rest periods. I was not quite twenty-three. I thought I was used to heavy labor aboard the L.A., and it was my custom to put in an hour of exercise in the 1.3G pod every second shift. But now my arms and back ached from the strain, and my hands were blistered between the calluses. Siri had just turned seventy. Marin, go forward and reef the foresail. Do the same for the jib, and then go below to see to the sandwiches. Plenty of mustard. I nodded and went forward. For a day and a half we had been playing hide-and-seek with the storm, sailing before it when we could, turning about and accepting its punishment when we had to. At first it had been exciting, a welcome respite from the endless casting and pulling and mending. But after the first few hours the adrenaline rush faded to be replaced by constant nausea, fatigue, and a terrible tiredness. The seas did not relent. The waves grew to six meters and higher. The Ginny Paul wallowed like the broad-beamed matron she was. Everything was wet. My skin was soaked under three layers of rain gear. For Siri, it was a long-awaited vacation. This is nothing, she had said during the darkest hour of the night, as waves washed over the deck and smashed against the scarred plastic of the cockpit. You should see it during Samoon season. The clouds still hung low and blended into gray waves in the distance, but the sea was down to a gentle five-foot chop. I spread mustard across the roast beef sandwiches and poured steaming coffee into thick white mugs. It would have been easier to transport the coffee in zero-g without spilling it than to get up the pitching shaft of the companionway. Siri accepted her depleted cup without commenting. We sat in silence for a bit, appreciating the food and the tongue-scalding warmth. I took the wheel when Siri went below to refill our mugs. The gray day was dimming almost imperceptibly into night. Marin, she said after handing me my mug and taking a seat on the long cushioned bench which encircled the cockpit, what will happen after they open the forecaster? Well, I was surprised by the question. We had almost never talked about the time when Maui Covenant would join the hegemony. I glanced over at Siri and was struck by how ancient she suddenly seemed. Her face was a mosaic of seams and shadows. Her beautiful green eyes had sunken into wells of darkness, and her cheekbones were knife edges against brittle parchment. She kept her gray hair cut short now, and it stuck out in damp spikes. Her neck and wrists were tendoned cords emerging from a shapeless sweater. What do you mean? I asked. What will happen after they open the forecaster? You know what the council says, Siri. I spoke loudly because she was hard of hearing in one ear. It will open a new era of trade and technology for Maui Covenant. And you won't be restricted to one little world any longer. When you become citizens, everyone will be entitled to use the Farcaster doors. Yes, said Siri. Her voice was weary. I have heard all of that, Marin. But what will happen? Who will be the first through to us? I shrugged. More diplomats, I suppose. Cultural contact specialists, anthropologists, ethnologists, marine biologists. And then? I paused. It was dark out. The sea was almost gentle. Our running lights glowed red and green against the night. I felt the same anxiety I had known two days earlier when the wall of storm appeared on the horizon. I said, And then will come the missionaries, the petroleum geologists, the sea farmers, the developers. Siri sipped at her coffee. I would have thought your hegemony was far beyond a petroleum economy. I laughed and locked the wheel in. Nobody gets beyond a petroleum economy. Not while there's petroleum there. We don't burn it, if that's what you mean. But it's still essential for the production of plastics, synthetics, food base, and caroids. Two hundred billion people use a lot of plastic. And Maui Covenant has oil? 
Oh, yes, I said. There was no more laughter in me. There are billions of barrels reservoired under the equatorial shallows alone. How will they get it, Marin? Platforms? Yeah, platforms. Submersibles. Subsea colonies with tailored workers brought in from Mare Infinitus. And the modal isles? asked Siri. They must return each year to the shallows to feed on the blue kelp there and to reproduce. What will become of the isles? I shrugged again. I had drunk too much coffee, and it had left a bitter taste in my mouth. I don't know, I said. They haven't told the crew much. But back on our first trip out, Mike heard that they plan to develop as many of the isles as they can, so some will be protected. Develop? Siri's voice showed surprise for the first time. How can they develop the isles? Even the first families must ask permission of the sea folk to build our treehouse retreats there. I smiled at Ceres' use of the local term for the dolphins. The Maui Covenant colonists were such children when it came to their damned dolphins. The plans are all set, I said. There are 128,573 modal isles big enough to build a dwelling on. Leases to those have long since been sold. The smaller isles will be broken up, I suppose. The home islands will be developed for recreation purposes. Recreation purposes, echoed Siri. How many people from the hegemony will use the Farcaster to come here, for recreation purposes? At first, you mean? I asked. Just a few thousand the first year. As long as the only door is on Island 241, the Trade Center, it will be limited. Perhaps 50,000 the second year when First Sight gets its door. It'll be quite the luxury tour. Always is after a seed colony is first opened to the web. And later? After the five-year probation? There will be thousands of doors, of course. I would imagine that there will be twenty or thirty million new residents coming through during the first year of full citizenship. Twenty or thirty million, said Siri. The light from the compass stand illuminated her lined face from below. There was still a beauty there, but there was no anger or shock. I had expected both. But you'll be citizens then yourself, I said, free to step anywhere in the world web. There will be sixteen new worlds to choose from, probably more by then. Yes, said Siri, and set aside her empty mug. A fine rain streaked the glass around us. The crude radar screen set in its hand-carved frame showed the seas empty. The storm passed. Is it true, Marin, that people in the hegemony have their homes on a dozen worlds? One house, I mean, with windows facing out on a dozen skies? Sure, I said but not many people. Only the rich can afford multi-world residences like that. Siri smiled and set her hand on my knee. The back of her hand was mottled and blue-veined. But you are very rich, are you not, Shipman? I looked away. Not yet, I'm not. Ah, but soon, Marin, soon. How long for you, my love? Less than two weeks here and then the voyage back to your hegemony. Five months more of your time to bring the last components back. A few weeks to finish, and then you step home a rich man. Step, two hundred empty light years home. What a strange thought. But where was I? That is, how long? Less than a standard year. Ten months, I said. Three hundred and six standard days. Three hundred fourteen of yours. Nine hundred eighteen shifts. And then your exile will be over. Yes and you will be twenty-four years old and very rich. Yes. I'm tired, Marin. I want to sleep now. We programmed the tiller, set the collision alarm, and went below. The wind had risen some, and the old vessel wallowed from wave crest to trough with every swell. We undressed in the dim light of the swinging lamp. I was first in the bunk and under the covers. It was the first time Siri and I had shared a sleep period. Remembering our last reunion and her shyness at the villa, I expected her to douse the light. Instead, she stood a minute, nude in the chill air, thin arms calmly at her sides. Time had claimed Siri, but had not ravaged her. Gravity had done its inevitable work on her breasts and buttocks, and she was much thinner. I stared at the gaunt outlines of ribs and breastbone, and remembered the sixteen-year-old girl with baby fat and skin like warm velvet. In the cold light of the swinging lamp, I stared at Ceres' sagging flesh 
and remembered moonlight on budding breasts. Yet somehow, strangely, inexplicably, it was the same Siri who stood before me now. Move over, Marin. She slipped into the bunk beside me. The sheets were cool against our skin, the rough blanket welcome. I turned off the light. The little ship swayed to the regular rhythm of the sea's breathing. I could hear the sympathetic creak of masts and rigging. In the morning we would be casting and pulling and mending, but now there was time to sleep. I began to doze to the sound of waves against wood. Marin? Yes? What would happen if the separatists attacked the hegemony tourists or the new residents? I thought the separatists had all been carted off to the isles. They have been. But what if they resisted? The hegemony would send in force troops who could kick the shit out of the separatists. What if the Farcaster itself were attacked, destroyed before it was operational? Impossible. Yes, I know, but what if it were? Then the Los Angeles would return nine months later with hegemony troops who would proceed to kick the shit out of the separatists, and anyone else on Maui Covenant who got in their way. Nine months ship time, said Siri. Eleven years of our time. But inevitable either way, I said. Let's talk about something else. All right, said Siri. But we did not speak. I listened to the creak and sigh of the ship. Siri had nestled in the hollow of my arm. Her head was on my shoulder, and her breathing was so deep and regular that I thought her to be asleep. I was almost asleep myself when her warm hand slid up my leg and lightly cupped me. I was startled even as I began to stir and stiffen. Siri whispered an answer to my unasked question. No, Marin, one is never really too old. At least not too old to want the warmth and closeness. You decide, my love. I will be content either way. I decided. Toward the dawn we slept. The tomb is empty. Donal, come in here. He bustles in, robes rustling in the hollow emptiness. The tomb is empty. There is no hibernation chamber. I did not truly expect there to be one, but neither is there sarcophagus or coffin. A bright bulb illuminates the white interior. What the hell is this, Donal? I thought this was Ceres tomb. It is, Father. Where is she interred? Under the floor, for Christ's sake? Donal mops at his brow. I remember that it is his mother I am speaking of. I also remember that he has had almost two years to accustom himself to the idea of her death. No one told you, he asks. Told me what? The anger and confusion are already ebbing. I was rushed here from the dropship station and told that I was to visit Ceres' tomb before the Farcaster opening. What? Mother was cremated as per her instructions. Her ashes were spread on the Great South Sea from the highest platform of the family isle. Then why this... crept? I watch what I say. Donal is sensitive. He mops his brow again and glances to the door. We are shielded from the view of the crowd, but we are far behind schedule. Already the other members of the council have had to hurry down the hill to join the dignitaries on the bandstand. My slow grief this day has been worse than bad timing. It has turned into bad theater. Mother left instructions. They were carried out. He touches a panel on the inner wall, and it slides up to reveal a small niche containing a metal box. My name is on it. What is that? Donald shakes his head. Personal items Mother left for you? Only Magritte knew the details, and she died last winter without telling anyone. All right, I say. Thank you. I'll be out in a moment. Donald glances at his chronometer. The ceremony begins in eight minutes. They will activate the Farcaster in twenty minutes. I know, I say. I do know. Part of me knows precisely how much time is left. I'll be out in a moment. Donald hesitates and then departs. I close the door behind him with a touch of my palm. The metal box is surprisingly heavy. I set it on the stone floor and crouch beside it. A smaller palm lock gives me access. The lid clicks open, and I peer into the container. Well, I'll be damned, I say softly. I do not know what I expected. Artifacts, perhaps. Nostalgic mementos of our hundred and three days together. 
perhaps a pressed flower from some forgotten offering, or the French horn conch we dove for off Feverone. But there are no mementos, not as such. The box holds a small Steiner Ginn hand laser, one of the most powerful projection weapons ever made. The accumulator is attached by a power lead to a small fusion cell that Siri must have cannibalized from her new submersible. Also attached to the fusion cell is an ancient com log, an antique with a solid state interior and a liquid crystal disk key. The charge indicator glows green. There are two other objects in the box. One is the translator medallion we had used so long ago. The final object makes me literally gape in surprise. Why, you little bitch, I say. Things fall into place. I cannot stop a smile. You dear, conniving little bitch. There, rolled carefully, power lead correctly attached, lies the hawking mat Mike Osho bought in Carvenal Marketplace for thirty marks. I leave the hawking mat there disconnect the comm log and lift it out. I sit cross-legged on the cold stone and thumb the disk key. The light in the crypt fades out, and suddenly, Siri is there before me. They did not throw me off the ship when Mike died. They could have, but they did not. They did not leave me to the mercy of provincial justice on Maui Covenant. They could have, but they chose not to. For two days I was held in security and questioned, once by Shipmaster Singh himself. Then they let me return to duty. For the four months of the long leap back, I tortured myself with the memory of Mike's murder. I knew that in my clumsy way I had helped to murder him. I put in my shifts, dreamed my sweaty nightmares, and wondered if they would dismiss me when we reached the web. They could have told me, but they chose not to. They did not dismiss me. I was to have my normal leave in the web, but could take no off-ship R&R while in the Maui Covenant system. In addition, there was a written reprimand and temporary reduction in rank. That was what Mike's life had been worth, a reprimand and reduction in rank. I took my three-week leave with the rest of the crew, but, unlike the others, I did not plan to return. I forecast to Esperance and made the classic shipman's mistake of trying to visit family. Two days in the crowded residential bulb was enough, and I stepped to Lucis and took my pleasure in three days of whoring on the Rue de Chat. When my mood turned darker, I cast a Fuji and lost most of my ready marks betting on the bloody samurai fights there. Finally, I found myself forecasting to Home System Station and taking the two-day pilgrim shuttle down to Hellas Basin. I had never been to Home System or Mars before, and I never planned to return, but the ten days I spent there, alone and wandering the dusty, haunted corridors of the monastery, served to send me back to the ship, back to Siri. Occasionally, I would leave the redstone maze of the megalith, and clad only in skin suit and mask, stand on one of the uncounted thousands of stone balconies and stare skyward at the pale gray star which had once been old earth. Sometimes, then, I thought of the brave and stupid idealists heading out into the great dark in their slow and leaking ships, carrying embryos and ideologies with equal faith and care. But most times I did not try to think. Most times I simply stood in the purple night and let Siri come to me. There, in the Master's Rock, where perfect Satori had eluded so many much worthier pilgrims, I achieved it through the memory of a not-quite-sixteen-year-old woman-child's body lying next to mine while moonlight spilled from a Thomas Hawk's wings. When the Los Angeles spun back up to a quantum state, I went with her. Four months later, I was content to pull my shift with the construction crew, plug into my usual stems, and sleep my R&R &R away. Then Singh came to me. You're going down, he said. I did not understand. In the past eleven years the groundlings have turned your screw-up with Osho into a goddamned legend, said Singh. There's an entire cultural mythos built around your little rule in the hay with that colonial girl. Siri, I said. Get your gear, said Singh. You'll spend your three weeks groundside. The ambassador's experts say you'll do the hegemony more good down there than up here. We'll see. The world was waiting. Crowds were cheering. Siri was waving. We left the harbor in a yellow catamaran and sailed south-southeast, bound for the archipelago and her family isle. Hello, Marin. Siri floats in the darkness of her tomb. The hollow is not perfect. A haziness mars the edges. But it is Siri. Siri as I last saw her. Gray hair shorn rather than cut. Head high, face sharpened with shadows. 
Hello, Marin, my love. Hello, Siri, I say. The tomb door is closed. I am sorry I cannot share our seventh reunion, Marin. I looked forward to it. Siri pauses and looks down at her hands. The image flickers slightly as dust motes float through her form. I had carefully planned what to say here, she goes on. How to say it. Arguments to be pled. Instructions to be given. But I know now how useless that would have been. Either I have said it already and you have heard, or there is nothing left to say and silence would best suit the moment. Siri's voice had grown even more beautiful with age. There is a fullness and calmness there which can come only from knowing pain. Siri moves her hands, and they disappear beyond the border of the projection. Marin, my love, how strange our days apart and together have been. How beautifully absurd the myth that bound us. My days were but heartbeats to you. I hated you for that. You were the mirror that would not lie. If you could have seen your face at the beginning of each reunion, the least you could have done was to hide your shock. That at least you could have done for me. But through your clumsy naivete, there has always been, what, something, Marin. There is something there that belies the callowness and thoughtless egotism which you wear so well. A caring, perhaps. A respect for caring, if nothing else. Marin, this diary has hundreds of entries. Thousands, I fear. I have kept it since I was thirteen. By the time you see this, they will all have been erased except the ones which follow. Adieu, my love. Adieu. I shut off the comm log and sit in silence for a minute. The crowd sounds are barely audible through the thick walls of the tomb. I take a breath and thumb the disc key. Siri appears. She is in her late forties. I know immediately the day and place she recorded this image. I remember the cloak she wears, the eelstone pendant at her neck, and the strand of hair which has escaped her barrette and even now falls across her cheek. I remember everything about that day. It was the last day of our third reunion, and we were with friends on the heights above South Turn. Donald was ten, and we were trying to convince him to slide on the snowfield with us. He was crying. Siri turned away from us even before the skimmer settled. When Magritte stepped out, we knew from Siri's face that something had happened. The same face stares at me now. She brushes absently at the unruly strand of hair. Her eyes are red, but her voice is controlled. Marin, they killed our son today. Alon was twenty-one, and they killed him. You were so confused today, Marin. How could such a mistake have happened, you kept repeating. You did not really know our son, but I could see the loss in your face when we heard. Marin, it was not an accident. If nothing else survives, no other record. If you never understand why I allowed a sentimental myth to rule my life, let this be known. It was not an accident that killed Alon. He was with the separatists when the council police arrived. Even then he could have escaped. We had prepared an alibi together. The police would have believed his story. He chose to stay. Today, Marin, you were impressed with what I said to the crowd, the mob at the embassy. Know this, Shipman. When I said, now is not the time to show your anger and your hatred, that is precisely what I meant. No more, no less. Today is not the time. But the day will come. It will surely come. The covenant was not taken lightly in those final days, Marin. It is not taken lightly now. Those who have forgotten will be surprised when the day comes, but it will surely come. The image fades to another, and in the split second of overlap the face of a twenty-six-year-old Siri appears superimposed on the older woman's features. Marin, I am pregnant. I'm so glad. You've been gone five weeks now, and I miss you. Ten years you'll be gone. More than that. Marin, why didn't you think to invite me to go with you? I could not have gone, but I would have loved it if you had just invited me. But I'm pregnant, Marin. The doctors say that it will be a boy. I will tell him about you, my love. Perhaps some day you and he will sail in the archipelago and listen to the songs of the sea folk as you and I have done these past few weeks. Perhaps you'll understand them by then. Marin, I miss you. Please hurry back. The holographic image shimmers and shifts. 
The sixteen-year-old girl is red-faced. Her long hair cascades over bare shoulders and a white nightgown. She speaks in a rush, racing tears. Shipman Marin Aspic, I'm sorry about your friend. I really am. But you left without even saying goodbye. I had such plans about how you would help us. How you and I... You didn't even say goodbye. I don't care what happens to you. I hope you go back to your stinking, crowded hegemony hives and rot for all I care. In fact, Marin Aspic, I wouldn't want to see you again even if they paid me. Goodbye. She turns her back before the projection fades. It is dark in the tomb now, but the audio continues for a second. There is a soft chuckle and Ciri's voice, I cannot tell the age, comes one last time. Adieu, Marin. Adieu. Adieu, I say, and thumb the disc key off. The crowd parts as I emerge blinking from the tomb. My poor timing has ruined the drama of the event, and now the smile on my face incites angry whispers. Loudspeakers carry the rhetoric of the official ceremony even to our hilltop. Beginning a new era of cooperation, echoes the rich voice of the ambassador. I set the box on the grass and remove the hawking mat. The crowd presses forward to see as I unroll the carpet. The tapestry is faded, but the flight threads gleam like new copper. I sit in the center of the mat and slide the heavy box on behind me. And more will follow until space and time will cease to be obstacles. The crowd moves back as I tap the flight design and the hawking mat rises four meters into the air. Now I can see beyond the roof of the tomb. The islands are returning to form the equatorial archipelago. I can see them, hundreds of them, borne up out of the hungry south by gentle winds. So it is with great pleasure that I close this circuit and welcome you, the colony of Maui Covenant, into the community of the hegemony of man. The thin thread of this ceremonial comm laser pulses to the zenith. There is a pattering of applause and the band begins playing. I squint skyward just in time to see a new star being born. Part of me knew to the microsecond what has just occurred. For a few microseconds the forecaster had been functional. For a few microseconds, time and space had ceased to be obstacles. Then, the massive tidal pull of the artificial singularity triggered the thermite charge I had placed on the outer containment sphere. That tiny explosion had not been visible, but a second later the expanding Schwarzschild radius is eating its shell, swallowing 36,000 tons of fragile dodecahedron and growing quickly to gobble several thousand kilometers of space around it. And that is visible, magnificently visible as a miniature nova flares whitely in the clear blue sky. The band stops playing. People scream and run for cover. There is no reason to. There is a burst of x-rays tunneling out as the forecaster continues to collapse into itself, but not enough to cause harm through Maui Covenant's generous atmosphere. A second streak of plasma becomes visible as the Los Angeles puts more distance between itself and the rapidly decaying little black hole. The winds rise and the seas are choppier. There will be strange tides tonight. I want to say something profound, but I can think of nothing. Besides, the crowd is in no mood to listen. I tell myself that I can hear some cheers mixed in with the screams and shouts. I tap at the flight designs and the hawking mat speeds out over the cliff and above the harbor. A Thomas Hawk, lazing on midday thermals, flaps in panic at my approach. Let them come, I shout at the fleeing hawk. Let them come. I'll be thirty-five and not alone, and let them come if they dare. I drop my fist and laugh. The wind is blowing my hair and cooling the sweat on my chest and arms. Cooler now, I take a siding and set my course for the most distant of the aisles. I look forward to meeting the others. Even more, I look forward to talking to the sea folk and telling them that it is time for the shark to come at last to the seas of Maui Covenant. Later, when the battles are won and the world is theirs, I will tell them about her. I will sing to them of Siri. The cascade of light from the distant space battle continued. There was no sound except for the slide of wind across escarpments. The group sat close together, leaning forward and looking at the antique comm log as if expecting more. There was no more. The consul removed the micro disc and pocketed it. Saul Weintraub rubbed the back of his sleeping infant and spoke to the consul. Surely you're not Marin Aspic. No, said the consul. Marin Aspic died during the rebellion. Ceres Rebellion. 
Then how did you come to possess this recording? asked Father Hoyt. Through the priest's mask of pain, it was visible that he had been moved. This incredible recording. He gave it to me, said the consul, a few weeks before he was killed in the Battle of the Archipelago. The consul looked at the uncomprehending faces before him. I'm their grandson, he said, Siri and Marins. My father, the Donnell whom Aspic mentions, became the first home rule counselor when Maui Covenant was admitted to the protectorate. Later he was elected senator and served until his death. I was nine years old that day on the hill near Siri's tomb. I was twenty, old enough to join the rebels and fight, when Aspic came to our isle at night, took me aside, and forbade me to join their band. Would you have fought? asked Braun Lamia. Oh, yes, and died, like a third of our menfolk and a fifth of our women, like all of the dolphins and many of the isles themselves although the hegemony tried to keep as many of those intact as possible. It is a moving document, said Saul Weintraub. But why are you here? Why the pilgrimage to the shrike? I am not finished, said the consul. Listen. My father was as weak as my grandmother had been strong. The hegemony did not wait eleven local years to return. The forced torch ships were in orbit before five years had elapsed. Father watched as the rebels' hastily constructed ships were swatted aside. He continued to defend the hegemony as they laid siege to our world. I remember when I was fifteen, watching with my family from the upper deck of our ancestral isle as a dozen other islands burned in the distance, the hegemony skimmers lighting the sea with their depth charges. In the morning, the waves were gray with the bodies of the dead dolphins. My older sister, Lyra, went to fight with the rebels in those hopeless days after the Battle of the Archipelago. Eyewitnesses saw her die. Her body was never recovered. My father never mentioned her name again. Within three years after the ceasefire and admission to the Protectorate, we original colonists were a minority on our own world. The Isles were tamed and sold to tourists, just as Marin had predicted to Siri. First Sight is a city of eleven million now the condos and spires and EM cities extending around the entire island along the coast. First Sight Harbor remains as a quaint bazaar, with descendants of the first families selling crafts and overpriced art there. We lived on Tau Cetai Center for a while when Father was first elected senator, and I finished school there. I was the dutiful son, extolling the virtues of life in the web, studying the glorious history of the hegemony of man and preparing for my own career in the diplomatic corps. And all the time I waited. I returned to Maui Covenant briefly after graduation, working in the offices on Central Administration Isle. Part of my job was to visit the hundreds of drilling platforms going up in the shallows, to report on the rapidly multiplying undersea complexes, and to act as liaison with the development corporations coming in from T.C. Squared and Sol Draconi Septim. I did not enjoy the work, but I was efficient. And I smiled, and I waited. I courted and married a girl from one of the first families from Ceres' cousin Bertal's line, and after receiving a rare first on diplomatic corps examinations, I requested a post out of the web. Thus began our personal diaspora, Gresh's and mine. I was efficient. I was born to diplomacy. Within five standard years, I was an under-consul. Within eight, a consul in my own right. As long as I stayed in the outback, this was as far as I would rise. It was my choice. I worked for the hegemony and I waited. At first my role was to provide web ingenuity to help the colonists do what they do best, destroy truly indigenous life. It is no accident that in six centuries of interstellar expansion the hegemony has encountered no species considered intelligent on the drake turing chen Index. On old earth it had long been accepted that if a species put mankind on its food chain menu, the species would be extinct before long. As the web expanded, if a species attempted serious competition with humanity's intellect, that species would be extinct before the first farcaster opened in system. On Whirl, we stalked the elusive Zeppelin through their cloud towers. It is possible that they were not sapient by human or core standards, but they were beautiful. When they died, rippling in rainbow colors, their many-hued messages unseen, unheard by their fleeing herdmates, the beauty of their death agony was beyond words. We sold their photoreceptive skins to web corporations, their flesh to worlds like Heaven's Gate, 
and ground their bones to powder to sell as aphrodisiacs to the impotent and superstitious on a score of other colony worlds. On Garden, I was advisor to the arcology engineers who drained Grand Fen, ending the short reign of the Marsh centaurs who had ruled and threatened hegemony progress there. They tried to migrate in the end, but the north reaches were far too dry, and when I visited the region decades later, when Garden entered the web, the desiccated remains of the centaurs still littered some of the distant reaches like the husks of exotic plants from some more colorful era. On Hebron, I arrived just as the Jewish settlers were ending their long feud with the Seneschi Alouette, creatures as fragile as that world's waterless ecology. The Alouette were empathic, and it was our fear and greed which killed them, that and our unbreachable alienness. But on Hebron, it was not the death of the Alouette which turned my heart to stone but my part in dooming the colonists themselves. On Old Earth, they had a word for what I was, Quisling. For although Hebron was not my world, the settlers who had fled there had done so for reasons as clear as those of my ancestors who signed the Covenant of Life on the Old Earth island of Maui. But I was waiting. And in my waiting I acted, in all senses of the word. They trusted me. They grew to believe in my candid revelations of how wonderful it was to rejoin the community of mankind, to join the web. They insisted that only the one city might be open to foreigners. I smiled and agreed. And now New Jerusalem holds sixty millions, while the continent holds ten million Jewish indigenes, dependent upon the web city for most of what they need. Another decade, perhaps less. I broke down a bit after Hebron was open to the web. I discovered alcohol, the blessed antithesis of flashback and wireheading. Gresha stayed with me in the hospital there until I dried out. Oddly, for a Jewish world, the clinic was Catholic. I remember the rustle of robes in the halls at night. My breakdown had been very quiet and very far away. My career was not damaged. As full consul, I took my wife and son to Brescia. How delicate our role there! How Byzantine the fine line we walked! For decades, Colonel Kassad, forces of the Technicor had been harassing the ouster swarms wherever they fled. Now the forces that be in the Senate and AI Advisory Council had determined that some test had to be made of ouster might in the outback itself. Brescia was chosen. I admit the Brescians had been our surrogates for decades before I arrived. Their society was archaically and delightfully Prussian, militaristic to a fault, arrogant in their economic pretensions xenophobic to the point of happily enlisting to wipe out the ouster menace. At first, a few lend lease torch ships so that they could reach the swarms. Plasma weapons, impact probes with tailored viruses. It was a slight miscalculation that I was still on Brescia when the ouster hordes arrived. A few months' difference. A military political analysis team should have been there in my place. It did not matter. Hegemony purposes were served. The resolve and rapid deployment capabilities of force were properly tested where no real harm was done to hegemony interests. Gresha died, of course, in the first bombardment. And alone, my ten-year-old son. He had been with me, had survived the war itself, only to die when some force idiot set off a booby trap or demolition charge too near the refugee barracks in Buckminster, the capital. I was not with him when he died. I was promoted after Brescia. I was given the most challenging and sensitive assignment ever relegated to someone of mere consular rank, diplomat in charge of direct negotiations with the ousters themselves. First, I was cast to Taucetai Center for long conferences with Senator Gladstone's committee and some of the AI counselors. I met with Gladstone herself. The plan was very complicated. Essentially, the ousters had to be provoked into attacking, and the key to that provocation was the world of Hyperion. The ousters had been observing Hyperion since before the Battle of Brescia. Our intelligence suggested that they were obsessed with the time tombs and the Shrike. Their attack on the Hegemony hospital ship carrying Colonel Kassad, among others, had been a miscalculation. Their ship captain had panicked when the hospital ship had been mistakenly identified as a military spin ship. Worse, from the ousters' point of view, was the fact that by setting their drop ships down near the tombs themselves, the same commander had revealed their ability to defy the time tides. After the Shrike had decimated their commando teams, the torch ship captain returned to the swarm to be executed. But our intelligence suggested that the ouster miscalculation had not been a total disaster. Valuable information had been obtained about the Shrike, and their obsession with Hyperion had deepened.
Gladstone explained to me how the hegemony planned to capitalize on that obsession. The essence of the plan was that the ousters had to be provoked into attacking the hegemony. The focus of that attack was to be Hyperion itself. I was made to understand that the resulting battle had more to do with internal web politics than with the ousters. Elements of the Technicore had opposed Hyperion's entry into the hegemony for centuries. Gladstone explained that this was no longer in the interest of humanity, and that a forcible annexation of Hyperion, under the guise of defending the web itself, would allow more progressive AI coalitions in the Corps to gain power. This shift of the power balance in the Corps would benefit the Senate and the web in ways not fully explained to me. The ousters would be eradicated as a potential menace once and for all. A new era of hegemony glory would begin. Gladstone explained that I need not volunteer, that the mission would be fraught with dangers, both for my career and my life. I accept it anyway. The hegemony provided me with a private spacecraft. I asked for only one modification, the addition of an antique Steinway piano. For months I traveled alone under Hawking Drive. For more months I wandered in regions where the ouster swarms regularly migrated. Eventually my ship was sensed and seized. They accepted that I was a courier and knew that I was a spy. They debated killing me and did not. They debated negotiating with me and eventually decided to do so. I will not try to describe the beauty of life in a swarm. Their zero-gravity globe cities and comet farms and thrust clusters, their micro-orbital forests and migrating rivers, and the ten thousand colors and textures of life at Rendezvous Week. Suffice it to say that I believe the ousters have done what web humanity has not in the past millennia. Evolved. While we live in our derivative cultures, pale reflections of old Earth life, the ousters have explored new dimensions of aesthetics and ethics and biosciences and art and all the things that must change and grow to reflect the human soul. Barbarians, we call them, while all the while we timidly cling to our web like Visigoths, crouching in the ruins of Rome's faded glory and proclaim ourselves civilized. Within ten standard months I had told them my greatest secret, and they had told me theirs. I explained in all the detail I could what plans for extinction had been laid for them by Gladstone's people. I told them what little the web scientists understood of the anomaly of the time tombs, and revealed the Technicore's inexplicable fear of Hyperion. I described how Hyperion would be a trap for them if they dared attempt to occupy it, how every element of force would be brought to Hyperion's system to crush them. I revealed everything I knew and waited once again to die. Instead of killing me, they told me something. They showed me fat line intercepts, tight beam recordings, and their own records from the date they fled Old Earth system, four and a half centuries earlier. Their facts were terrible and simple. The big mistake of thirty-eight had been no mistake. The death of Old Earth had been deliberate, planned by elements of the Technicore and their human counterparts in the fledgling government of the hegemony. The Hegira had been planned in detail decades before the runaway black hole had accidentally been plunged into the heart of Old Earth. The World Web, the All Thing, the Hegemony of Man, all of them had been built on the most vicious type of patricide. Now they were being maintained by a quiet and deliberate policy of fratricide, the murder of any species with even the slightest potential of being a competitor. And the Alistairs, the only other tribe of humanity free to wander between the stars, and the only group not dominated by the Technicore, was next on our list of extinction. I returned to the web. Over thirty years of web time had passed. Maina Gladstone was CEO. Ceres Rebellion was a romantic legend, a minor footnote in the history of the hegemony. I met with Gladstone. I told her many, but not all, of the things the ousters had revealed. I told her that they knew that any battle for Hyperion would be a trap, but that they were coming anyway. I told her that the ousters wanted me to become consul on Hyperion so that I might be a double agent when war came. I did not tell her that they had promised to give me a device which would open the time tombs and allow the Shrike free reign. CEO Gladstone had long talks with me. Force intelligence agents had even longer talks with me, some lasting months. Technologies and drugs were used to confirm that I was telling the truth and keeping nothing back. The ousters also had been very good with technologies and drugs. I was telling the truth. I was also keeping something back. In the end, I was assigned to Hyperion. Gladstone offered to raise the world to protectorate status and me to an ambassadorship. 
I declined both offers, although I asked if I could keep my private spacecraft. I arrived on a regularly scheduled spin ship, and my own ship arrived several weeks later in the belly of a visiting torch ship. It was left in a parking orbit with the understanding that I could summon it and leave any time I wished. Alone on Hyperion, I waited. Years passed. I allowed my aid to govern the outback world while I drank at Cicero's and waited. The ousters contacted me through private fat line, and I took a three weeks' leave from the consulate, brought my ship down to an isolated place near the Sea of Grass, rendezvoused with their scout ship near the Oort Cloud, picked up their agent, a woman named Andal, and a trio of technicians, and dropped down north of the bridal range, a few kilometers from the tombs themselves. The ousters did not have farcasters. They spent their lives on the long marches between the stars, watching life in the web speed by like some film or holly set at a frenzied speed. They were obsessed with time. The Technicore had given the hegemony the farcaster and continued to maintain it. No human scientists or team of human scientists had come close to understanding it. The ousters tried. They failed. But even in their failures they made inroads into understanding the manipulation of space-time. They understood the time tides, the anti-entropic fields surrounding the tombs. They could not generate such fields, but they could shield against them and, theoretically, collapse them. The time tombs and all their contents would cease to age backward. The tombs would open. The Shrike would slip its tether, no longer connected to the vicinity of the tombs. Whatever else was inside would now be freed. The Ousters believed that the time tombs were artifacts from their future, the Shrike a weapon of redemption awaiting the proper hand to seize it. The Shrike cult saw the monster as an avenging angel. The Ousters saw it as a tool of human devising sent back through time to deliver humanity from the Technicore. Andal and the technicians were there to calibrate and experiment. You won't use it now? I asked. We were standing in the shadow of the structure called the Sphinx. Not now, said Andal, when the invasion is imminent. But you said it would take months for the device to work, I said, for the tombs to open. Andal nodded. Her eyes were a dark green. She was very tall, and I could make out the subtle stripes of the powered exoskeleton on her skin suit. Perhaps a year or longer, she said. The device causes the anti-entropic field to decay slowly. But once begun, the process is irrevocable. But we will not activate it until the ten councils have decided that invasion of the web is necessary. There are doubts, I said. Ethical debates, said Andal. A few meters from us, the three technicians were covering the device with chameleon cloth and a coated containment field. An interstellar war will cause the deaths of millions, perhaps billions. Releasing the Shrike into the web will have unforeseen consequences. As much as we need to strike at the core, there are debates as to which is the best way. I nodded and looked at the device and the Valley of the Tombs. But once this is activated, I said, there is no turning back. The Shrike will be released, and you will have to have won the war to control it? Andal smiled slightly. That is true. I shot her then, her and the three technicians. Then I tossed Grandmother Ceres' Steiner Gin laser far into the drift dunes and sat on an empty flow foam crate and sobbed for several minutes. Then I walked over, used a technician's comm log to enter the containment field, threw off the chameleon cloth, and triggered the device. There was no immediate change. The air held the same rich, late winter light. The jade tomb glowed softly while the Sphinx continued to stare down at nothing. The only sound was the rasp of sand across the crates and bodies. Only a glowing indicator on the ouster device showed that it was working. Had already worked. I walked slowly back to the ship, half expecting the Shrike to appear, half hoping that it would. I sat on the balcony of my ship for more than an hour watching the shadows filling the valley and the sand covering the distant corpses. There was no shrike, no thorn tree. After a while I played a Bach prelude on the Steinway, buttoned up the ship and rose into space. I contacted the ouster ship and said that there had been an accident. The shrike had taken the others. The device had been activated prematurely. Even in their confusion and panic, the ousters offered me refuge. I declined the offer and turned my ship toward the web. The ousters did not pursue. 
I used my fat line transmitter to contact Gladstone and to tell her that the ouster agents had been eliminated. I told her that the invasion was very likely, that the trap would be sprung as planned. I did not tell her about the device. Gladstone congratulated me and called me home. I declined. I told her that I needed silence and solitude. I turned my ship toward the outback world nearest the Hyperion system, knowing that travel itself would eat time until the next act commenced. Later, when the fat line call to pilgrimage came from Gladstone herself, I knew the role the ousters had planned for me in these final days. The ousters, or the core, or Gladstone and her machinations. It no longer matters who consider themselves the masters of events. Events no longer obey their masters. The world as we know it is ending, my friends, no matter what happens to us. As for me, I have no request of the Shrike. I bring no final words for it or the universe. I have returned because I must, because this is my fate. I've known what I must do since I was a child, returning alone to Ceres' tomb and swearing vengeance on the hegemony. I've known what price I must pay, both in life and in history. But when the time comes to judge, to understand a betrayal which will spread like flame across the web, which will end worlds, I ask you not to think of me. My name was not even writ on water, as your lost poet soul said. But to think of old earth dying for no reason, to think of the dolphins, their gray flesh drying and rotting in the sun, to see, as I have seen, the modal isles with no place to wander, their feeding grounds destroyed, the equatorial shallows scabbed with drilling platforms, the islands themselves burdened with shouting, trammeling tourists smelling of UV lotion and cannabis. Or better yet, think of none of that. Stand as I did after throwing the switch, a murderer a betrayer, but still proud, feet firmly planted on Hyperion shifting sand, head held high, fist raised against the sky, crying, A plague on both your houses. For you see, I remember my grandmother's dream. I remember the way it could have been. I remember Siri. Are you the spy? asked Father Hoyt. The ouster spy? The consul rubbed his cheeks and said nothing. He looked tired, spent. Yeah, said Martin Silenus. CEO Gladstone warned me when I was chosen for the pilgrimage. She said that there was a spy. She told all of us, snapped Braun Lamia. She stared at the consul. Her gaze seemed sad. Our friend is a spy, said Saul Weintraub, but not merely an ouster spy. The baby had awakened. Weintraub lifted her to calm her crying. He is what they call in the thrillers a double agent, a triple agent in this case, an agent to infinite regression, in truth an agent of retribution. The consul looked at the old scholar. He's still a spy, said Silenus. Spies are executed, aren't they? Colonel Kassad had the death wand in his hand. It was not aimed in anyone's direction. Are you in touch with your ship? he asked the consul. Yes. How? Through Ceres' comlog. It was modified. Kassad nodded slightly. And you've been in touch with the ousters via the ship's fat line transmitter? Yes. Making reports on the pilgrimage as they expected? Yes. Have they replied? No. How can we believe him? cried the poet. He's a fucking spy. Shut up. Colonel Kassad said flatly, finally. His gaze never left the consul. Did you attack Hetmastin? No, said the consul. But when the Yggdrasil burned, I knew that something was wrong. What do you mean, said Kassad. The consul cleared his throat. I've spent time with Templar voices of the tree. Their connection to their tree ships is almost telepathic. Mastine's reaction was far too subdued. Either he wasn't what he said he was, or he had known that the ship was to be destroyed and had severed contact with it. When I was on guard duty, I went below to confront him. He was gone. The cabin was as we found it, except for the fact that the Mobius box was in a neutral state. The Erg could have escaped. I secured it and went above. You did not harm Het Mustine? Kassad asked again. No. I repeat... Why the fuck should we believe you? said Silenus. 
The poet was drinking scotch from the last bottle he had brought along. The consul looked at the bottle as he answered. You have no reason to believe me. It doesn't matter. Colonel Kassad's long fingers idly tapped the dull casing of the death wand. What will you do with your fat line comlink now? The consul took a tired breath. Report when the time tombs open, if I'm still alive then. Braun Lamy appointed at the antique comlog. We could destroy it. The consul shrugged. It could be of use, said the colonel. We can eavesdrop on military and civilian transmissions made in the clear. If we have to, we can call the consul's ship. No, cried the consul. It was the first time he had shown emotion in many minutes. We can't turn back now. I believe we have no intention of turning back, said Colonel Kassad. He looked around at pale faces. No one spoke for a moment. There is a decision we have to make, said Saul Weintraub. He rocked his infant and nodded in the direction of the consul. Martin Silenus had been resting his forehead on the mouth of the empty bottle of scotch. He looked up. The penalty for treason is death. He giggled. We're all going to die within a few hours anyway. Why not make our last act an execution? Father Hoyt grimaced as a spasm of pain gripped him. He touched his cracked lips with a trembling finger. We're not a court. Yes, said Colonel Kassad. We are. The consul drew up his legs, rested his forearms on his knees, and laced his fingers. Decide, then. There was no emotion in his voice. Braun Lamia had brought out her father's automatic pistol. Now she set it on the floor near where she sat. Her eyes darted from the consul to Kassad. We're talking treason here, she said. Treason toward what? None of us, except maybe the colonel there, is exactly a leading citizen. We've all been kicked around by forces beyond our control. Saul Weintraub spoke directly to the consul. What you have ignored, my friend, is that if Maina Gladstone and elements of the Corps chose you for the ouster contact, they knew very well what you would do. Perhaps they could not have guessed that the ousters had the means by which to open the tombs, although with the AIs of the Corps one can never know but they certainly knew that you would turn on both societies, both camps which have injured your family. It is all part of some bizarre plan. You were no more an instrument of your own will than was, he held the baby up, this child. The consul looked confused. He started to speak, shook his head instead. That may be correct, said Colonel Fedmont Kassad, but however they may try to use all of us as pawns, we must attempt to choose our own actions. He glanced up at the wall where pulses of light from the distant space battle painted the plaster blood red. Because of this war, thousands will die, perhaps millions. If the Ousters or the Shrike gain access to the Webb's forecaster system, billions of lives on hundreds of worlds are at risk. The consul watched as Kassad raised the death wand. This would be faster for all of us, said Kassad. The Shrike knows no mercy. No one spoke. The consul seemed to be staring at something at a great distance. Kassad pressed on the safety and set the wand back in his belt. We've come this far, he said. We will go the rest of the way together. Braun Lamia put away her father's pistol, rose, crossed the small space, knelt next to the consul, and put her arms around him. Startled, the consul raised one arm. Light danced on the wall behind them. A moment later Saul Weintraub came close and hugged them both with one arm around their shoulders. The baby wriggled in pleasure at the sudden warmth of bodies. The consul smelled the talc and newborn scent of her. I was wrong, said the consul. I will make a request of the Shrike. I will ask for her. He gently touched Rachel's head where the small skull curved in to neck. Martin Silenus made a noise which began as a laugh and died as a sob. Our last requests, he said. Does the muse grant requests? I have no request. I want only for the poem to be finished. Father Hoyt turned toward the poet. Is it so important? Oh, yes, 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 gasped Silenus. He dropped the empty scotch bottle, reached into his bag, and lifted out a handful of flimsies, holding them high as if offering them to the group. 
Do you want to read it? Do you want me to read it to you? It's flowing again. Read the old parts. Read the cantos I wrote three centuries ago and never published. It's all here. We're all here. My name, yours, this trip. Don't you see? I'm not creating a poem. I'm creating the future. He let the flimsies fall, raised the empty bottle, frowned, and held it like a chalice. I'm creating the future, he repeated without looking up. But it's the past which must be changed. One instant. One decision. Martin Silenus raised his face. His eyes were red. This thing that is going to kill us tomorrow, my muse, our maker, our unmaker, it's traveled back through time. Well, let it. This time, let it take me and leave Billy alone. Let it take me and let the poem in there, unfinished for all time. He raised the bottle higher, closed his eyes, and threw it against the far wall. Glass shards reflected orange light from the silent explosions. Colonel Kassad stepped closer and laid long fingers on the poet's shoulder. For a few seconds, the room seemed warmed by the mere fact of human contact. Father Lenore Hoyt stepped away from the wall where he had been leaning, raised his right hand with thumb and little finger touching, three fingers raised, the gesture somehow including himself as well as those before him, and said softly, Ego te absolvo. Wind scraped at the outer walls and whistled around the gargoyles and balconies. Light from a battle a hundred million kilometers away painted the group in blood hues. Colonel Kassad walked to the doorway. The group moved apart. Let's try to get some sleep, said Braun Lamia. Later, alone in his bedroll, listening to the wind shriek and howl, the consul set his cheek against his pack and pulled the rough blanket higher. It had been years since he had been able to fall asleep easily. The consul set his curled fist against his cheek, closed his eyes, and slept. Epilogue The consul awoke to the sound of a balalaika being played so softly that at first he thought it was an undercurrent of his dream. The consul rose, shivered in the cold air, wrapped his blanket around him, and went out onto the long balcony. It was not yet dawn. The skies still burned with the light of battle. I'm sorry, said Lenar Hoyt looking up from his instrument. The priest was huddled deep in his cape. It's all right, said the consul. I was ready to awaken. It was true. He could not remember feeling more rested. Please continue, he said. The notes were sharp and clear, but barely audible above the wind noise. It was as if Hoyt was playing a duet with the cold wind from the peaks above. The consul found the clarity almost painful. Braun Lamia and Colonel Kassad came out. A minute later, Saul Weintraub joined them. Rachel twisted in his arms, reaching toward the night sky as if she could grasp the bright blossoms there. Hoyt played. The wind was rising in the hour before dawn, and the gargoyles and escarpments acted like reeds to the keep's cold bassoon. Martin Silenus emerged, holding his head. No fucking respect for a hangover, he said. He leaned on the broad railing. If I barf from this height, it'll be half an hour before the vomitus lands. Father Hoyt did not look up. His fingers flew across the strings of the small instrument. The northwest wind grew stronger and colder, and the balalaika played counterpart, its notes warm and alive. The consul and the others huddled in blankets and capes as the breeze grew to a torrent, and the unnamed music kept pace with it. It was the strangest and most beautiful symphony the consul had ever heard. The wind gusted, roared, peaked, and died. Hoyt ended his tune. Braun Lamia looked around. It's almost dawn. We have another hour, said Colonel Kassad. Lamia shrugged. Why wait? Why indeed, said Saul Weintraub. He looked to the east where the only hint of sunrise was the faintest of palings in constellations there. It looks like a good day is coming. Let's get ready, said Hoyt. Do we need our luggage? The group looked at one another. No, I think not, said the consul. The colonel will bring the comm log with the fat line communicator. Bring anything necessary for your audience with the Shrike. We'll leave the rest of the stuff here. All right, said Braun Lamia, 
turning back from the dark doorway, gesturing toward the others. Let's do it. There were 661 steps from the northeast portal of the keep to the moor below. There were no railings. The group descended carefully, watching their step in the insecure light. Once onto the valley floor, they looked back at the outcrop of stone above. Kronos Keep looked like part of the mountain, its balconies and external stairways mere slashes in the rock. Occasionally, a brighter explosion would illuminate a window or throw a gargoyle shadow, but except for those instances, it was as if the keep had vanished behind them. They crossed the low hills below the keep, staying on grass and avoiding the sharp shrubs which extended thorns like claws. In ten minutes they had crossed to sand and were descending low dunes toward the valley. Braun Lamia led the group. She wore her finest cape and a red silk suit with black trim. Her comlog gleamed on her wrist. Colonel Kassad came next. He was in full battle armor, camouflage polymer not yet activated, so the suit looked matte black, absorbing even the light from above. Kassad carried a standard-issue force assault rifle. His visor gleamed like a black mirror. Father Hoyt wore his black cape, black suit, and clerical collar. The balalaika was cradled in his arms like a child. He continued to set his feet carefully, as if each step caused pain. The consul followed. He was dressed in his diplomatic best, starched blouse, formal black trousers and demi-jacket, velvet cape, and the gold tricorn he had worn the first day on the tree ship. He had to keep a grip on the hat against the wind that had come up again, hurling grains of sand in his face and sliding across the dune tops like a serpent. Martin Silenus followed close behind in his coat of wind-rippled fur. Saul Weintraub brought up the rear. Rachel rode in the infant carrier, nestled under the cape and coat against her father's chest. Weintraub was singing a low tune to her, the notes lost in the breeze. Forty minutes out and they had come even with the dead city. Marble and granite gleamed in the violent light. The peaks glowed behind them, the keep indistinguishable from the other mountainsides. The group crossed a sandy vale, climbed a low dune, and suddenly the head of the Valley of the Time Tombs was visible for the first time. The consul could make out the thrust of the Sphinx's wings and a glow of jade. A rumble and crash from far behind them made the consul turn, startled, his heart pounding. Is it beginning? asked Lamia. The bombardment? No, look, said Kassad. He pointed to a point above the mountain peaks where blackness obliterated the stars. Lightning exploded along that false horizon, illuminating ice fields and glaciers. Only a storm, he said. They resumed their trek across vermilion sands. The consul found himself straining to make out the shape of a figure near the tombs or at the head of the valley. He was certain beyond all certainty that something awaited them there, that it awaited. Look at that, said Braun Lamia, her whisper almost lost in the wind. The time tombs were glowing. What the consul had first taken to be light reflected from above was not. Each tomb glowed a different hue, and each was clearly visible now, the glow brightening, the tombs receding far back into the darkness of the valley. The air smelled of ozone. Is that a common phenomenon? asked Father Hoyt, his voice thin. The consul shook his head. I've never heard of it. It had never been reported at the time Rachel came to study the tombs, said Saul Weintraub. He began to hum the low tune as the group started forward again through shifting sands. They paused at the head of the valley. Soft dunes gave way to rock and ink-black shadows at the swale which led down to the glowing tombs. No one led the way. No one spoke. The consul felt his heart beating wildly against his ribs. Worse than fear, or knowledge of what lay below, was the blackness of spirit which seemed to have come into him on the wind, chilling him and making him want to run screaming toward the hills from which they had come. The consul turned to Saul Weintraub. What's that tune you're singing to Rachel? The scholar forced a grin and scratched his short beard. It's from an ancient flat film, pre hegira Hell, it's pre-everything. Let's hear it, said Braun Lamia understanding what the consul was doing. Her face was very pale. Weintraub sang it, his voice thin and barely audible at first. But the tune was forceful and oddly compelling. Father Hoyt uncradled the balalaika and played along, the notes gaining confidence. Braun Lamia laughed. Martin Silenus said in awe, My God, I used to sing this in my childhood. It's ancient. 
But who is the wizard? asked Colonel Kassad, the amplified voice through his helmet oddly amusing in this context. And what is Oz? asked Lamia. And just who is off to see this wizard? asked the consul, feeling the black panic in him fade ever so slightly. Saul Weintraub paused and tried to answer their questions, explaining the plot of a flat film which had been dust for centuries. Never mind, said Braun Lamia. You can tell us later. Just sing it again. Behind them, the darkness had engulfed the mountains as the storm swept down and across the moors toward them. The sky continued to bleed light, but now the eastern horizon had paled slightly more than the rest. The dead city glowed to their left like stone teeth. Braun Lamia took the lead again. Saul Weintraub sang more loudly, Rachel wiggling in delight. Lenore Hoyt threw back his cape so as to better play the balalaika. Martin Silenus threw an empty bottle far out onto the sands and sang along, his deep voice surprisingly strong and pleasant above the wind. Fedmon Kassad pushed up his visor, shouldered his weapon, and joined in the chorus. The consul started to sing, thought about the absurd lyrics, laughed aloud, and started again. Just where the darkness began, the trail broadened. The consul moved to his right, Kassad joining him. Saul Weintraub filling the gap, so that instead of a single-file procession, the six adults were walking abreast. Brown Lamia took Silenus's hand in hers, joined hands with Saul on the other side. Still singing loudly, not looking back, matching stride for stride, they descended into the valley. End of Hyperion by Dan Simmons Narrated by Ray Fouché in the studios of the American Printing House for the Blind, Louisville, Kentucky, for the Library of Congress, February 1992. For special distribution as authorized by Act of Congress under Public Law 89-522, with the permission of the copyright holder and the publisher, a foundation book, published by Doubleday, a division of Bantam Doubleday, Dell Publishing Group, Incorporated, 666 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10103. End of book.